This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum, the repository of death. Yes, here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide, where everyday objects, a skillet, a screwdriver, a photograph, all are touched by murder. Here's a 22 caliber pistol. It's a familiar object. You've seen one or its picture. You've never touched one. An elegant little weapon. Blue steel. Mother of pearl inlaid grip. Beautiful in its dainty, snub-nosed wickedness. A lady's weapon, wouldn't you say, Pepper? Looks as if it wouldn't harm a fly. Pretty in its way, Inspector. Pretty and dangerous. There ought to be a law forbidding the manufacture of these toys. Every one of them is capable of death. Well, today, this little blue twenty-two can be found among the exhibits in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Well, here we are, in The Black Museum. Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. It's an impressive place. The kind of echoing awe which comes from a vaulted ceiling and somber lighting. Weird, fantastic, with a harsh, real fantasy that comes with murder. Here lies death, and so neatly. Each object placarded with a small white card labeled with black lettering, name, place, date, disposition of the case. Here's an odd-looking ashtray, soapstone. It's carved rather nicely with a crouching figure of a woman. Something decorative for your living room, but observe closely now the red-brown stain on the rim. Lift up the tray, hold it by the figure of the woman. Well, yes, it's comfortable in your hand, and suddenly, this is a weapon. Ah, here we are, the little blue twenty-two. Well, it's silent now. It was silent, too, during Vivian Davis's cocktail party in London's smart, sophisticated West End. In Vivian's quite shishy apartment. It was not destined to be silent, though. Not very long. It's a nice place, Vivian's apartment, if you go for ultra-modern glass and metal combinations. Nice people, too. Well, nice-looking, anyway. Young men are quite, quite impeccable. The young ladies are lovely, lush, well aware of the well-put-together attractiveness. Oh, yes, these are the chic young people. <laughs> Larry... Darling, have you been watching Vivian and Donald? What else, sweet? They are at dagger points, aren't they? Well, frankly, Larry, if Viv has one more martini, she'll kill Donald with a look. An alcoholic look, at any rate. But why all the fuss and bother? If Donald wants to play, she ought to let him. I know at least three males were perfectly willing to give Viv a time, really. Mm -hmm. Including yourself, Larry, my sweet? No, darling, I'm the fourth. But then why bother? A trifle strange, isn't it? The ultra-sophisticated, the over-civilized, and yet, you know, beneath the polish, the same old jealousy that you can find in savages. Oh, yes, simple jealousy. For instance, at this moment, Vivian herself is approaching the chrome and plastic bar where Donald is mixing a drink. Donald, haven't you had enough? You're quite tight, you know. Am I, really? I asked you, Donald, haven't you had enough? I don't believe I have. Uh... Will you have one, dear? I've had enough, let me tell you. Uh, this is my party. You might be polite enough to pay some attention to me and a little less to that strawberry blonde. Ah, oh, she's quite attractive in a leggy sort of way. Oh, yes, quite elemental beneath the polished surface. An interesting situation. It continues, of course. 
As long as the party lasts. It continues, as a matter of fact, well past the end of the party, even to the moment when May and Larry are making their farewells. The last of the guests to go. No, it was simply marvellous, Viv, darling. Just delightful. I always adore your parties, Viv. The liquor flows like water. Oh, thank you both for coming. My little parties wouldn't be the same without you. Isn't that so, Donald? Huh? Yes, uh, yes, of course. Coming, Donald Osa? Well, I don't exactly... Oh, Larry, uh... please. What? Oh, put my foot in it, didn't I? I'm sorry, old man. Au revoir, Viv. Let the martinis run again sometime soon. Bye, darling. Ring me, won't you? Oh, soon, darling. Quite soon. <laughs> Donald's for it now. Did you see the look in her eye? Come along, dear. Don't be catty. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> the party's over now. Silence descends on the carpeted hallway. For a moment or two. And then, through the muffling walls... You stupid little, silly little beast on that woman. Oh, stop it, Viv. I'm not interested in her. I've told you, mate. You look like a perfect idiot. Man versus woman. A jealous woman. Where does it go? Isn't it obvious? Of course. Somebody's bound to be hurt. Inspector Summers and Detective Pepper arrive quickly from the yard. This seems to be the weapon, Inspector. A twenty-two, Blue steel, mother-of-pearl grip. A lady's weapon, wouldn't you say, Pepper? Looks as if it wouldn't harm a fly. Pretty in its way, Inspector. Pretty and dangerous. There ought to be a law forbidding the manufacture of these toys. Every one of them is capable of death. Funny. What is? The body out here. On the landing. Yes. Well, we'll find the reason for that shortly. Not much blood. Twenty-twos don't make much of a hole. Uh, stay here, Pepper. I want the pathologist to see the body before it goes to the morgue. You know the procedure. I'll be inside with the uh, prime and only suspect. Yes, sir. I understand. <laughs> Tell me how it happened. Don't you dare to talk to me like that. Take hold of yourself, Miss Davis. I need the answers to a few questions. I'll answer that. Don't you dare. That's my telephone. Yes? No? This is Inspector Summers of Scotland Yard. I see. I'm sorry, Lady Munsey. You can't speak to your daughter just now. Yes. She'll be coming down to the yard. You can come there if you wish. Goodbye. Now will you leave me alone? You know who my mother is. Which do you prefer, to answer my questions here or to come down to the yard? I refuse to answer anything. That won't look well in the report, miss. Oh, get out of here. Get oh, out. Take Mel. hold of yourself, Miss Davis. I told you and told you. Donald and I were arguing. I suppose I grabbed the gun from under the pillow where I keep it. He tried to take it away from me. And next I knew there was a shot and he was mumbling something about a doctor. And then, then he was dead. No, oh, now leave me alone. Leave me alone. Inspector Summers felt that further questioning was indicated. The location he chose was his own office at the yard. Where did you get the gun, Miss Davis? My husband gave it to me several years ago. Are you married? I was. I'm divorced. Inspector Summers thought of many questions. Where did you struggle over the gun? In the bedroom. I see. Why do you use linoleum for a floor covering in the bedroom? Oh, because it's easy to keep clean and because it's chic and because... Oh, what has that to do with Donald? I'm asking the questions, Miss Davis. Oh, yes, there were many, many questions. How long have you lived at that address? How long did you know Donald Martin? Have you ever bought any ammunition for that gun? What were you quarreling about? It went on and on. And finally... Very well, Miss Davis. We shan't hold you. But don't leave London. And uh, 
Your mother is waiting for you. You'd better go home with her. We are sealing your apartment. An inconvenient matter, violent death from a gunshot wound. Apartments are sealed, people investigate. One's whole life is turned inside out. And then there are the experts. The scientific facts contradict some of Miss Davis's statements, Inspector. They do? For instance? There's no evidence of any scorching of the clothing round the bullet hole. From that fact and the spread of the smoke stain, I deduce that the gun was held from three to six inches from Martin's chest. As the blood ran down the chest, he must have been standing at the time. It would be practically impossible for him to hold the weapon himself in that position. Could he have clutched the barrel, say, in an attempt to take it away from Miss Davis? In that case, his fingers would be singed, or at least blackened. They're not. I do not believe that the man was touching the weapon at all when it was fired. An embarrassing conclusion, to say the least. There were other things. I've checked Martin's shoes at the morgue, Inspector. Well? If they struggled in that bedroom, on that polished linoleum floor... His shoes would have had to scratch the floor. They're leather-soled, and they have metal taps on the tips. Very good. Another discrepancy. Now, uh, Pepper, I think we'd better have a bit of a talk with the neighbors. Are you certain of that, Mrs. Merritt? I am positive. It's not the first time they yelled at each other, those two. And the walls are thin. Do you have it down, Pepper? Yes, sir. They had a quarrel about two weeks ago... He left. She leaned out of the window, only half-dressed, and shouted at him, Laugh, baby, laugh for the last time. And then she fired a gun at him. Thank you. Now then, Mrs. Merritt, before the shot last night, uh, did you catch any of the words they said? His? Oh, no, sir. But, well, her bedroom is next to mine, and I heard her say as clear as day, and at the top of her lungs, I will kill you. Thank you, Mrs. Merritt. Anything else? No, sir. Very well. Uh, let's go, Pepper. All right, Pepper. I think we have the makings of a case. Pick her up. We'll book her for willful murder. And today, the little blue twenty-two, which was to play such an important part in the case, can be seen among the other exhibits in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. As the inspector said, they felt they had a case. The evidence was piling up. Vivian Davis was arrested. Her defense counsel was a distinguished member of the bar. The prosecutor assigned was no less brilliant... But some of the conversation about the case was, was, well, a lot less brilliant. Why, if Larry and I had stayed, we might have seen the whole thing. And darling, those letters. Imagine leaving letters like that lying in your bureau drawer where anyone might find them. And do you suppose the prosecution will use them for evidence? <laughs> this is one trial I simply shall not miss. Let me say here and now, if May owns a gun, I'm walking out, and at once... But Viv always was unstable, you know. That's the kind who'll pull a gun on you when you least expect it. Not for me, old man. Not for me. I always said she was no better than you think. Wild parties at all hours, firing guns around, drinking. Oh, I dare say the woman wasn't happy. But then who is? Now I ask you, who is? Poor Viv. I understand the food in prison is all starches. Seen the headlines? This is a juicy one, what? I'm to be a witness? You don't say. Really, now, you don't say. They tried the case in public gossip long before it came to proper trial. And when the proper trial began, the courtroom was crowded naturally with bright young women and polished young men, the familiars of the defendant. This, however, failed to ruffle the solemnity of a British court. I shall permit no demonstrations. At the least lapse from proper decorum, I shall have the courtroom cleared. And that settled that. The trial proceeded. 
Vivian Davis in simple black sat in the dock between the two wardresses assigned to guard her. On the witness stand, the pathologist repeated his evidence and his conclusions with the prosecution. There was no cross-examination. With Inspector Summers, it was another matter. Inspector, you heard the prison doctor testify that when Miss Davis was admitted to the prison after her arrest, he found bruises on her arms and on one thigh. Yes, sir. And that such bruises might have been sustained in a struggle. Yes, sir. Very well. Now then, in your experience, have you found that when one person handles a gun, that person's fingerprints are usually found on the weapon? That has been my experience. However, if two parties struggled for possession of a certain weapon, would there be fingerprints? In most cases, no, sir. They tend to smudge or eliminate each other's prints. This weapon, which you've identified and which has been entered in evidence as Exhibit A... Did you find this weapon at the scene of the alleged crime? I did. Did you examine it carefully? I did. Did you have it tested for fingerprints? I did. Did you find any? Yes, sir. How many sets? Only one set of prints were on that gun. Whose were they, Inspector? Now tell the jury, please, whose fingerprints were on that gun? Only my own. One more point, Inspector. You stated that you found a bullet in the wall of the bedroom. Correct? Yes, sir. Have you any reason to believe this bullet was fired on the night of the alleged crime? It could have been fired at any time, I suppose. Thank you, Inspector. That's all. Mrs. Merritt, the eager next-door neighbor, had her proverbial day in court. Yes, sir. Just as I told the inspector, she screamed at him, hanging out of the window only half-dressed, and then she fired a shot at him. Counsel for the defense spent little time in the cross-examination of Mrs. Merritt. Madam, did you actually see Miss Davis fire a pistol or gun of some sort at the deceased? I heard the shot after she yelled at him. You said she was only half-dressed at the time. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Then you must have seen her. Well, I took one look, and after that I only listened. Why? Why, Mrs. Merritt? When a woman is in her condition, no other woman cares to watch her. I see. This is your opinion. It certainly is. Your Lordship, I respectfully request that the answers to the last two questions be stricken from the record as constituting an opinion and not evidence. Further, on the grounds that opinions are not warranted as the witness is not qualified as an expert. Well... The uh, clerk will strike the last two answers from the record and the jury is instructed to ignore the testimony. Uh, proceed. No further questions. Thank you, Mrs. Merritt. Back and forth, the battle raged, a battle for a woman's life. The case for the Crown was ably presented. The defense, by cross-examination, by objections in the record, sought to upset testimony to establish points which could be played upon later, the climax of the trial, when Vivian Davis herself took the stand in her own defense. Now, Miss Davis... You understand the seriousness of this situation? Of course. I refer to the testimony that you once fired a gun at Donald Martin from your bedroom window. Is this true? No, it's not true. What did happen that evening? He'd come to see me. He'd asked me for money to pay a gambling debt. And I refused. We quarreled. And he left. I was furious and I called to him from my window. Then I went back into the room and fired one shot to make him think I'd kill myself. What happened then? Oh, Donald... Mr. Martin came rushing back, and we... We were friends again. Miss Davis, have you ever pointed a weapon at Mr. Martin? No, never. Have you wanted to? No, never. Did you shoot him the night he died? No! Have you any recollection of his having spoken to you between the time he was shot and the moment he died? I'll never forget it as long as I live. What did he say? He said, I wish the doctor would hurry. I I want to tell him that this was an accident. It's not your fault. He said it over and over. And then he was dead. Thank you, Miss Davis. Your witness. Pull yourself together, Miss Davis. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, very well. I submit, Miss Davis, that the truth of your first public quarrel is as it was stated by your previous witness. 
that you did fire out of your window at Mr. Martin. Oh, no, never. I fired in the room. I wanted to frighten him. Miss Davis, is this your pistol? Yes. Is this the weapon which killed Mr. Martin? Yes. And on the night this gun, your gun, killed Mr. Martin, you had a quarrel, a second quarrel. Yes. You were, to put it simply, jealous of his behavior with other women. Oh, I was so jealous, I threatened to kill myself. You threatened to kill yourself? Yes. Then why did you shout, I will kill you? No, 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 I never said that. What did you say, Miss Davis? I, I may have said I'll shoot myself. The other, I never said. Why should I? I was jealous, but that was because I loved him. Oh, you've got to believe me. I loved him. I did. I did. There was more, much more, over and over. But they never managed to shake her on the essential points. I never pointed a gun at Donald in my life. And, of course... I never said I'd kill him. I said I'd kill myself. At long last, with Vivian Davis on the verge of collapse, the prosecutor let her go. Shortly thereafter, the defense rested. Summations were brief. For the prosecution? This woman is guilty of the crime with which she is charged. There is no doubt in our minds, nor should there be any in yours, that she held the pistol and fired the shot. For the defense? It is clear that no woman kills the man she loves, despite the violence of their cause. This was an accident. It is clear that it was an accident. The presiding justice was clear and concise in his charge to the jury. Gentlemen of the jury, in conclusion, let me advise you there are three possible verdicts you may return under the present indictment. Guilty of murder, guilty of manslaughter, or not guilty of any offense. I commend the accused to your most painstaking deliberations. The jury filed out. They stayed out for two long, weary hours. There was chatter in the courtroom. How was his? But even the gossip was subdued. Everybody waited. Waited. It seems perfectly incredible. A murder trial, and I've been in on it since the beginning. I do hope the judge wasn't as much against her as he seemed to be. Well, it's really too exciting for words. I've had more dinner invitations because I know Vim. Oh, well, after all, the poor girl might be hanged, you know. Oh, grisly thought. Well, for my part, even if she gets up, there'll be one advantage. She'll never be my neighbour again. And that will be an improvement, I'd say. And at long last, the waiting was over. The prisoner arose in the dock, the judge's request. The foreman of the jury faced the prisoner in the court. The age-old formula was intoned by the clerk. Members of the jury, have you agreed upon a verdict? We have. Do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty of murder? Not guilty. Do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty of manslaughter? Not guilty. Yet, despite that verdict, the little blue 22 can be seen today among the exhibits in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. Yes, they let Vivian Davis go free. In many minds, the question was, and still is, did Vivian Davis get away with murder? Frankly, I don't believe anyone gets away with murder. Murder stays with a killer, twisting mind and heart and soul, even in the unsuspected and therefore unsolved cases. Where Vivian Davis was concerned, perhaps the real crime was insecurity and the kind of violent jealousy that grows from fear. I don't know. That's for the psychologist, not for you and I to decide. Meanwhile, the little blue 22 remains in its customary place in Scotland Yard in the Black Museum. And now, until we meet again next time, in the same place, and I tell you another story about the Black Museum, I remain, as always, obediently yours. The Black
Black Museum, starring Orson Welles, is presented by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Radio Attractions. The program is written by Ara Marion, with original music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum, a repository of death. Yes, here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide. Where everyday objects, a kitchen knife, a roller skate, a violin string, all are touched by murder. There's a 32 caliber bullet. It's a familiar object. Brass cartridge case, snob lead and nose. Not very pretty to look at. Interesting, this bullet, Sergeant. Notice the back of the cartridge case. Yes, sir. It's for a center fire weapon. The firing pin of the pistol must strike the center of the cartridge. Right. But the weapon in which we found this bullet was a rim fire revolver. The firing pin could strike only the edge of the cartridge. That little fact, Sergeant, saved at least one life, I'd say. Well, today, that center fire bullet can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Black Museum. Scotland Yard's museum. The museum of murder. Here lies death. So orderly, so well kept. Row and row. A macabre record of the violence of many generations. Each object in its place, each marked, tagged, carded with name and place and date. Each object in this room enjoyed in its life one supreme moment and the eyes of the world were upon it. And it played its silent part in a case of murder. And here we are. Here's a jeweled ring, fit for a princess, but born of a mind like the Borgia's. Press the jewel, so, and a tiny point licks out, a fang, dripping death. Shake hands with your enemy. Shortly thereafter, he dies. A bathtub. Yes, a bathtub. White, smooth, shining in the dimness. Once a man floated face down in this tub. He slipped or he had been pushed. Was the mark on his skull caused by striking his head as he slipped? Or by a blunt weapon? In any case, he drowned. Ah, I see. The thirty-two caliber bullet. Even here, lying so quietly, so somberly, it's... It's ugly. This object was made for killing... As a matter of fact, he never did kill. That's the story. It began on a London street. A dark sedan drove slowly into the stream of traffic. There were three young men in it. One seems quite a bit younger than the other. Even so, the car continues to cruise along. You've got everything straight, Rod? Sure, sure. Do you think I'm a goon? You just want to be sure, kid. That's all. Now, what did we tell you? I'll stay in the car till you wigwag is all clear. Then I'll go in with you. Hey, there's a chance to park the old bus. Oh, kick it. <laughs> What's the fenders now? Wouldn't want nobody to ask for your license at a time like this, eh? Maddie, leave me alone. Sure, Jack, sure. Just kidding him, that's all. What's the matter, you edgy? Cold as ice, that's me. Yeah, ice is what we're going to get. All set. Let's go. Two young men leave an automobile, stroll up the street... Hands in pockets, cigarettes dangling loosely from their mouths. They walk past a busy jewelry store. Pretty crowded. Maybe we ought to wait. Could be. No use taking chances. 
They stroll a few steps farther on. They turn, start back, quite casually. Hey, what's the kid doing? Oh, the guy's going into the store. Come on. A goon must have thought we made the signal. Got your gun? What else? Slow down now. Here we go. Rod, what's the idea? You went back, didn't you? Never mind. Let's do it. Right. All right, everybody. This is a hold-up. Oh. Over against that wall. Everybody. These guns are loaded. No. You don't take my stuff. No. Shut up, you. Quiet. Anybody talks, I'll give it to him. Rod, grab the junk on the counters. You there. Stand still. You've got the button. Rod, the car. Start the engine. Ready. Scream. Jack, the truck, it's double parked. We can't get the car out. We're stuck behind that truck. Don't put it, kid. That way. I can't get the car out. I can't. Come on, Jack. Keep moving. Stop, you. Stop, stop. You're the thieves. Stop. Get, 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 get out of my way, you. I got you. I've got you. Oh, no. got you. Please. Ah! Oh. Now it's in the fire. Run, Reddy. dead on the sidewalk. The crowd milled around him. The black sedan stayed in its place. Three young men disappeared in the teeming streets, disappeared completely and utterly. A few hours later, in a quiet office in Scotland Yard, Inspector Bowers and Detective Sergeant Wood looked at what they had. Not very much of anything, have we, Sergeant? No, sir. Descriptions which could be any of a hundred men and two bullets. Yeah, a forty-five bullet from the woodwork in the jewellery store and the thirty-two which killed that fellow. With no guns to go with them. Well, if those boys were smart at all, they'd ditch the guns. Funny, you'd expect a lot more shooting in a thing like that. Yeah, they were conserving ammunition. Oh, well, I don't know. Circularize the descriptions and what there is of them. That's about all for the moment. Yes, sir. Three men, youngish, white handkerchiefs over... And that was all. Now, where do you start among eight million people searching for three youngish men who may be miles away by now? Well, the answer is you don't start. You wait. You have patience. And sometimes your patience is rewarded. Sometimes sooner than you expect. This is Wilson, Inspector. He's the cabbie who called in this morning. Ah, how do you do, Wilson? Sit down. Uh, thank you, sir. Thanks very much. Wilson may have something on the jewellery store killing, sir. Yes, well, let's hear it, Wilson. Well, sir, I never thought about it until I seen the papers this morning. All about the hold-up and that poor fellow who got himself killed yesterday. Yes, go on, Wilson. Well, sir, I was, uh, I was taking my cab along Queensbury Road, you know, about a block from the place where it all happened, mm -hmm. when a fellow with a white thing round his neck hops on the running board. Mm -hmm. I've a fair, so I waves him off. Then I see him go into that big building, the Brook Building, I think it is, sir. You know, corner of Queensbury and Mason. Oh, you're certain of this, Wilson? Oh, yes, sir. Anything else? Now, I'm not so sure of this, Inspector, but I think I saw another fellow run in the building after the one what jumped onto my cap. Oh, very good, Wilson. Well, you may have been quite helpful. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks. Um, get your hat, Sergeant. We're going exploring. The reward of patience. And sooner than expected, but only a bare and vague beginning. This kind of investigation takes long hours and hard work. And endless, endless questions. Up and down the hallways of the large office building, in and out of business offices. Did you notice any commotion in the hall yesterday around three o'clock? Did a man with a white scarf around his neck take your elevator around three o'clock yesterday? Did you hear any running or anything like that around three o'clock yesterday? On and on, upstairs, downstairs, nothing. No one noticed anything, nothing irregular, no commotion. How was that? Did the porter notice anything? Uh, two fellows. One of them had a raincoat, I think. Both of them had white rags around their collars, sort of. Oh, you're sure of this? Oh, yes, sir. They they seemed in a hurry, sort of. Where did they go? Uh, which office, you mean? That's right. Well, I wouldn't know, sir. They, they went up the stairs just as I was putting some empty waste cans on the service lift. Oh, did you see the men again? Well, now you mention it, yes, sir, I did. Where? On the third floor, it was. I was taking my mop to the hall. Uh, one of them was sort of half sitting on the stair rail. The other fellow was looking out of the hall window that opens onto Queensbury, sir. They, uh, they didn't have the white rags, sir, but, but they were the same fellows. Uh -huh. Anything else? No, sir, not that I remember. 
Oh, Bob Saunders might know something, Inspector. Oh, who's this Saunders? Oh, he drives a van, sir. He's been making deliveries to this place every afternoon for years. Ah, thank you. Right, well, let's go, Sergeant. Maybe Mr. Saunders does know something. We have your address. They reached the street outside, just as a large, rather decrepit truck, driven by an equally decrepit elderly man, pulled up to the curbstone. You, Pop Saunders? That's me? Who are you? Sergeant Wood, Scotland Yard. This is Inspector Bowers. Yes? Have I done something? No, but you may have seen something that'll help us. Yes, sir? Were you here at this time yesterday? Yes, sir. I'm always here. This time of day. Well, did you notice anyone with a white scarf go into the building? Uh, running, perhaps? Oh, those two. Yes, sir, I did. Funny thing, they seemed in such a hurry. One of them had a raincoat. They came out later. No scarves and no raincoat. <laughs> The search is on for a raincoat. Scarves or handkerchiefs can go into pockets, not raincoats. The Brook Building swarms with police. Every nook and cranny is inspected in the cellar in a dark corner. This must be it, Inspector. Every other raincoat in the building is accounted for. Not a mark on it. Nothing. Yeah, try ripping the lining, Sergeant. <laughs> Nothing, sir. Except the manufacturer's stock tag under the armpit. Yeah, not much. But a little, at any rate. Check the manufacturer from there to the jobber who bought the lot in which that coat was packed. From the jobber to the retailer. It's times like this, I thank heaven for rationing. At least they have to keep a record of the clothing coupons and the names of everyone who buys anything. A thin, a tenuous trail and a mountain of sales slips to go through. But nothing strikes a chord of memory. And then the sergeant thinks of something. Inspector! When they make out these records, don't they write the last names first? Yeah, you're right. They do. Oh, well, back over it again. Here, how about this, Sergeant? Mac Stanley. The other way, Stanley Mac. Remember that name, Sergeant? Stanley Mac. Not a usual name. Yes, sir, I do. D didn't he testify at a trial about two years ago? He did. The trial of Jack Georgeston. He was sent away for armed robbery. First offense. Light sentence. Pal Georgeston ought to be out by now. All right, let's get his dossier over here, Sergeant, and then invite him in for a talk. It may be interesting, if nothing else. Well, today, that center fire bullet can be seen in the Black Museum. It was a long chance. One man buys a raincoat. This man happens to be a witness at another man's trial. The defendant is sent to prison for armed robbery under circumstances similar to the case under investigation. The inspector in charge sends for the convicted man's dossier and finds... Well, so Jack Georgeston was released from prison six days before the Queensbury killing. Ah, well, let's have the young man into the yard, shall we, Sergeant? You'll be able to find him easily enough, I think. If not, we can suspect flight because of guilt, can't we? Send a pickup order out for him. Jack Georgeston was found. Found quite easily in London. Look, you haven't a thing on me, Inspector, and you know it. Maybe, maybe not. Sergeant, show um, Mr. Georgeston the garment. Here it is, Georgeston. Do you recognize it? There's a million raincoats like that. Yeah, but not bought by Stanley Mack. Oh. Uh, that coat. You know it? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't have nothing against the rain last week when I got out. So Stan gave me the coat. Well, where did you lose it? I didn't lose it. I never lost nothing. Except a little time recently. Yeah, we know about that. I figured you did. Keep a civil tongue in your head, George, to understand. Okay. Okay, I said. Right, now, since you didn't lose this raincoat, how is it that we found it? I, uh, I loaned it to a fella. How should I know what he did with it? Oh, well, who had it? I don't remember. Now, you receive a raincoat as a gift against the rain. Within a matter of days, you loan it to someone, but you don't remember to whom. That's right. I don't remember. You try him, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Speak up, man. Who had that coat? I don't remember. Well, maybe I can refresh your memory. The coat's hooked up with a murder. Now, who had it? I don't remember. I don't remember. That Take was the it refrain. All I don't remember. I don't remember. 
Nor could they make him remember. Finally, they let him go. There was nothing to hold him on. But Inspector Bowers said... I want a tail on him, Sergeant. 24 hours a day. We'll pick up his friends one by one and see where he leads us. One of those friends was a boy named Rodney Hamilton. Let me alone. I never did nothing. How old are you, Hamilton? 17. And you got no right... We happen to know that you've been away to a reform school, Hamilton. You were caught snatching ladies' purses two years ago. So what? I did me time. You don't keep very good company, son. George Stinner's been out of prison about a week. Well, we like each other. I'll pick my own friends. Where were you day before yesterday, about 2.30 in the afternoon? Home, in bed. Ah, sleeping late, hmm? Well, I, I was sick. Had a fever. We can check that, you know. Go ahead, check it. I was at home in bed. All afternoon, all morning and all night. I was sick. Yes, we know. You said that before. Now, look here. Well, it didn't do any good. The boy was obviously afraid. But whether of the police or of the men he knew, it was impossible to tell. Still... The patience of Scotland Yard was rewarded once again. A report came in from detectives assigned to follow both Georgeston and Hamilton that they'd been present at a party in a bar given by a third young man named Matty Canvas. Dossier on Canvas, Inspector. Ah, oh, thank you. So, oh, nice lad. Stole a car when he was 11. Convicted, assault with intent to rob. Convicted, jewel robbery... Convicted, armed robbery and assault. <laughs> nice little trio, our three friends, aren't they, Sergeant? No, not exactly. Do you want canvas brought in, sir? Yes, do that. Oh, and, uh, Sergeant, bring the other two along, but keep them separated. Don't let any one of them know that we have the other two. Nothing highly dramatic, merely routine, Scotland Yard routine, recognisable as standard practice by any policeman in any large city. Bring him in for questioning. And it always helps to have a few facts. Facts on which to base the questions. With this in mind, and knowing their underworld, Inspector Bowers and Sergeant Wood repaired to that certain bar where Matty Canvas held parties for his friends. Nothing much here. Well, there may be. Keep your ears open. Uh, another pint of ale, please. Hey, right you are, sir. Oh, in now, Larry. Let me wait on the gentleman. Sit yourself, Miguel. Sit yourself. <laughs> Oh, well, down the hatch. Right. Patience. Frequent the bar. Wait. Keep your ears open. Don't talk. Just wait. Say, Larry, you hear they picked up Matty? Yeah, and the other two. Rod, too? That kid? Well, I for one ain't sorry. Gives a place a bad name. I mean, kids are out with, with guns in their pockets. Not bright. Canvas ain't bright, that's for sure. Let's himself get bunked out of 5,000 quid's worth of stuff. Gets mad and works the kid like that, they're rod. Oh, well, so it goes, I will say. Uh, another couple of pints, please, miss. Oh, yeah, sure. There you are. Um, do you know a lad named Canvas? Me? I don't know nobody. Uh, how about a kid named Hamilton? You think I'll keep track of everybody comes in here? Yeah, that would be difficult. I um, thought I heard you mention Mr. Canvas by name. So did my friend here. Then you thought wrong. We don't encourage conversation with the elder. No, I don't suppose you do. Um, care to have a drink on us? I'm not certain that I drinks with cops, mister. <laughs> More routine ahead. More routine for the inspector and the sergeant after they left the bar. They checked descriptions of the men seen at hold-ups and robberies prior by some months to the tragedy in Queensbury Street. In one case, a description tallied with Matty Canvas. Mr. Canvas was invited out of his cell and into the inspector's office. All right, Canvas. You've been identified on the Davis job. You'll do a good long stretch for that. You may as well tell us what you know about the Queensbury shooting. I don't know nothing. Turn King's evidence, Canvas, and you'll get off easily. Otherwise, it's a hanging matter. You can't pin that one on me. I was miles away. I can prove it.
Well, suppose I told you the kid's been talking his head off. Rod? Talk? Not in your life. He's too scared somebody will cut his liver out. Oh, all right, Canvas, if that's the way you want it. Take him back, Sergeant. We'll give him plenty of time to think. No luck with Georgeton either. But the kid, there was a chance he'd break. Just a chance. The inspector took it. Look, boy, your pals are saying that you held a gun that killed a fellow in the Queensbury hold-up. I, I, I never had a gun. Maybe they're framing you, lad. After all, you're pretty young, 17. You won't hang. They will. So naturally, they say it was you. I didn't. I, I never touched the gun. Canva says you did, that you had the 32 all the time. I never did. They can't say it. They can't. But they do. Both of them told me. Looks to us like they got together to put the job on you. Well, why shouldn't they? They might have to die. And there were only two guns. They had them. You've got to believe that. You've got to. We don't have to believe anything except evidence. If you had the guns, if I told you where they were, I... I said it. I, I didn't mean to talk. I did, I did. Keep talking, lad. It's the only way to save your neck. My, my, my neck? If you held that gun and pulled that trigger... All right, we, we threw the guns away, both of them. The 45 Matty had and the 32 Jack had. We, we threw them in the river from the, from the quay at the Lancashire Wharf. If you can find them, you'll see. Maybe there'll be fingerprints. You, you've got to find them guns... You got her! Ballistic report, Inspector. The 45 fired the bullet we found in the woodwork. The 32 killed the man in the street. And it's funny, half the cartridges in the 32 were rim fire, the other half were center fire. Those didn't go off. If they had, chances are there'd have been a lot more murder. And today, if you're interested, you can find that center fire bullet in a place of honor in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. It's an accepted fact in police work that 80% of the occupants of our prison either were talked there or talked themselves there. In this case, it was patient police routine plus the talking of young Rod Hamilton, which put Rod behind bars for the rest of his life and brought Georgeton and Canvas to the 13 steps and the rope one morning at 8 o'clock. There's a postscript to this story. The use of a gun by an English criminal is rare. Nor in England do the police go armed in their normal course of duty. The Hamilton case was one of the more obvious symptoms of a post-war disease of violence. The death of Georgeton and Canvas was not without its effect on this disease. For days, weeks, and even months after their execution, pistols, guns, knives, many of them perhaps innocent wartime souvenirs, others of more dubious origin, were found by the police on rubbish heaps, disused gardens on the mud banks of the River Thames. The criminal world of London had come to terms with their traditional enemies at Scotland Yard. And perhaps, after all, the innocent man had not died in vain. The bullet that killed him, the centre-fire bullet, remains in its customary place in the Black Museum. And now, until we meet next time in the same place, I tell you another story about the Black Museum. I remain, as always... Obediently yours. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum, a repository of death. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide where everyday objects, a piece of wire, a chemist's flask, a silver shilling, all are touched by murder. Here's a bathtub. And it's a familiar object. This is an old-fashioned one, a ball and claw-footed bathtub without plumbing connections. It's the kind our fathers and mothers knew about. Into this they poured the Saturday night water by hand. Some liked it cool. Others liked it hot. There we are, dear. Is that hot enough? If you think so, darling. Oh, you're the sweetest. 
I wonder how I had the luck to marry you. Part of my job, dear, taking care of you. And one day soon, we shall have a tub with taps. One of the new ones. You'll see. And today, the bathtub can be found in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear the Black Museum starring... Orson Wells. Here we are. Here we are in the Black Museum. Scotland Yard's mausoleum of murder. Here lies death. Like the ordered rows of markers in a military cemetery, the white cards of the black printing line, the silent shelves, the cabinets, the crowded floor, each card identifying a means to murder. A lovely wine glass here, beautiful ringing crystal. Yet in that sound was terror. In this glass was poison and horrible writhing death. Now here we are, here's the bathtub. So innocent, even comical. Basis for a thousand jokes, foundation for laughter, circa 1910. No plumbing attached, of course. One poured the water in from buckets and pitches. Truly an effort, the use of such a tub as this. Definitely a matter for an interior, not for an exterior. Certainly not for a garden like this, where in the peaceful year of 1910, Edward Jones read aloud to his wife, Evelyn. Friendship is constant in all other things, save in the office and affairs of love. Therefore, all hearts in love use their own terms. Let every eye negotiate for itself and trust no agent. For beauty is a witch against whose charms faith melteth into blood. This is an accident of hourly proof which I mistrusted not. Hmm. But Shakespeare's much ado about nothing, my dear. Like it? You read so well, Eddie, darling. So well. Oh, I do like it here, Evelyn. I wish nothing ever interrupted us. But, as the bard said, the world is too much with us. You make that sound as if you were going off on another trip. Are you, darling? I'm afraid so. That case for Mr. Carter, the oh. Ming Dynasty cherry water bottle, remember? I've heard of one up north. Oh, dear, I wish I could run an antique shop without these interminable trips. But I suppose there's nothing for it. Too bad. Poor Eddie, poor Evelyn, separated so often and for such long periods. But business is business, and a living must be made. Eddie bids his wife a fond farewell and proceeds on his way to a middle-sized city. And there he walks the street, enjoying the sunshine and the crowd. When suddenly... Ed! Oh! Oh, Ed, darling! Oh, it's last after all these months! Oh, Ed! Wait! What? Ed! Oh, my darling. Oh, Eddie. Oh, it's been so long and no word. I thought I, I... I thought you might be dead. Of course not, darling, like the bad penny. Why, I was hoping against hope I'd find you any minute. I went back to our place, but you're gone. A new landlady, no information. Oh, but what happened, darling? You never wrote. And I waited and waited. Yes, I... It was an accident, darling. Blow on the head. Amnesia. Only a few days ago, I came back to myself. Oh, oh, my poor darling. No matter, darling Annie. We are back together. Once again, we are husband and wife. So that's the little game, is it? A wife in every city, is it? Well, now, Mr. Edward Jones, what's the idea? What can this get you, besides a heap of trouble and stiff prison sentence? What can it get you? There we are, Anne, my dear. I've signed mine. Now you sign yours. You see? Ladies are first, except in getting off trolley cars or signing wills. <laughs> oh, Eddie, you are sweet. There we are. Now, oh, heaven forbid, anything happens to you, all you have is mine, and vice versa, if anything should happen to me. Heaven forbid, Anne, my dear. Well, apparently it can get you plenty. If your wife has plenty, 
And Anne was, well, decently off with a needy income from her father's estate, although she was not allowed to touch the principal. However, there was a proviso concerning her husband's rights, if and when. I'm horribly upset about it, Doctor. Here she is, apparently in perfect health. She has an awful fit, and all she remembers about it is a slight headache. She's my wife, Doctor. These things happen, Mr. Jameson, I can assure you. Oh. So Eddie Jones is Eddie Jemison hereabouts. Ah, that's interesting. Nothing. I found absolutely nothing physiologically wrong with Mrs. Jameson. She's in perfect physical health. Now then. But how can I be, Doctor, when I have these terrible fits? There are such things even we doctors don't know yet, my dear. Such as the reaction of the human mind to great stress. And you've been through such stress with Mr. Jameson missing so long. But what can we do about it, Dr. Margotson? Oh, just rest, relaxation, quiet, peace. Most important relaxation. Now I'll prescribe a mild sedative each night before sleeping. So simple, so easy, so diabolical, and so considerate. No, Anne, darling, you mustn't even fetch your own bath water. There we are, almost full, and nice and warm. Just like to relax him, just as the doctor ordered. Oh, Eddie, I don't know why you do all this for me. I don't do half as much for you. You do, darling, just by being. You know that, don't you? No, I say it a hundred times a day. Eddie, you're sweet. All right, my dear. Now, step in. I'll help you. Take care. The water may be hot and the tub may be slippery. There we are, dear. That hot enough? If you think so, darling. Oh, you're the sweetest. Oh, I wonder how I had the luck to marry you. Part of my job, dear. Taking care of you. And one day soon we shall have a tub with taps. One of the new ones. You'll see. Ready to sit down, darling? Mm-hmm. Quite a pair of lovebirds, Anne and Eddie Jamison Jones. No wonder the poor fellow could hardly contain himself some 30 minutes later. I went out for a minute to make the tea. Doctor, how could she go so quickly? It is strange. It was certainly an accident. I, I barely turned my back, just put some water in the tea kettle. And when I returned, there she was, floating face down in the water. Doctor, can't you help her? Calm yourself, my boy. Your wife is past help now. <laughs> Such tragedy, such tears, and a will by which Eddie came into something over 800 pounds. In 1910, that was a fair amount of money. Enough for a man to live on with his wife for quite some time. While he read Shakespeare aloud in a quiet garden. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. And summer's lease hath all too short a date. Ah, <sighs> Evelyn, how you stand for me for all my absences. I hardly know. I suppose I love you, dear. You are nice. And you're a good provider. Mm-hmm. So until you come back, I'm always content to wait. Go on. Read some more, darling. Yes. Yes, of course. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, nor eyes can see. So long as... Nor shall death brag. The young man read aloud, but... Where were his thoughts? On his next trip? On the story he would invent? And which story? To which woman? His ever-faithful Evelyn? Or young Libby, whom he took to wife some two months later? This is the bride, Mr. Jameson. This is Mrs. Jameson. Isn't she lovely? Oh, Eddie, stop it. We're only married a few hours, and you're embarrassing me already. My deepest apologies, darling. Are our quarters ready? Oh, they certainly are. I'll let my boy help you with the bags. It's not every night we have a bride and groom in this house, you know. (laughs) No, not every night. This promised to be eventful indeed, particularly if you knew Eddie Jameson Jones. Oh, Mrs. Brandy. Uh, yes, Mr. Jameson? I hate to bother you, but could we have enough hot water for a warm bath? My wife hasn't been well. Some kind of spell, almost a fit. 
Took her to a doctor yesterday. Oh, dear. And so young she is. Nothing serious. Just needs relaxation. That's what the doctor said. She insisted on going through with the wedding, even though I thought it might be better to postpone it. So a good warm bath. Nothing quite so relaxing, is there? I'll set the fire going right away. You have all... Oh, ah, yes. Aria da capo. To repeat the theme. This time with a variation. And the variation was a, a bag of tomatoes. I didn't hear you go out. I just ran out while my wife was in the tub, picked up some tomatoes. Fried tomatoes are her favorite dish. And I thought, well, tonight or all nights, she ought to have them. If you don't mind fixing them, Mrs. Randy. It could be a pleasure, Mr. Jameson. I'll have them ready with your dinner. Never fear. Libby, darling, I'm back. Libby, Libby, are you there? Good heavens! Mrs. Bundy, help! My wife, my wife is floating face down in the tub. She's dead. My wife is dead. And today, you can see that same bathtub in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Yes, the girl was dead, floating in the bathtub, face down, just as Anne before her. And Eddie, he was stricken, heartbroken, as a bridegroom ought to be. My poor Libby. To die alone like that on her wedding night. So good, so sweet, so eager for life. And so in love with me. Even insured her life for me just before we married. As if she had a premonition almost. 750 pounds insurance is a comfortable sum. Man and his wife can live in their garden quite decently with a sum like that for quite a few months. In 1910. But it seems one can grow a trifle bored. Even with a garden. And Shakespeare. How do you feel now, dear? A slight headache, that's all. It'll go away. Evelyn, you've got to go back to the doctor or find a new doctor. A slight headache? That's how your fit started yesterday. No, he's not trying the same thing again. But he seems to be. Of course, he's had two quite successfully accidental deaths in his life so far. Perhaps a third. But that's not possible. Or is it? Almost ready, Evelyn. In a minute, dear. Better come while the water's hot. You know what the doctor said about relaxing? Hurry now, darling. It's steaming, but not too hot. All ready, dear? All right, dear. There's not that much hurry. Oh, dear. Who's that now? Wait for me, darling. I'll help you get in. The tub may be slippery. One day we'll have a modern tub with taps and hot and cold <laughs> running water. You'll see. Now, don't try to get in without me. All right, dear, I'll wait for you. Yes? Are you Edward Jones? I am. We're police officers from Scotland Yard. We have a warrant for your arrest. The charge is murder. I must warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and used in evidence. Please come quietly. <laughs> No, Evelyn Jones never took that bath. She never had another fit, either. Though she sat in the courtroom for the entire trial. The trial of the Crown versus Edward Jones. Also known as Edward Jemison. May it please your lordship, gentlemen of the jury. This is a peculiar case. No one saw this man commit the crime of which he stands accused. Yet every circumstance, every bit of evidence points to the fact that this man stands justly accused and deserves proper punishment. Now, in the course of this trial, you will hear many things about love, about coincidence, about accidental... Oh, yes, they heard many things, that jury, sitting so stiff and serious-minded in its box. 
Not the least was the opening of the famous defense counsel who held a brief for Edward Jones, also known as Jemison. Nor will we deny that this man may have married vigorously, but he did love these poor women, and it was a far, far better thing he did in marrying them than to lead them astray and then leave them alone with remorse, as so many men have done before him. We deny that my client killed these poor women. We claim only that he was the victim of a set of circumstances and the interference of a busybody. Yes, a male busybody. A male had... busybody? Well, perhaps. But how could a policeman, in the proper course of his duty, fail to check on so obvious a coincidence? Yes, sir. We had a letter at Scotland Yard from a Mr. John Curtis. What were the contents of that letter, Sergeant? Mr. Curtis had noticed a brief announcement in the newspapers regarding the death of a young woman, a bride, by drowning in the bathtub. He wished to call our attention to a similar accident some time before. In both cases, the name was Jemison. You saw this letter yourself? I did. Is this the same letter? It is, sir. I offer this letter in evidence, Your Lordship, as Crown Exhibit A. It went on like that, slowly, carefully, plugging all the holes as they went along. The details of a routine police investigation which suddenly had become a little more than routine. Sergeant Mason, when you visited the scene of the first drowning, what did you learn? That the man known as Jemison had mentioned two wills. One by himself in favor of his wife, one by his wife in favor of himself. We checked the files of the probate court. The latter had been probated. We called on the lawyer and Hall. He had a copy of the other will. The man known as Jemison, the deceased, had had quite a bit. And when you visited the scene of the second drowning, Sergeant, we learned that the man known as Jemison had mentioned an insurance policy in his own favor. We inquired of all the insurance companies and found the records. He had received some 750 pounds following the death of the young... The first point established. Motive. Money. Over 800 from Anne. 750 from Libby. Almost 2,000 pounds in all. That's a substantial motive. The questioning of Sergeant Mason went on. Now, in the matter of tracing this man, Jameson, what did you do? Just routine, sir. We checked the mailing address at the insurance company and found it to be the same as the house where the second woman had died. There, we discovered a forwarding address. A postal box. We covered that box. I watched it myself, sir. And when this man known as Jemison came to open it, I followed him. He went first to an antique shop, then to his home. Having located him, I made some quiet inquiries and learned that he was known as Edward Jones. Now, that evening, having communicated with Inspector Wilson at the yard and having received a proper warrant, we placed him under arrest. Very good, Sergeant. Now then, when you called upon Edward Jones, what did you find? The woman who claimed to be his proper wife was waiting upstairs, sir, for him to help her into a hot bath. One further question, Sergeant. Is the man you arrested in this courtroom now? Yes, sir. He's the prisoner and the doctor. Thank you, Sergeant. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, they've been very thorough, all right. They had almost everything. They called Dr. Margitson, for instance. Dr. Margitson, when you first saw Anne Jameson, what was her complaint? That she'd been having fits and not remembering them. Did she tell you this herself? No, her husband did. He was quite insistent on it. Did you find any symptoms of illness, sir? I examined the woman very thoroughly. I found nothing. But that situation is not uncommon in certain types of epilepsy. Now then, Doctor, when you were called to the house on the evening of June the 3rd last, what did you find? The woman I had examined was floating face down in the warm bath and quite dead. The husband was extremely hysterical. I treated him for shock. Did you sign this death certificate? Yes, that's my signature. What is certified as the cause of death? Accidental drowning. We offer this certificate in evidence as crown... They had the landlady who knew Libby Jemison, too. She testified, simply. Oh, yes, sir. He moaned about the insurance policy. Cried all night, he did. Bit by bit, piece by piece, motive, opportunity, proof of death by drowning, medical evidence. But one great piece of the puzzle remained. As the distinguished counsel for the defense asked, where, my lad, is the proof that these two regrettable deaths were anything more than coincidental accidents? Where, my lad, is the witness who saw my client hold these poor women under the water or administer sedatives which caused them to faint in the water or in any way contribute directly to their miserable death? There was no witness. But there was a Scotland Yard inspector with a demonstrable theory. If it please, your lordship... Three bathtubs have been entered in evidence as Crown Exhibits C, D, and E. Inspector Morris Wilson of Scotland Yard has a theory which he wishes to demonstrate as a witness, and he requires the assistance of an expert. Milad. The inspector took the stand, was sworn in. Then, to the amusement of the spectators, a young lady in bathing dress. 
testified to as an expert swimmer, was introduced into the proceedings. One of the tubs was filled with water, warm water. At this point, the prosecutor stated, For the assurance of the court, we have a doctor in attendance. Now then, Inspector, if you please, you may leave the witness box and proceed with your demonstration. Thank you, sir. It is our considered theory that the murders were committed as follows. You will remember that in each case, the prisoner reported he found his wife floating face down. It is reasonable to assume that had the women fainted while sitting or lying in the tubs, they would have been found floating face up. With this in mind, it occurred to us that with the prisoner's insistence on helping his wife into the tub, the procedure was something like this. Uh, may I, young lady? Of course, Inspector. Notice she is standing in the water. Now, prepare to sit down, please. Observe that she bends forward, grasps the side of the bathtub, I seize her ankles thus, and she falls forward on her face. <laughs> Doctor, please, uh, Inspector, get her out of that tub. The girl's unconscious. Get her out before her lungs fill and she drowns. Some hours later, the jury reported. We have reached a verdict, my lord. We find the prisoner guilty of willful and premeditated murder. Well, that same bathtub is where you'd expect to find it today. In the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. Eddie Jones, in spite of his common name, was an uncommon man. Some said he was quite mad. His own defense counsel stated later that when Eddie looked at him with his piercing stare, he felt as if the prisoner were trying to hypnotize him. This, of course, we'll never know. We can only wonder if those poor women were truly hypnotized by Eddie's eyes or merely by his charm and personality. In any case, one woman did not succumb to that charm for long. She was Eddie's real wife, the predecessor of Evelyn. This woman was swindled by Eddie but found him out and sent him to prison for two years. Eddie swore to kill her. She fled to Canada when Eddie left prison that time. But she came back to England and was in the courts the day Eddie Jones was sentenced to hang. And now, until we meet next time, until we meet in the same place, and I tell you another story about the Black Museum, I remain, as always, obediently yours. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide, where everyday objects, objects like a sugar bowl, an ashtray, a portable radio, all are touched by murder. There's a hammer. A hammer, that's a familiar object. Everybody's used one at some time. To drive a tack, a pull a nail, or loosen a window sash, or what have you. Nearly everybody has at one time or another taken part in a conversation like this. Beg pardon, ma'am. Could you pass me my hammer? Your hammer? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Oh, uh, thank you, ma'am. You're not going to use that hammer on the tiles over my fireplace. No, ma'am. Not on the tiles over the fireplace. Well, today, a hammer, an ordinary hammer, but with a very strange story attached to it, can be found in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police... We bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. And here we are, the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Yes, within this room is proof that anything and everything may be part of homicide. And here lies death. Death entombed in glass. Death on endless shelves. 
Murder on exhibition. Tabulated, indexed, guarded, filed. Here's a length of wire. Wireless antenna, sleek, shining, coppery, designed to bring pleasure to the human ear. This wire missed the ear. Instead, it was wrapped around a soft, white neck. Twisted. Twisted. Perfect garrote. Here's a cigarette lighter. It's dainty. Jeweled, monogram, stolen from its proper owner, and then flicked, lighted, applied to no cigarette. The victim had a bad heart. Who was to know this? Question. Was it murder? Answer. Yes. Ah, here we are. It's the hammer. It's a claw hammer with two curved blades designed for pulling nails. It's heavy, well-balanced, perfect tool. One Saturday morning, it rested in a canvas bag. The owner rang a doorbell in Oxford. Ma'am, did I take you by surprise? Well, yes. You see, I was expecting a friend of mine, and, well, to see a young man standing there when you're expecting an elderly lady... Uh, nothing to take amiss, ma'am. My card. Oh? Oh, thank you. James Knight, house repairs while you wait. Oh, well, thank you, but there's nothing wrong with my house. <laughs> That's what everybody says. Only I don't mean the house itself. I mean the household. Furniture and the like. It's the little things gets people talking. Well, I, I'm sure I don't need anything done. Now you take your doormat, ma'am, right there. Look, along the edges, the binding's going. You notice it now? A stitch in time, as the saying goes, and you'll not be needing a new mat in six months. Well, I do declare. You're right. Now, ma'am, if you'd just let me check your house, I, I'd be willing to bet I'd found a dozen little items. Cost you a few pence now, help me to earn my living and save you pounds later. Uh, can I come in, ma'am? Thank you. Well, you are a smooth talker, aren't you, young man? Oh, I need to be in my business. Now, if you'd just show me your living room... Uh, through the portier, right there. Yes, a very nice room. Blends with your personality, if I may say so. <laughs> well, then, right to work. Tools down... <coughs> Well, we'll just look about. I'll bet anything you want, I find a dozen things need fixing. In. Now he's inside. He notes the room. He's well aware of the brass crucifix on the mantel shelf, the prissy draperies at the windows, the antimacassars on the mahogany framed horsehair chairs. It's almost a museum. Now you take this chair, ma'am. The leg's loose, bound to be. The glue dries out. The wood shrinks, well, you know. Well, I never noticed that. Ah, you wouldn't, ma'am. Takes an expert's eye. Drop of glue today saves a new chair tomorrow. And they don't build furniture like this nowadays. No, I dare say they don't. Oh, dear, that's my telephone. No one to answer it. Well, the girl who stays with me has gone to the country. Bank holiday weekend. She won't be back till Monday night. Well, you just answer it. I'll be all right. Oh, big pardon, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Could you pass me my hammer? Your hammer? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Ah, uh, thank you, ma'am. You're not going to use that hammer on the tiles over my fireplace. Oh, no, ma'am. Just tap them with the wooden handle. See if they're loose anywhere. Oh, you can trust me, ma'am. You just answer your telephone. Oh, dear, yes, of course, the telephone. Hello? Why, Caroline! Mrs. Golden, that's her name, answers the telephone. The young man in the living room, front room to Mrs. Golden, taps the tiles merrily, and then he stops. He looks around, looks at things, and quickly in a few things. He shuts the desk just as... Oh, dear, this is a disappointment. Something's wrong with my friend's card. She can't come for me after all, and it is such a nice day. Oh, that is too bad. But not too inconvenient. Now I can really get some work done. Oh? You found a lot of things to repair? About 50 pounds worth. But you said... Only a few pence today. That was earlier. Now it's going to cost you 50 pounds to get me out of this house. I... I don't understand. I think you do. You know, I know you had 50 pounds in the mail yesterday. You told a couple of your girlfriends, and I heard about it. Now then, Grandma, hand it over. You get out of here. 
Paula, I, I, I'll call the police. Fifty pounds, here. I will call. Don't try anything. Oh. I'm between you and the phone now. Now pay up, Grandma, or, or I'll have to beat it out of you. You wouldn't. You couldn't. No. Put the hammer away. You heard me. I'm through asking now. Now, where's the money? I, I didn't really get it. I, I was just boasting. Cut it. Put down that vase. Don't. Stay away from me. Keep away. Put it down. I, I threw it. Keep away. did it. Keep away. Fight with me, will you? You haven't had enough, have you? Try this one and this one and this one. Bank holiday in Oxford. No one due home till Monday evening. Someone tried late Sunday. Whoever it was kept trying, but only the bell sounded in the empty house. Empty? Was it filled with death? Monday morning, a man somewhat younger but not much than Mrs. Goldwyn parked his middle-class car in front of the house in Oxford. He had a worried expression on his face as he walked up the few steps and pressed the doorbell. Again he tried. No answer. Ran down the steps around the back. Knocked on the back door. Nothing. Nothing but the sound of his own fists beating the thin panels. Now he is upset. He peers in at the kitchen window... Finally, he wraps his hand in his muffler, as he's seen them do in the movies, and punches a hole in the window. The reeker then unlocks the window, lifts the sash, and climbs in. He walks through the house toward the front. Silence, save for his own strangely empty footsteps. At the portiers in the arch which lead to the living room, he stops. Good heavens! What's this? It's... Oh, it's... It's blood! Operator, please, hurry. Put me through the Scotland Yard. There's, there's been a... My sister's been murdered. Well, that's how it comes, you know. First the bitter shock, the cry on the telephone, the hurried, incoherent report, and then the cars racing through the streets, pulling up the men, piling out. Invading a once peaceful home. Mrs. Golden was your sister, Mr. Bevan. That's right. I can't understand it, Inspector. I just can't. I know how you must feel. And you want to help us all you can. Of course, of course. Well, well, then time is very often the essence. I'll have to ask you a few questions right away. I'll try to answer them. You told us you broke the back window yourself, right? Yes, that's right. When she didn't answer the phone Sunday evening, I began to worry. I drove here this morning... The doors were locked and no one answered the bell. I... I broke in. I suppose I should have called a constable, but I didn't... I understand. Tell me, Mr. Bevan, did your sister have any enemies? Of course not. Oh, pardon me, Inspector. We found this under the crucifix on the mantel. It's 50 pounds. Thank you, Sergeant. Apparently, robbery was the motive. Mr. Bevan, do you happen to know where your sister would get 50 pounds? She had a small income. Perhaps the money was a dividend. Preliminary medical report, Inspector. Go ahead, Doctor. Well, death occurred about 48 hours ago. Make it Saturday in the morning. We'll tell more after the autopsy. Saturday. Two days start on us. Go on, Doctor. She was struck on the head by a blunt instrument several times. A hammer or something of that sort. But the fellow was taking no chances. Her carotid artery was severed by something very sharp. That's why the blood. Whoever it was, well, it looks very professional, the way the place was ransacked. We're nothing much here. But, uh, shall we have a go at it, Sergeant? Well, they had a go at it, the inspector and the sergeant. There's nothing in the woman's house. Not even a smudged fingerprint. But, as Sergeant Marshall put it... I've seen this sort of thing before. Looks like a house-to-house canvasser to me, Inspector. It has that familiar feel about it. Routine, Sergeant. Routine. Door to door, up and down the streets. Questions, questions, questions. Did a canvasser call here Saturday morning, ma'am? Leave a card or anything? Do you remember anyone ringing the bell to leave a card, sir? Wanting to do repair work? Thank you, miss. Yes, you've been quite helpful. Five houses up the street, five down the street. And strangely enough, 
results. A bit too careful, Mr. Knight. Too careful, Inspector? And too smart for himself. He left his card at all the houses on the street, and this one in the middle, he picked up the card before he left Saturday morning. Foolish. Bound to attract attention to himself. Knight. James Knight. It's familiar. Joe Knowles. His favorite alias is James Knight. Oh, I remember now, sir. Two years in Dartmoor. Assault and battery on an elderly lady. Right. Well, call for a car, Sergeant. We may as well check the address on this card. Mr. Knight? Oh, yes. Used to live here. I see. Used to live here. Well, been packed up and gone these two months now. Quiet sort of fella. Though I didn't cotton to him much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Welcome, I'm sure. Not two days behind, Inspector. Two months. We're not doing too badly, Sergeant. We know when and how he got in. We know how he committed the crime. And we've got a good idea who he is. Not too badly, Sergeant. No, not too badly. But the inspector forgot to mention the most important clue of all. The murder weapon. That self-same hammer. Which can be seen today in the Black Museum. It looked like a long haul. Two months behind and no trace. Not a thing to place him in Oxford on the Saturday of bank holiday. The calling cards, true, but they might have been left any time. And one confused witness would make any jury doubt the exact pinpointing of the date. Still, the man had to be found. Scotland Yard began its long, steady, methodical routine. Circulate Knight's description from his prison record. Have prints made of his picture. Somebody will remember him somewhere. They always do. Somebody did. The landlord of a tavern in Oxford, half a mile from the house where death had struck that Saturday morning. I remember that fella. Certainly do. You're sure now? Positive. Come in here, looked like he needed a drink. Took two whiskies straight, one right after the other. Was carrying a tool bag of some kind, I think. How long did he stay? Just till a bus stopped outside. He threw the price on the bar and hopped the bus real quick-like. You happen to know where the bus was headed? Aylesbury. No other bus stops right outside that door. A break in the luck. Aylesbury. The town was investigated, to all practical intents and purposes. And before long, Inspector Graham and Sergeant Marshall were in the lobby of a small rundown hotel talking with a combination desk clerk and telephone operator. Do you remember Mr. Knight, Miss Marsh? Oh, I do that. Of course, he's not the kind I'd pay much attention to. But I remember him all right. Is he in trouble? Why do you ask? Oh, well, sort of... Well, you know how it is. A man leaves here sudden-like after being in and out for a couple of months. Then a couple of fellows come looking for him. Well, you wonder, that's all. We're from Scotland Yard, Miss. Oh, then he is in trouble. Maybe, maybe not. We'd like a look at his room. I'll show you. Just one flight up. Davy, watch my board. I'm busy. This way, gentlemen. An obliging girl, Miss Marsh. Complete with bass key, she ushered the men up the worn stairway along the dim hall. She fitted the key. Swung open the door. There you are, Inspector. Thank you, Miss. Seems to have left a bit of baggage, Inspector. So he has. This is nights, isn't it, Miss? Oh. Oh, didn't I mention it? Oh, he said he'd probably be back. So would I mind if he left his bag, even though he didn't want to keep on with the room rent? So I left it here, just in case he came back before we let the room. Nice of you. Open it, Sergeant. Ah, oh, not locked. Well, careless type of fellow. A new hammer. Nothing much else. Look around, Sergeant. Look around. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, funny. This book, sir, in the bag. A dictionary. I dare say night isn't a book one. It's odd. It's a dictionary. Look a bit further, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Anything familiar about this, Miss Marsh? I, I was waiting for you to ask me, sir. It's mine. He borrowed it one night after he came in with the newspapers. Oh, newspapers? Oh, yes, sir. He was a great one for the papers, especially the Globe News. He'd been a fury if we didn't save one for him at the desk. I see. Did he do much writing up here? Well, now that you mention it, sir, it did. Lots of letters, always to the papers. Do you suppose he wrote those dear editor things? No, I doubt that, but I have a fair idea what he did write. 
Anything else, Sergeant? Not a thing, sir. Clean as a whistle. Back to the yard, sir. Back to the yard. Odd, the man said. Odd indeed. A hammer which may be a murder weapon side by side with a dictionary. A possible killer writing letters to the editor. Or were they letters to the editor? Inspector tackled the hammer first. Canvas every ironmonger and hardware dealer in Oxford. Find out which carries this make of hammer. Check their sales slips for that particular Saturday. Try to jog the salesman's memories. Find out where that hammer came from. And then the dictionary. The newspapers and the mail. Ever look into the Globe News, Sergeant? Sometimes, sir. I'm not much of a crossword puzzle fan myself. <laughs> yes, Sergeant. Our Joe Knowles, alias James Knight, is obviously a crossword puzzle addict. I think we're due for a literary detail at the Globe News, with samples of our friend's handwriting from his prison record. Hop to it, Sergeant, and keep your eyes open. It turned out to be quite a problem. 10,000 entries per week in the Globe News' puzzle contest with the average number. Not a pleasant prospect. Not at all. Stolidly, the crew from the yard started to go through 10,000 puzzles, checking against the photostatic copies of James Knight's handwriting. The second morning of the John. Inspector Graham here. Sergeant Marshall, sir, at the newspaper. You found something, Sergeant? Not in the file, sir. In the morning mail. From Brighton. An entry in the latest contest. Address, 912 Leader Street. Name of John Kinder. But there's no mistaking the handwriting. They'll do it every time, won't they? Joe Knowles, James Knight, now John Kinder. Yes, sir, I noticed. Always the same initials on the aliases. J.K. this time. Bring the puzzle and the envelope. I'll have him picked up in Brighton. Uh, 912 Leader Street, you said? 912 Leader Street, Brighton, England. The order moved swiftly now on the teletype, along the wires and the banks of the Thames, across the North Downs, the South Downs, to the famous resort city on the English Channel. Quick now, police. No need for all the melodrama, sir. You were looking for me? You're James Knight, also known as Joe Knowles and John Kinder. You ought to know, officer. You're wanted, Knight. You'll have to come along. I have to warn you, anything you say may be taken down and used in evidence against you. You did a good job, Sultan, picking him up so quickly. He came along with surprising quietness, sir. The fellow probably knows we've little to build a case on. Hello, what's this? It looks like a hole in the floor, Sergeant. I know, sir. But there's four more in the floor, sir. Square holes. Now, the floor is the ceiling of the room below. Oh? Who lives below, Sultan? The landlady. Eccentric soul. We warned her several times. She will keep her rent money in a jar on the mantelpiece. So that's why he watched her. That's your theory, Sergeant? Well, you can see every corner of that room, sir, through these holes. And they're recent. Well, the wood's still fresh and white, Inspector. Square holes. Why? When you dig a hole with a chisel, Sultan, you not only get a square hole, you also can keep the shavings from falling in the room below. A chisel? Where would he have ditched it? Possibly through the window when you knocked. A chisel, Selden, is sharp enough to cut other things beside wood. A carotid artery, for instance. So you prepared a statement, Knight? Yes, Inspector. I've been informed of the charge you may lodge against me. I'm told it entails a murder in Oxford on the Saturday of the bank holiday. That's correct. You'll find my movements for that day accounted for in my statement. It may be troublesome locating some of my witnesses, but uh, I doubt if you all have much difficulty. You were in that street in Oxford, though. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed. Trying to make an honest living, sir. No doubt. Strange you failed to leave a card at Mrs. Golden's. I rang several times on my way up and down the street. No answer. And you didn't push it under the door? No. Cards are expensive, Inspector. I prefer to explain my business first and leave a card if there's any interest. You're, um, having this taken down, aren't you, Inspector? You got all this, Sergeant? Oh, yes, sir. Then we'll enter Knight's statement in the record also. Yes, sir. I, uh, see no reason for holding me any longer. Do you, Inspector? You'll be quite comfortable. No rent to pay, Knight. Just until we check your alibi and find your witnesses. After that, Knight, well, we'll see. All right, Sergeant. 
Take this man back. The end of a trail. The suspect perfectly at ease, willing, even slightly over-willing. But they held him anyway. There were still some loose ends to tie up. One of those ends might be the key to the puzzle. One of those ends just might be the end of a hangman's noose. We've got a report on the hammer, Inspector. At last, eh? Where? How? An ironmonger in Oxford sold a hammer from his stock. Ah, uh, here's a sample. <coughs> uh, to a fellow answering Knight's description on bank holiday Saturday, sir. The sales slip is dated and the salesman is prepared to identify. The slip also includes a chisel. I see. Seems identical to the one we've had. What's this label? Uh, the salesman says it's all on this type. High-class steel forging. Nothing in ours, is there? Oh, no, sir. Let's have a look in that valise we found the hammer in Adele's. Bro. Yes, sir. An empty traveling bag. Just lint. A few tiny crumbs of something. They might have been dried dough or... Even breadcrumbs, Inspector. Or paper, Sergeant. Would you pass me the sponge there? The one for sealing envelopes? I think there's enough water in the dish. Gently now, Inspector. Moisten the tiny pellets of dough-like substance on the glass top of your desk. Gently now. Roll them back and forth. Loosen them. Spread them out on the desktop. Slowly. Gently. Patiently. And then... We'd better have this photograph, Sergeant. I doubt if we can preserve them for the trial. Yes, sir. We've broken his alibi. Knight was in Oxford that day. He bought the hammer. High-class steel forging. He should have burnt this label, Sergeant. Not merely crumbled it in this way. I do believe our careful Mr. Knight, our clever cooperative Mr. Knight, is going to be hung, and very shortly at that. Well, today, that hammer, complete with its proper label, can be seen in the Black Museum. Inspector Graham was right. The hammer, plus the label, did hang James Knight. His alibi was broken by the salesman in the hardware store in Oxford who sold Jim Knight that hammer on the Saturday Mrs. Golden died. Inspector Graham needn't have worried about his case, no need you worry about the hammer in your kitchen drawer. If there is any moral to this story beyond the inevitable lesson that criminals are nearly always caught, it's this. Be careful whom you let in your house when you're alone to demonstrate a new gadget or even to fix your furniture. Your visitor might mean death. And now until we meet next time in the same place for another story about the Black Museum, I remain as always obediently yours. This is Orson Welles speaking from London. Black Museum. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide. A museum of everyday objects. Cigarette boxes, appointment books, a hat rack. All are touched by murder. <laughs> Here's a brick bat. <coughs> Coarse grained, rough edged, familiar. Perhaps your own home is built of bricks exactly like this one. In this case, however, no home was built by such a brick. Rather, a home was destroyed by it. Destroyed forever. It's still such a normal looking object, Inspector. Is it really? With that broken corner? With the stains still on its edges? I suppose you're right, sir. If there's one thing that can upset normalcy, it's spilt blood. And today, that blood-stained brick pad can be seen. Here in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Well, here we are in the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. 
Yes, here lies death. Upon these tables within these cabinets, the files of death, labeled with day and date and name of victim. Here's a hat rack. Odd to find such a commonplace object here, perhaps, but observe. Here were the wood curves from base to shaft, three brownish stains. Blood dripped here from a weapon concealed within the lining of an overcoat. Three stains which placed a murderer at the scene of crime. Broken alibi. That's another story. Here's our brick bat. Of such bricks are garden walls built. Later the ivy or some such creeping vine grows over them, hiding the sharp edges, softening the four square contours. This brick, too, was meant for such bucolic purposes. But as it happened, things didn't work out that way. We might say it all began when young Anne Friskin composed an advertisement and told her much older husband, James, about it. So you're placing an advertisement. Wanted, boy, about 18. References, handyman work. Some such thing? Exactly, dear. Oh, very good. Only don't let him get too close to Alma. It might not be good for her. A simple domestic scene. Wife cooperating with husband, or the other way around, if you prefer. Some small mention of the husband's cousin who stays with them. That's all. The advertisement appears in the usual help-wanted columns. Several young men apply. One is Dick Terry. Yes, ma'am, I've had some experience during the summer at my uncle's place in Dorset. And the money's all right? Oh, quite generous, ma'am. What with the room over the garage and all. <laughs> well, your references seem quite good. And a good school report, too. <laughs> settled into his job and worked out well. The gravel driveway was soon in good condition. The lawns were well mowed. The bricks were ordered for the repair job on the garden wall. Yes, the bricks were ordered. And in the household, all was well and quite normal. One more hand, ladies. If you wish, Dame. Aren't you satisfied with beating us again, dear? I, I suppose I should be. But it must be somewhat dull for you, Anne, dear, night after night with just Alma and me. In the household, as we've said, all was well and quite normal. Undercurrents? If you look for them, perhaps otherwise, a retired well-to-do gentleman in a suburban London home, living quite happily with his lovely young wife and his cousin Alma. Still, one never knows, does one? Good morning, Dick. Oh, well, uh... oh, the work is coming well, isn't it? Yes. Lovely day, isn't it? Nothing quite like the springs we get here, is there? Awfully quiet there. Uh... Yeah. Yes, I suppose it is. For someone your age. Uh, begging your pardon, Mum, it don't seem to me like you'd be giving up just yet. Oh, thank you, Dick. It's nice of you to say so. Um... Aren't you getting those bricks a trifle uneven, Dick? Oh, that's on purpose, Mum. It's a trick I learned from my uncle. It gives the creepers and vines and such a better hold. It's better. You do know your work, don't you? I hope so, Mum. A person likes to do his work where he's appreciated. Well, you are. No fear about that. And just to prove it, come up to the house later and we'll see about finding you a nice cold drink. On a warm day like this, a cold drink will... No, oh, after all, it's quite natural, isn't it? You'd do as much for your help, wouldn't you? No one would think anything of it. No one did in the Friskin household either until these trips for the long, cool drinks became somewhat habitual, at which point Alma spoke to Anne. Do you really think you're doing the proper thing, Anne? Of course, it's none of my business, I suppose, but... What are I... you driving at? That boy. He's an excellent worker. People will talk. About what, pray? Oh, nothing. But people will talk about nothing, you know. And if James should hear from the wrong person... Now please be explicit, Alma. I don't happen to have a devious mind. Oh, it's quite simple. James is past middle age. You're young, vital. The boy is undeniably attractive with that flaming hair and all. And he is up here at the house quite a good deal. And you're suggesting... No, of course not. I am merely pointing out to you how it can look to the neighbors. Frankly, I don't care. Please don't bring the subject up again, Alma. I refuse to discuss it with you. Alma 
did not bring up the subject again, not with Anne. However, she waited for an opportunity, and then... Jane. Yes, Ella? I... I want to talk to you. Aren't we rather formal today? Closed doors and all that sort of thing? I'm not speaking behind anyone's back. I've already taken this up with Anne. Oh? What's the trouble? It's that boy, Dick Terry. Dick? Alma, don't tell me he's been making advances. That's not funny, James. Oh, sorry. What then? Anne is letting him spend too much time at the house. His place is in the garden and the garage. People will talk. Aren't you doing a bit of talking yourself, Alma? I'm doing my duty as I see it. Then you've mistaken your duty. I'm fully capable of protecting my honor, as you doubtless would call it. And I'll thank you, Alma, not to bring this up again. Although, doubtless, you have the best intentions in the world. Very well, James. But if anything does occur, you'll thank me for warning you. Anyway. Yes, Alma awaited her opportunity and spoke to James. That worthy and decent gentleman dismissed the incident from his mind. That should have been the end of it. Unfortunately, however, the whole matter was reopened. And in quite a different quarter... Good morning, Dick. Morning, Mum. Oh, the hedge does look nice. Thank you, Mum. Is anything wrong, Dick? Matter of fact, I'm giving notice. Why, Dick? But why? I'm giving notice. But what's wrong? Have I done something? Or is it about your money? Because if so, I'll speak to Mr. Friskin at once. Don't bother, Mum. I'm leaving. Call it wanderlust. Call it anything you like. Dick. Dick, look at me. Oh, do stop clipping that hedge and look at me. Yes, ma'am? I insist on knowing what's wrong. I thought you were happy here. I know I've been happy to have you here. I'd rather not... All right, ma'am, but... You asked for it. I asked for what? It's you, ma'am. I'm crazy seeing you day in and day out and having you nice to me. Just nice to me and thinking of you with him and... Me not having the ghost of a chance... I can't stand it, Mum, that's all. You'll have to let me go. Poor Dick. You've held this inside you all this time. Yes. Oh, Dick, I'm so sorry. So terribly sorry. Come here. Fire in the garden, flash fire in dry grass on a warm summer morning, perhaps in any case. The boy stayed on his job and nothing further was said in the household. Everything was routine quite normal. Even the bridge games in the evening, three-handed bridge, of course. July moved on into August. Hot, muggy August nights. Well, I wake up to bed. Coming in? Uh, oh, uh, not just yet, dear. I think I'll read a while. It may be cooler in the library. Good night, dear. Good night, dear. Good night, Alma. Good night. A hot, muggy August night dark. No moon. Barely a breath of air. James tossed restlessly. Sleeplessly. Anne? That you, Anne? Coming to bed, dear? No! No! Go! Go! Well, today, that brick bat can be seen here in the Black Museum. It was Anne's screams which brought Alma and then some of the neighbors. James was not dead, but nearly so. The doctor, Dr. Kinder was his name, examined his patient and proceeded quite efficiently via the telephone. That's right. The ambulance at once with oxygen equipment. I want the operating theater ready, anesthetist, nurses, and my assistant. Friskin has a badly fractured skull, and with his heart condition, he has about one chance in a hundred to live. Hurry. I'll wait for the ambulance. Oh, no. Now, the police. Police? Well, really, no. ladies, a man is attacked, half murdered in his bed with a heavy instrument of some kind, and you question my calling the police. Oh, if only I'd gone upstairs with him. If only I'd gone upstairs. If you had. Operator, ring through to the police, please. Hurry. Oh, to walk in like that, to find him there, the blood. 
Oh, his poor head. His breathing, that awful gust. This is Dr. Kinder. Let me speak to the superintendent, please. Dick. Where's Dick? Yes. Where's Dick? No one had missed the boy until Anne thought of him. With all the excitement, all the horror, no one had realized he was missing. Dr. Kinder finished talking to the superintendent of police and turned back to the two women. Dick. The superintendent is sending an inspector, Ralph. Very good man, he says. C.I.D. C.I.D.? Criminal Investigation Division. Oh. Did I hear you mention someone named Dick? <laughs> yes, Dick Terry. He's the, uh, the hired man. Well, more of a boy than a man. He has a room over the garage. And he isn't in the house? He hasn't been here? No. The neighbors came, but not Dick. Oh, per perhaps I'd better fetch him. No, uh, stay here. The police will find him. The police will find him. They did find him, but in his room over the garage. Where was he, Sergeant? In the attic, Inspector, hiding in a corner. Uh, all right, son, speak up. Why? I, I, I got scared. That's it, scared. What of? I heard Anne, uh, Mrs. Friskin, screaming, and I ran over from the garage, and when I got up to the room where the lights were on, Miss Galpin was carrying on, and Mrs. Friskin was just standing there screaming, and he, he was on the bed, and I... I just ran. You didn't offer to help. Why not? I, I, I couldn't think. Nothing. Why? I, I, I guess I didn't want to be blamed for doing it. Well, who would blame you? Oh, somebody. Anybody. Did you do it? No. I never touched him. Never. All right, Sergeant. Hold him in the kitchen. All right, sir. I'll talk to the Galpin woman now. What is she, a companion or something? Cousin of the victim, sir. Lives here. Uh, all right, send her in. Alma Galpin knew nothing except the discovery of her cousin in the bedroom. But the inspector was curious. The hired boy says he was scared. Have you any idea why? Well, he's been making sheep's eyes at my cousin's wife. Oh? People were talking. He's a good-looking boy. She's so much younger than poor James. You know how an ignorant mind works sometimes? The inspector knew. Also, he was a considerate man. He implied as much to Anne Friskin. I know you've had a terrible shock tonight, Mrs. Friskin, but I have to ask you a few questions. Of course, Inspector. I'll try to answer. Did your husband have any enemies? Anyone who might want him out of the way? Oh, no. No one. Everyone like James. Even the boy, Dick Terry? Dick? Oh, oh no. No, you don't think that Dick... I don't know yet. But we'll have to hold him, Mrs. Friskin. He seems to have something of a motive. At least, there seems to have been some talk. They held Dick Terry on an open charge pending developments at the hospital. There, James Friskin hung on the fringe of death, barely breathing, completely unconscious. At the house, Alma faced Anne. The police. What do they know? I don't understand. They're holding the boy. They're not even looking for the weapon. And meanwhile, whoever did it could be miles away. Then you don't think Dick did it? It's too pat. Of course not. Why would he? Even, even... You never gave him any encouragement, did you, Alma? Alma. Did you? You're hysterical. I know exactly what I'm saying. And I don't believe that boy raised a finger against James. Then, then why did he hide? Wouldn't you, in his position? The police, arrest, the most obvious person. That's all they know. Someone ought to teach them their business, obviously. They don't... Well, there are those who would like to teach the police their business. Quite a few people would. Alma Galpin set out to try. And it was with that idea in mind that she appeared in Inspector Ralph's office at the local station house. Well, Miss Galpin, uh, sit down, won't you? Thank you. What can I do for you? How far have you got in this case, Inspector? We're still holding the boy. The only charge at the moment is assault. If your cousin dies, well, that'll be another matter. Uh, then you've done nothing. For the moment. I see. I brought you this. No. Uh, why don't you open it? As you wish. Yes, I see. A brick bat with stains on it. Don't you want to have it checked for fingerprints? Rough surfaces like this don't hold prints. Why? It's the weapon. Oh? How do you know? I found it. It was in the little pile of leftover bricks at the foot of the garden. 
James. James was going to ask the boy to build a barbecue pit with them. I see. Well, how do you know so surely this is the weapon? That's blood on it, isn't it? it? Might be. Aren't you going to have it tested? Probably. Miss Galpin, do you realize that this brick might be the piece of evidence to hang that boy? It might be. It might hang someone else, too. Is this a charge, Miss Galpin? Who stands to gain most? Who would have her freedom? Who would get James' money? Have you thought of that, Inspector? Who wanted the brick wall repaired? Who spent altogether too much time in the garden? Have you given any thought to these questions, Inspector? Perhaps the Inspector had. Others had, that was certain. And suddenly, with one sentence... Dr. Kinder changed the entire complexion of the case. I'm sorry to have to tell you, Mrs. Friskin, but your husband passed away about ten minutes ago without ever regaining consciousness. Now it was murder. And Anne Friskin, the young widow, came to the station house to see Dick Terry in his cell. Here, ma'am. You have ten minutes. Yes. Thank you. I'll be back in ten minutes. Oh, Dick. Oh, Dick. I didn't do it, here. I'm stuck for it, but I didn't do it. Oh, Dick, you don't think for one minute I believe you did do it. How should I know what you believe? Well, you know me better than that. I want to help you. I know you better. Do I? Do I know any more about you than you know about me? Oh, Dick, don't talk like that. Please, please let me help you. With what? A axe or blade? I'll get you a lawyer. I have money now. I'll take care of you. Sure, me. sure. You've got money now. You've got it all now. And I've got a murder charge. Anything you may say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence against you. After what you told me in the garden. Oh, forget it. Maybe that never happened. Maybe I was really crazy. Maybe you figured more than I meant. Well, what's the difference? He's dead and you've got everything. You you keep saying that. I've got everything. Well, haven't you? Isn't it what you wanted? Oh. You think... You think I did it? Oh, do I? All I know is I didn't, but I'm stuck in this rotten jail. I won't peach on you if that's what you're worried about. Not unless my own neck can't be saved any other way. Oh, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I... Not a very pleasant scene. Not a very pleasant circumstance. The young woman, the boy, the sadly tender phrases of a summer morning shattered between them. However, in the offices and the floor above Dick Terry's cell, Inspector Ralph and Sergeant Hopkins were more interested in facts than in phrases. So pathology reports it's Friskin's blood type on that brick. It's the weapon, all right. But who used it? The boy had a crush on the wife. Badly enough to kill for her? Oh, I doubt it. There aren't any alibis, sir. That's the trouble. He says he went to bed as usual. No one saw him anywhere that night. The Galpin woman says she went to bed. The widow says she read for a while, went upstairs and found her husband. Could, could all three of them have been in it together, sir? How do you figure that, Sergeant? Well, Mrs. Friskin could have promised Galpin money, and Mrs. Friskin would have had the boy. They might have planned to have the boy actually do it. Come in. I'm... I'm sorry, Inspector. Not at all, Mrs. Friskin. Come in. Sit down. I believe you know Sergeant Hopkins. Yes. I, uh, I have very little to say. It, uh, it might be easier standing. As you wish, ma'am. I, uh, I just saw Dick downstairs. Too bad about him. He seemed a nice lad. Yes, sir. Inspector, this... This is not the easiest thing for a woman. I understand. You have an alibi for the boy. And yourself. Uh, yes. Yes, I do. Inspector was an understanding gentleman. He offered no comment. He merely recorded a fact 
and let Anne Friskin leave his office with her own thoughts for company. Later that same day, he arrived with Sergeant Hopkins in tow at the Friskin house. Ladies, we've done some further checking and investigation. We thought we'd apprise you of the situation. I see. Thank you for that, at least. We're letting the boy go. He's in the clear. I knew that all along. I told you so. Yes, you did. I remember the day you brought me the brickbat. Um, where did you find it? In the pile at the foot of the garden. I see that you know, Mrs. Friskin. There is no pile of bricks at the garden. It happens to be in the rear yard, near the back door, close to the foot of the back stairs. The stairs which reach the second floor quite close to the door of your room, Miss Galkin. Now, Sergeant, if you'll stay quite close to Miss Galkin and take down what she has to say. Taken down and may be used as evidence. Yes, the usual warning. Well, Miss Galkin? Why did you kill your cousin, Miss Galkin? She had everything. Even the boy with his sheep's eyes. I had nothing. I thought if I got rid of James, who was too dull to care, she'd be blamed. After her, I'm next of kin. I'd have everything. I saw the little pile of bricks. I meant to put them in the garden later. A brick is heavy. It hits hard! <laughs> Today, the brick pad can be seen here in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. They put Alma Galpin safely away, where she could harm neither others nor herself. Dick Terry left that pleasant suburb of London and dropped into the anonymity one can find only in a great city. Anne Friskin sold the house and went far from London to start over, perhaps, but to carry with her always the memory of tragedy on a hot, muggy night, and the memory of a mistake made through loneliness and mistaken kindness. Now, until we meet next time, in the same place, for another story about the Black Museum, I remain, as always, obediently yours. structure on the Thames which houses Scotland Yard is a warehouse of souvenirs where everyday objects, a candlestick, a china doll, a broom, all are touched by murder. Now take this button, this brass button, the symbol of a barracks parade ground, but this was not found on any parade ground. This is interesting, sir. A brass button. Very interesting, Sergeant. It's from an army uniform. Today, that button can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear the Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Well, here we are, the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Shelf upon shelf of curious and repellent objects, the urge to kill illustrated in many, many ways. Here lies death. Here in the echoing stillnesses of the long room, one stands and looks at violence, expressed by the exhibits that line the shelves, the tables, and the walls. Repellent they may be, but by reason of their association only, for most of these tokens of murder are very ordinary objects. It's a medicine bottle. The drug it contained was beneficial in small doses. But since a woman was forced to drink the whole contents and died shortly after, 
The jury called it murder. Here's a kitchen knife. No household is without one, but this knife was not used solely for kitchen tasks. It was found embedded in a man's heart. Ah, here we are, the brass button. It is, it's an innocuous, ordinary brass button. This was found near the dead body of a woman. But come back with me to the beginning of this story, to a day some years ago on the common outside the Kentish village of Wayfield. A girl was sitting beneath a tree, busily sketching. She was too engrossed to hear the approach of a young soldier until he spoke. Hello? Oh. Hello? Sorry. Did I frighten you? A little. I didn't hear you coming. Oh, I made enough row. You were so busy with whatever you're doing. What are you doing? Sketching. Can I see? You'll probably laugh. No, I won't. Show me. Hmm. That's very good. Do you really think so? Well, it's fine. You must be the one they call the Swamp Girl. That's what they call me in the village. Huh. Poor, routine, dull people. You don't like routine ways of living, do you? From what I've heard, you're something of a rebel. Am I? Hmm. You seem to know a lot about me. Oh, I've heard things. What kind of things? About how you live in an old shanty at the edge of the swamp and how you roam the common and sketch and paint. You're well informed. People talk about you sometimes. I was interested. Then so you came down to see for yourself. Oh, what's the matter? Couldn't you find a girl in town? Don't or... say that. I wanted to meet you. To talk to you. And now that you have, will you please go away and let me work? Oh, you can work any time. I'll go away soon. If you're nice to me. Go now. I've no intention of being nice to you, whatever you may think. Come on. You get away. When you found out so much about me, you might have also found out that I'm not interested in men. Least of all, soldiers. That's not very kind. Come here. No. Go away. Come, Come here. here. No. no. No, please. Please don't hurt me. No, please. No. A woman screamed and cried for help on the Wayfield Common. But there was no one within a mile to hear her screams. Two days later in the post office at Wayfield, a letter was returned by the postmistress. Mrs. Riley? Yes, Jimmy? Uh, that registered letter you sent me out with, there, uh, there was nobody about to sign for it. There wasn't the swamp girl at home. No, ma'am. I called out Miss Morgan, but there wasn't any answer. All right. You can deliver it tomorrow. Yes, ma'am. Her name was Jeanette Morgan. But people of the town called her the Swamp Girl because of her vagrant, strange way of living. The next day, Jimmy, the postal messenger, rode out on his bike to deliver the registered letter. But once again, the Swamp Girl was not at home. Then, on the way back, taking a shortcut, Jimmy found her. Miss Morgan! Jimmy saw only her legs at first protruding from a bush which had been meant to hide her. At first he thought she was asleep. But he didn't think so for long. She... she... she's dead! Oh, 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 I've got to get the police! Murder transforms a little village like Wayfield. All work ceases. The people gather in small groups in the streets to talk about it. Yes. Yeah. Have you heard the news? There's been a murder. Hey, eh? A murder? Yes. Out on the common. Who? Oh. The swamp girl. They found her body. I was rather afraid that poor girl would come to grief sooner or later. Well, Vicar, you know how it is these days. No parental authority. Ah, more the pity. Be that as it may, the man who did it must be found. You know, Bert, if young Jimmy Miles hadn't come upon that body like he did, it might have lain there hidden for months. 
Even years. Oh. I wonder how it happened. Well, now, the way I see it is this. Now in the bar of the local, they sipped their beer and discussed the sensation. Jimmy became something of a hero. He'd found the body and even now is being questioned by the London detectives from Scotland Yard. Uh, this is uh, Jimmy Miles, sir. Hello, Jimmy. You found the body, I understand. Uh, uh, yes, Inspector Gallico. Uh, was she really murdered, sir? Well, that's what we must find out. And you can help us. Oh, really? How? I believe you rode out to her shanty at the edge of the swamp to deliver a registered letter to Miss Morgan. Yes, that's right, sir. Uh, she used to get a registered letter every month. I always took them out. And she had to sign for them, of course. Oh, yes. Then you've got to know her, I suppose. Well, don't tell the postmistress, but sometimes I did stay and talk for a while. Uh-huh. And what was she like? Oh, she, she was nice, uh, really friendly. People said she was a bit peculiar, but I never thought so. And she could draw, sir. Now, think carefully, Jimmy. Did you ever see her with anyone, man or woman? Oh, never, Inspector. She had no friends around here. She once told me so. Mm, no friends, I see. Now, about this registered letter. Was that the first time you had taken it out? Oh, no, sir. I went out the previous day, uh, on Monday. But she wasn't there. Did you call out? Yes, and I, I went round the common, to the places where she used to go and sketch. I knew most of them. And she wasn't anywhere about? Oh, no, nowhere at all. What time of the day was this? Well, I, I just left the post office just on ten. It's about half an hour's ride. Oh, you were out there by ten-thirty. Hmm. All right, Jimmy. Thank you very much. Uh, is that all, Inspector Gallico? Well, that's all for the moment. You've been very helpful. A lucky witness, young Jimmy Miles. A break for Inspector Gallico early in the case. For with the evidence of the police surgeon, certain facts could be established. What's your verdict on the post-mortem, Doctor? Well, the cause of death didn't give us any trouble, Inspector. She was strangled. What about the time of death? Hmm, that's not so easy. I'd say she died 48 hours ago, at least. Wait a minute. That means before noon on Monday. It ties in, Doctor. Good. But at what time before noon, I would not care to predict. The contents of the stomach indicate she'd had breakfast. Then sometime between breakfast and noon, she met her death. And she was nowhere about 10.30 when the postal boy brought her her letter. What about that letter, Sergeant? Uh, uh, I have it here, sir. Who is it from? It's from uh, Mrs. Morgan of Tunbridge Wells, her mother. Money, I suppose. Uh, Ten pounds, sir. And a plea to come home and live a normal life. Poor Mrs. Morgan. Her daughter couldn't even die a normal death. The pattern of the crime begins to make itself clear. The victim's identity is known. The approximate time and the cause of death is known. Now the hunt will begin for the killer. Here is a police message. The body of a woman named Jeanette Morgan has been discovered on Wayfield Common. Evidence suggests that she met her death by strangulation sometime before noon on October the 19th. Any person who was in the vicinity of Wayfield Common on that day or can give any information, should communicate with the nearest police station in order to assist in the search for the murderer. And in this, the police will be aided by a brass button. That same brass button that today can be found in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with the Black Museum starring Orson Welles. small cottage in Tunbridge Wells now go the detectives from Scotland Yard to a house with the blinds drawn where a thin, bitter woman answers their questions in a strangely lifeless voice. Yes, I knew. I knew it was Jeanette when I saw the newspapers. Why didn't you get in touch with us, Mom? Oh, I knew you'd get in touch with me if you wanted me. Besides, what business is it of mine? But she was your daughter. Was she? Jeanette's younger sister lives here with me. Works at a shop nearby. She's my daughter. Yes, I see what you mean. I warned her. I told her it had come to no good end, living that strange and unnatural kind of way. Mrs. Morgan, we won't trouble you any longer, but could you tell us, did your daughter have any close men friends? Men friends? Yes. Jeanette? 
I wish she had. But a boyfriend would have been too ordinary for her. She had to be different. She had to be the swamp girl. I'm sorry. Why did it have to happen to her? To me? Why? 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 Good evening. Uh, good evening, Vicar. I'm from the police. The police? I don't recognize you. Uh, no, sir. Uh, you see, I'm not from the local police. Uh, I'm from London. And I'm down here in connection uh, with the murder. Oh, yes. Terrible, yes. But uh, how can I help you? Well, you can help a good deal, sir. You see, the local police are pretty short-handed, and Inspector Gallagher has decided that our next move should be to make a very thorough search of the common, uh, particularly round about where the body was found. Oh, I, I see. And I suppose you want some help from my parishioners? Yes, sir, that's uh, roughly the idea. Ah, very well, then. We'll help you in every way we can. You can depend upon us. All right, Sergeant. <coughs> Let's get on with the search. Very good, sir. You yes. take Smart and work in from the road. All right, I'll sir. take Rogers and work in from the field side. I'll meet you by the ditch. Yes, that'll be all right, sir. Uh, here's a, here's a, a sketch, sir. It's a pencil drawing of, the, of that view across there, I'd say, sir. Yes, it is. Unfinished, too. She might have been working on it. What else have you got there? Uh, this is interesting, sir. It's a brass button. Very interesting, Sergeant. It's from an army uniform. Uh-huh. Where's the nearest camp to Wayfield? I believe there's one across the river, sir, about uh, two miles away. Inspector Gallico left his sergeant in charge of searching the common and went to the army camp to enlist the help and cooperation of the commanding officer. Gentlemen, to see you, sir, from Scotland Yard. Oh, uh, ask him to come in, will you, Captain? Yes, sir. Uh, will you come through, please? Thank you. Major Curtis. I'm Inspector Gallico from Scotland Yard. Oh, how do you do, Inspector? Sit down, won't you? Well, now, how can I help you, Inspector? I'm here to investigate the murder of uh, Jeanette Morgan. Oh, the swamp girl mystery. Yes. Yes, tragic business. Major, not far from where the body was left, we found this. An army button. That's why I'm here. I see. Well, I'd be glad to assist in any way I can, but... Uh, Permit me to hope that it wasn't any one of my men. How many men are there in camp here, Major? Well, at the present time, our unit's strength is 120. We're an engineer section, as you may know. 120 men, huh? Mm -hmm. I wonder if any of them has a button missing from his tunic. Well, if you wish, I'll order an immediate inspection. Not yet, sir. You can assist me in another way first. Oh? How, Inspector? Well, I want a list of all those absent from camp on Monday morning. Oh, that should be easy. There's no leave on any week morning. If anyone was away from camp, it must have been for a special reason. Anyone at all, between the hours of seven in the morning and one o'clock. Well, the adjutant can help us now. I'll get him to make out a list of all those away from camp on Monday morning immediately. The commanding officer was away a short time, and on his return, he brought with him a piece of paper containing a list of names. He gave it to the London detective. Yes, there you are, Inspector. Five men were away from camp during the time you asked about. Mm. Sergeant Willis. Hey, company. Yes, he's our caterer at the present time. We're understaffed, of course. Sergeant Willis and Private Fields were in town with a provision truck. They were together? Yes, we could always check that with one or the other. I don't think I'm very interested in those two. Oh? What about Private Liston, B Company? Oh, he's the unit driver. I, uh, I sent him into town shortly before noon. <clears throat> uh, private errand. Shortly before noon, hmm? <clears throat> Well, that leaves two. Corporal Paul Ferris? Oh, he's our mailman. He leaves every morning at eight o'clock and drives the mail truck in to pick up the unit mail bag. From the Wayfield Post Office, I suppose? Yes. What time does he generally return? Oh, sometimes by nine. Though on occasions he has to wait for registered mail, you know. I've even known him to be held up as late as for eleven or, or even eleven-thirty. Would anyone know what time he returned on Monday? I'll find that out for you. Now, this last man, Private Williams, A Company. 
Yes, if you ask me, he might be your man, Inspector. Oh, why, sir? Because he was absent without leave. From 900 hours on Monday morning until 1,400 hours. From nine till two. Yes. Mm, that's interesting. I'd better see him. And the personal taffy. I'll have them paraded. Corporal Ferris? Private Williams? This is Inspector Gallico from Scotland Yard. He has some questions to ask you both. Thank you, sir. Corporal Ferris, we'll take you first. Yes, Inspector. What time did you leave camp last Monday morning on your mail run? At 800 hours, sir. And what time did you return? Well, I, uh, if I remember correctly, the mail was brought round rather late that morning, Corporal. Yes, sir. I was just about to explain to the inspector. I had to wait for several registered letters. What time did you actually return? Uh, shortly before 1100 hours, sir. Thank you, Corporal. Now, Private Williams. Um, you were absent without leave throughout Monday morning. Yes, sir. Are you able to give a satisfactory account of your whereabouts? I'd uh, prefer not to, sir. Private Williams has consistently refused any explanation of his conduct, Inspector. Oh, that's rather unwise, Williams. If you have an alibi, you'll need it. This is an investigation into murder. Murder? I didn't do no murder. I was with me girl in Wakefield. Ah. What's her name? Hey, Susie Walker, Nine High Street. You asked her if I wasn't there. Oh, I didn't want to get her into any trouble, you understand, that's all. But murder? Oh, I don't know nothing about the girl who was killed. Honest, I don't. Well, we'll check your statement, Williams. I've finished with them now, sir. Corporal Ferris? Private Williams? Dismiss. Inspector Gallico drove into Wayfield to number nine High Street. Oh, no. Susie wasn't out with him that day. I remember it distinctly. She went over to see her girlfriend at Kenbury. Well, you can ask her yourself. Susie Walker was a small, frightened girl, the counterpart of Private Williams. Oh, Inspector, I hope he hasn't done anything wrong up at the camp in not telling them where he was. Oh, that'd be terrible. He wouldn't tell a lie, I know that. I'm sure of it. You see, we'd had a quarrel, and he wanted to see me. I didn't dare let Mother know, so I made up a story about it. She confirmed his alibi, and Gallico went next to the post office to interview Mrs. Riley. Just one inquiry I'd like to make, Mrs. Riley. Oh, anything at all, Inspector. Anything. To think of that poor girl. And my Jimmy Myers finding a body. Mrs. Riley, uh, can you recall offhand whether you had any registered mail for the army unit on Monday? Mm, registered mail on Monday. Well, I couldn't remember offhand, Inspector, but I'll have it here in the book. Wait a minute and I'll look it up. No. No, there was nothing on Monday. There hasn't been a registered letter for the army since last week. And the postal corporal wouldn't have been delayed on Monday morning. Oh, not him. He was in for his mailbag and out again quick as you like. Didn't even stop for a chat. I remember that now. What time would he have left here, Mrs. Riley? Can you give me any idea? I can give it to you right on the dot. It's come back to me quite plainly. We open at 8.30. Corporal Ferris was here waiting when I arrived to open up. 8.30. And he didn't stay? No, not more than a few minutes. The inspector picked up Sergeant Worthington and together they drove back to the army camp. A few orders from the commanding officer and Corporal Ferris was paraded once more and his gear searched. At the bottom of his kit bag they found what they were looking for. Uh, here we are, sir. A battle jacket. With one button missing. And it matches, Sergeant. Uh, Ferris, what have you got to say about this? Uh, crazy, sir. I didn't know anything about it. She was sketching, wasn't she, Ferris? She drew a pencil drawing of you, isn't that so? You're bluffing. She didn't do any drawing of me. It was a landscape scene. A landscape scene, yes, so it was. And that fact has never been mentioned in any of the papers. Only the Sergeant and I knew that, Ferris. And the killer. Paul Ferris was taken into custody. Charged with the murder of Jeanette Morgan, the swamp girl. Silence! In court! 
Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have heard the facts in this case as related by the witnesses which have been called, both by the defense and the prosecution. The prisoner stands before you accused of the crime of murder, a particularly brutal murder, a murder without motive. But lack of motive is not necessarily a defense. It is for you to decide whether the facts which you have learned during this case, not only the words spoken by the witnesses, but the mute testimony of the material objects placed before you, justify your verdict, which must be beyond all reasonable doubt. The brass button and a slip of the tongue led to his downfall. Today, that brass button occupies a place of honor in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. The picture was completed when the tracks of a vehicle were found some 50 yards away from the scene of the crime. The tracks were identified as those of the mail truck of which the driver had been Corporal Paul Ferris. The defense did their utmost to prove insanity, but the jury were in little doubt that the man was sane, and that his advances repulsed he'd strangled the swamp girl to death. They took 17 minutes to find him guilty, and the brass button which had led to his arrest was Exhibit A on the courtroom table, from where at the end of the trial and the pronouncement of the inevitable death sentence, it was taken to its present resting place in the Black Museum. And now until we meet next time in the same place and I tell you another story about the Black Museum, I remain as always obediently yours. The Black Museum starring Orson Welles is presented by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Radio Attraction. The program is written by Creswick Jenkinson with music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers. This is Orson Welles speaking from London. stone structure in the Thames which houses Scotland Yard is a warehouse of souvenirs. A warehouse where everyday objects, a hammer, a suitcase, a shirt button, all are touched by murder. You take this canvas bag. This canvas bag might give us a liter. Uh, what's that writing on it, Sergeant? It's the name of a local merchant, J. Gregory, Northampton. Now, today, that canvas bag can be seen in the Black Museum. <laughs> the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Well, here we are in the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. As here lies death. All the ways and means of death. Guns, of course, abound in plenty, but there are other simpler objects, things that were never meant for murder. Now, this gold trophy, a famous sportsman, climaxed a great career by winning this. Later, it was an exhibit in his trial. It was proved he had used it to batter a man to death. Here's a knitting needle, perhaps used to knit for absent friends, for children not yet born. And it was put to more lethal use. To end a life. Ah, here we are. Here's the canvas bag. It was once a bag used to hold provisions in a Northampton grocery store. 
Later on, it became more famous, but we anticipate. Let's begin the story not with a canvas bag, but with a certain young woman who, at her home in Birmingham, was packing her suitcases. Here's another dress, Mary. Oh, thanks, Mother. And your slippers. Mm-hmm. Well, I... I think that must be all. Let's just have another look round. You don't want to forget anything. No, that's right. Oh, here you are, just as well I looked. Some stockings. Oh. Well, I... I think that's all. Yes. I'll just lock my suitcase. Mary? What, Mother? Are you sure you'll be all right? No, of course. Oh, it seems such a strange arrangement, you going all the way to London alone. But what's strange about it? Tom's working in London, saving for our passages to Canada. He can't come to fetch me. But travel all that way alone. Oh, Mary, let me come with you. No, Mother. I'm not a child. You're an almost married woman, but that doesn't mean your mother still can't worry about oh, you. Oh, Mother, really? Well, Look, I'll be perfectly all right. Tom and I are... Uh, are getting married when I reach London. A month later, we'll be on our way to Canada. And we'll lose you. It's so sad. You'll write as soon as you reach London, won't you, darling? Yes, of course I will. And don't worry. Please. I'll be all right. A girl leaving home to get married. An anxious mother. Nothing very new about that. Except that the girl never went to London. The following day, her train arrived in Northampton, where she was tenderly greeted by a charming man, some years older than herself. Hello. Hello. Here I am, Mary. Oh. My dear Mary. Oh, darling. I've been waiting here for a moment. I thought you... What, that I might have deserted you? <laughs> Hardly, my sweet. Did you have much trouble with your family? Yes, a little. Dad was anxious, and, uh -huh. and you know what Mother is. She worries terribly. <laughs> yes. You you told them the story about meeting Tom in London. Uh-huh. And they believed it. Oh, good. Oh, darling, it's wonderful to be with you. <laughs> um, come, Mary. I, I found lodgings in St. John Street. Oh, good. But listen, since you've told your parents you were meeting Tom Reynolds in London, we well, might as well continue the deception, eh? How? Well, to the landlady, you'll be Mrs. Reynolds. And I, of course, shall be Mr. Reynolds. It might be better if you called me Tom. The landlady found Mr. and Mrs. Reynolds a charming couple, so devoted, so very much in love. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Mr. Reynolds. I wrote to you about a room. Oh. Yes, Mr. Reynolds. I was expecting you today, just like you said in the letter. <laughs> and this is my wife, Mary. Uh, pleased to meet you, Mrs. Reynolds. I expect you'd like to see the room right away. Yes, I, I would. Well, if you'll just follow me, there's only one flight of stairs. Let me carry the bag, dear. It's too heavy for you. All right. Have you uh, any idea how long you'll be staying, Mr. Reynolds? Well, I can't tell you at the moment. It, it depends on circumstances, doesn't it, sweetheart? Ah. Yes, dear. Why, it's Mr. Reynolds. I didn't know it was so late. Well, my wife's asleep, Mrs. Marsh. I thought I'd just pop in to tell you that we're leaving next week. Leaving? Uh-huh. Well, isn't that rather unexpected? I was talking to Mrs. Reynolds only yesterday, and she said... Yes, she... but you see, I've had some news from friends of mine in Canada. In Canada? Yes. We're going to Canada, Mrs. Marsh. Oh? We're leaving from Liverpool next week. Oh. That will be nice for you, Mr. Reynolds, and for your sweet wife, too. Yes. Oh, but there is one other thing. Huh? I'd be very glad if you wouldn't say anything of this to my wife. You see, she's not quite sure that she really wants to go to Canada, and, well, I think it'll only upset her if anyone talks to her oh, about it. Oh, of course. I, I, I wouldn't breathe a word, particularly since you've asked me not to. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mrs. Marsh. We'll be giving up our room on Friday. Uh -huh. I'll arrange for a car to call for the luggage early in the day. So considerate, the landlady thought. Such a gentleman. On Friday morning, she said goodbye to the couple with reluctance. At least she said goodbye to Mr. Reynolds, 
who explained that his wife had gone ahead to the railway station. But even the nicest of lodgers are only a passing memory in a landlady's mind, and she might never have thought of the young couple again if it hadn't been for the events that occurred some weeks afterwards. On the high road from Rugby to Northampton, two men were walking home after work. Uh, well, Bert, uh, what do you think of Timmy's chances on Saturday? <laughs> They'll want to be better than last week, eh, Sam? Yeah, I should say so. <laughs> hey, hey, look down there in the ditch beside the road. What do you see? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, it looks like a canvas bag. Ah, well, there's something inside it. Ah, well, what's that all over it? No, I meant it. Oh, probably a dead dog. Come on, I'll buy you a pint. Yeah. Hey, 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 ain't no dead dog. Bert, look, will you? An arm. I can see it plain. Who? Oh, crikey. Come on, Sam. Huh? This is for the police. Yeah. The local police recovered the body and Scotland Yard was summoned. Inspector Courtney, accompanied by Detective Sergeant Finlay, arrived in Northampton. They met the doctor who had conducted the post-mortem. The body was that of a woman, Inspector. Have you um, any idea of her age, Doctor? Youngish. I'd say in her twenties. In height, a little over five feet. Slight build. And in uh, what state was the body? Dismembered and partially decomposed. And the uh, cause of death? Have you any idea about that? There's no way of telling, Inspector. The only thing you can take for granted is that she was murdered. The yard men had a dual task there. They had to track down the murderer, but first and foremost, they had to find out who had been murdered. They set out to examine the evidence. This canvas bag might give us a lead, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, now, what's that writing on it, Sergeant? It's the name of a local merchant, J. Gregory, Northampton. Yes, the name's clear enough, uh... Luckily, the lime didn't rot it away. As I'd say it was meant to, sir. Yes, I'd say so too, Sergeant. I think we'll call on Mr. Gregory. Was this a lucky break early in a difficult case? It seemed not. For when the London detectives interviewed J. Gregory in his Northampton warehouse, the merchant could give them little help. Yes, uh, it's my bag, all right, Inspector. No mistaking that, but how did it get in there? Well, we, uh, we thought you might be able to tell us that. Well, I assure you I can't. These canvas bags are used for transporting groceries between this warehouse and my several shops in the town. And they're, uh, what, uh, handled by your employees? Yes. Are they ever given out to the public? Oh, no, they're not. Were you aware that one was missing? Well, <laughs> well hardly, Inspector. I have upwards of a hundred of these bags and a, a lot more to do than count them. Yes, yes, of course, yes. But now, you understand the gravity of this situation. Yes. A woman has been found dead. Murdered. Murdered? Her body wrapped in one of your bags. Inspector, I, I can only assure you I know nothing whatever about it. At this stage, Mr. Gregory, not knowing the identity of the murdered woman, the bag is our only clue. Now, you do appreciate that. Yes, yes, of course. Sir, that I'd like to talk to one of your employees who might have handled these bags and who might have been in the position to take one or even give one to somebody else. Inspector, I'll see to it my staff are available Thanks. for you. As a matter of fact, you can be begin with my warehouse manager, my own brother. Oh, yes, thank you, yes. Uh, wait, I I'll get him. George? Huh? George, uh, come here, will you? Presently, the obliging Mr. Gregory returned with his brother, the warehouse manager. He, too, was courteous and polite to the detectives, and only too ready to answer the questions they asked him. Now, um, uh, where do you live, Mr. Gregory? In Birmingham. 7 High Street, Birmingham. And uh, are you married? Yes. Wife and, and two children. And you live at home? Well, sometimes I stay here at the warehouse. You know, because of the distance involved in travel, you understand? Oh, yes, perfectly, perfectly. Now... Tell me, have you ever lent or given anyone outside the firm one of these canvas bags? Well, I don't like to mention it, but... Well, uh, go on, George. Tell the inspector whatever he wants to know. Did you give away one of these bags? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I did, John. I, I know it was against regulations, but 
Well, a tramp came in one day asking for some scraps of food. And yes, and... Well, uh, I felt sorry for him, you know. It is. Yes, quite, quite. I gave him a couple of tins and well, a canvas bag to carry them in. Sorry, John, but that was the only occasion I have given one away. Now, could you tell me how long ago would this have been? Oh, well, I suppose about six weeks, perhaps a bit longer. I'm afraid I can't remember the exact date. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Gregor. I... I I don't suppose you can help us in this matter of the murdered woman. I mean, you've no idea who it might be. Well, I, none whatsoever, Inspector. I'm sorry. Well, thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. Good day to you. Good day. The inspector left the warehouse deeply disappointed. It seems that the trail led nowhere. For the inspector believed this story of the tramp that George Gregory had told him. There's no reason why he should not have believed it. But today... Evidence that proved the lie can be seen in the Black Museum. There are hundreds of women reported missing every year throughout England. Now to the local police stations throughout the land, the messages went out in a long and slow search to find the identity of the murdered woman. Desire information on any woman reported missing within past two months. Special attention to young woman about five feet in height of slight build, well dressed. In answer to your inquiry, we've checked all missing persons approximating to the description given in the Glasgow area during the last two months. There are three missing persons whose descriptions might fit the one given, and further investigation is being made in each case. I shall report further within the next seven days. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, this is Scotland Yard. Uh, we've been looking into your inquiry, and we find that in the London area there are 27 cases of missing persons. Uh, that would seem to justify investigation in relation to your inquiry. Uh, from preliminary inquiries, 13 of these cases can already be discounted. On the remainder, uh, further inquiries are still being made... Uh, we'll be in touch with you later, sir. Goodbye. The reports came flooding into Scotland Yard. The leads faithfully followed. Dead ends, all of them. The investigation into murder was bogged down because nobody knew who had been murdered. Here's another one, Inspector. People by the name of Wilson in Birmingham. Worried about their daughter. Oh, I never knew there were so many youngsters who run away from home. Well, still, have it checked, Sergeant. Right, sir. Another patient inquiry begins. When did your daughter leave home? Where was she going? Have you heard from her? The questions were asked, the answers were written down, and the result was sent to Scotland Yard. Hmm. Hmm. Wilson, yes. Uh, number 9 High Street, Birmingham. Left for London to marry a young man named uh, Tom Reynolds. Seems like she didn't get there, sir. Yeah. Family had a letter from Reynolds, just a sort of friendly note, no mention of the girl. I understand young Reynolds went to Canada, sir. He was once engaged to the girl, but they broke it off. Oh, yes. The next thing, when he was in London, the girl had a letter from him asking her to marry him and go out to Canada. Yes, but did the family see the letter? No. It was all pretty hurried. They were upset, but she seemed to be able to get her own way. Oh, I've heard this kind of thing before. Now, I wonder who the man was. Not Tom Reynolds, that's certain. His letter to the family is enclosed there, sir. Oh, well, let's see it, Riff. Yes, wait a minute. Now, rough crossing, how is everyone? Misspelled neighbors. No, 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 he doesn't mention her. Now, what was her name? Mary, sir. Mary Wilson. Nine High Street, Birmingham. Sergeant, Sergeant, that seems familiar. To me too, sir. I can't quite place wait it, Wait a minute, wait a minute, I've got it. What, Inspector? Uh, George Gregory, that warehouse manager. His address is 7 High Street, Birmingham. Number 7? Well, that means he lives next door. Patience had paid off again. Careful and painstaking methods had given them a new lead, or rather, the renewal of an old lead. For the canvas bag had first led them to the Gregory warehouse. The detectives went back to Northampton, back to interview George Gregory. 
Mary Wilson, Inspector? Well, of course I knew Mary Wilson. Now, uh, tell me, when did you last see her, Mr. Gregory? Oh, some time ago. She went to Canada, you know. She, she married a young chap named Reynolds. Yes, but uh, did she marry him? Well, to the best of my knowledge, she did. You said I knew Mary Wilson. Mm-hmm. Why the past tense? I don't know. Well, don't you always use the past tense when you're not likely to see a person again? Oh, you don't think you'll see her again? Well, Inspector, with her married and living in Canada, that'd hardly be likely, Inspector. George Gregory seemed at ease. His answers rang true. It could be nothing but a strange coincidence. Inspector Courtney gave certain instructions. I want a cable sent to Tom Reynolds in Canada. Find out if he married Mary Wilson or not. The odds are he's still single. Then Courtney went to Birmingham, to number nine High Street, where he talked to Mary's mother. I, uh, I don't want to alarm you, Mrs. Wilson, but I'm from Scotland Yard and I want to make certain inquiries. Scotland Yard? Oh, my Mary's done nothing wrong, has she? Of course not, no, no. Now, tell me, Mrs. Wilson... Do you really think your daughter might have gone to Canada with her young man? Oh, I don't know what to think, sir. I was always puzzled. I mean, I mean the, the way she seemed to patch things up with Tom. Yes. Uh, did you question that? No, I didn't say much. I was glad, really. About her marrying the young man? Yes. Well, you see, for a while I was worried there was another man she seemed to like. But too much, if you know what I mean. Oh, you uh, disapproved? Oh, Mary was never one to take criticism, but I didn't like it, I can tell you. Was the uh, other man older? He was, old enough to know better. Him with a wife and two children of his own. I tell you, I was relieved when I thought Mary was going away to marry Tom Reynolds. Now, there's one more question I must ask you, ma'am. Yes, Inspector? The name of this attentive gentleman. Well, I I don't like to make anything of it, mind. Uh, no, but uh, I'd uh, like to know his name. Well, he happens to live next door, and his name is George Gregory. We've had a reply to your Canada cable, sir. Okay, Sergeant, go ahead and read it. Tom Reynolds is living in Ottawa. He's a bachelor. Last time he saw Mary Wilson was in Birmingham, three months ago. What about his letter from London? There was no letter from London. It was beginning to add up. Point by point, link by link, a chain of circumstantial evidence was being forged. Forged by the patient police. I think he's our man, Sergeant. And imagine it, sir. He's been here under our noses since the very first clue you picked up. Yes, the canvas bag led us right to him. But we haven't tied it up yet. What's the next move, sir? Mary Wilson left for London to meet Reynolds. Or so it seems she told her parents. Yes, it seems more than likely, sir, that they came here. So they must have lived somewhere, she and the man she met. Now the detectives went through the town, front streets and back streets, fashionable hotels and cheap boarding houses. They went wherever there was a sign, rooms to let. Well... We're from Scotland Yard, ma'am. We're inquiring about a young couple who might have stayed here some, oh, six weeks to two months ago. No, not here. Only tech regulars. Had all my boarders for the past 12 months. Thank you, ma'am. Sorry to have troubled you. They ran the whole gamut of landladies. The suspicious landladies, the mean, the garrulous landladies, the kind, the generous, the curious. Then in a lodging house in St. John Street, their work paid off. A young couple? Yes, I've had a few. What was their name? We're not sure what name they might have been using. Oh, you mean Kroops. Well, let me see. Oh, it, it couldn't have been that nice young couple, Mr. and Mrs. Reynolds. Now, it What was their name? Reynolds. Uh, Tom Reynolds? Yes, I believe it was. Such a nice man. Oh, and his young wife was named Mary. She was awfully sweet. Mrs. Marsh... Can you give me a description of Mary Reynolds? Why, yes, I think so. Short, uh, about five feet tall, brown Mm -hmm. hair, rather pretty. Yes. Not much help, I'm afraid. I can't remember any other details. Oh, you helped a lot, thanks. And the man? Tall, dark hair, and a small mole on his left cheek, older than her. Uh Oh, but he was very nice indeed. Oh, surely they couldn't have done anything wrong. Uh, uh, Mrs. Marsh... Uh, can you, I want to attend the police station tomorrow morning at ten? Me? 
Why, sir? Uh, well, we'll be having an identification parade at ten sharp. Quiet, everyone. Uh, I've got together a group of eight people, Inspector. Oh, uh, thank you, Sergeant. Uh, Mrs. Marsh, I want you to try and identify the man you knew as Tom Reynolds. All right, Inspector, but really, I know we and his wife went to Canada. Nevertheless, if you don't mind, just walk slowly down the line and examine each man. Eight men. A couple of detectives, two men taken out of the cells, one recruited off the street, and in the middle of them, a protesting, indignant George Gregory. It's not this man. No, this. No, not him either. Why, Mr. Reynolds! Gregory, uh, grab him, man! Uh, 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 I got him! policeman present to overpower the hastily departing Mr. Gregory, who was immediately arrested on a charge of having murdered Mary Wilson. Today, the evidence that brought about his downfall, the canvas bag that first directed police attention to him, occupies a place of honor in the Black Museum. George Gregory killed the woman, he said, because she was too much in love with him to let him go, but he couldn't afford the scandal that might arise if he continued his association with her. Not a very nice reason, but then the reason for murder seldom are. Anyway, George Gregory was tried and convicted and paid for his crime one morning at eight o'clock. And now, until we meet next time in this same place for another story about the Black Museum, I remain, as always, obediently yours. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. A repository of death. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames which houses Scotland Yard is a warehouse of homicide. Where everyday objects, a pin, a garden hose, a handbag, all are touched by murder. <laughs> Here's a car tire. There were three others, all attached to a sedan. They were removed. Great Scott, Inspector. Uh, those vandals, they, they've stripped the car of everything. Even the four tires, sir. There's nothing left except evidence. Now, today, one of those tires, the one that became a vital clue in the case, can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Well, here we are, in the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. death. On the shelves, around the walls, death in many disguises. Here's a length of electric wiring. The protective insulation has been stripped away. The man touched it. He died. The jury found it was murder. Here's a card. Invitation to a party. The invitation was accepted. Death was the end of that. Right, here's the tire. It's an ordinary car tire. Once it belonged to a sedan that stood in a garage at South End. On a certain night some years ago, two men entered the garage quietly after first forcing the lock. There we are, Ted. Good work, Harry. Look at her. Ben spoking you. And she's ours once we get her out of the garage. Ah, uh, quietly does it. I'll take up the brake. Push her out in the street. 
and down the road a bit. Okay, I'm ready. The object of this stealthy midnight visit was a new car. The two men pushed the automobile down the slope of the road, jumping in when the car began to gather speed. All right, Johnny. Get in. Oh, nice going. Get us, Scotty, Ted. Right. Down behind us. We got away with it. Oh, it was easy. By morning, we'll have everything we want off this car. Tires, spare parts, the seat. And then we'll ditch what's left, eh? We'll make our fortune this way, Addy, my boy. Sounds easy money. It is. Come on, I'll show you what this car can do. Flat out! A car traveling fast along the road to Eastwood. It's twin lights cutting beams in the darkness of the night. And a policeman cycling homeward. Hello? What's that up there, eh? What? A man in the center of the road. Oh, wait till our lights pick him up clearly. It's a... it's a cop. Oh? And he's got his hand up signaling us to stop. Okay. You don't think... What, the word's got out this car's been pinched? Not a chance. Then what's this copper doing? Oh, might want to lift down. You never know. There's his bike at the side of the road. Ted, I don't like it. Take this. it easy, will you? We'll bluff our way out. If he makes trouble, I can handle him. Well, go easy on using that gun. Leave it to me. Good evening, Constable. Anything the matter? I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll have to ask you not to speed like that along this road, sir. Were we speeding? Well, I, I think you know you were, sir, you know. There's been a number of serious accidents around here lately. Oh, dear. Now, may I see your license? My... my license? Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> you know, funny thing, I'm afraid I don't have it on me, Constable. Then I'll have to request some other means of identification, sir. Well, I... Uh, you know, I haven't anything on me at all. Well, where are you going, sir, and uh, where have you come from? Well, we, uh... Oh, we're just driving. Hmm. Is the car yours? No, Constable. The car belongs to me. Oh, I see, sir. Then, uh, would you tell me his number? It's on the front of the car, if you want to see it. I know the number, but do you? Well, well no, not offhand. As I thought, sir. This is a stolen car. Stolen? You, you'd both better get out. Now, come on. I'll have to take down some particulars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What makes you think you can order us around, eh? Get yeah. out, I say. Come on. I want your name. And put that gun away. Say your prayers, copper. Give me that gun. Don't let him take it, Ted. Ted! Yeah. I won't, don't worry. You ask for trouble, copper, you're going to get it. You die! drives away. A man lies dead on the roadway. A murder has been committed. Murder of a policeman. Lovely morning, George. You wouldn't think it to read a morning paper, Tom. Nothing in it but crime. Ah, uh, you won't find much crime round these parts. Here, what's the matter with your dog? Oh, he seems to have found something ahead there. It's not like him to get that excited. What's the matter with him? Here, yeah, wait a minute, George. Huh? Unless I'm mistaken, it ain't only in the morning papers you'll find crime. What do you mean? Well, ahead there. Yeah? Over by the side of the road, it looks like a man. So oh, it does. Come on. Why, hey. it's Charlie Acker. <laughs> He's dead. Dead. By morning, Scotland Yard has represented the scene of the crime by Inspector Clancy and Detective Sergeant Redding. He was shot three times, Redding. Nasty business, sir. 
Oh, here's a notebook lying on the ground beside him. Yes, and he was holding a pencil in his right hand. Oh, well, that seems fairly straightforward, sir. He was about to take down some particulars from a person or persons whom he'd met. Uh, the evidence suggests that, Sergeant. But wait a minute, Inspector. His torch is here in his pocket. Is it? And there's no street lighting nearby. How could he have been writing? Mm, by the light of a vehicle, presumably. Of course, sir. Either the headlights or the interior lighting of a car or a truck. More likely the interior lighting, don't you think, Inspector? Well, we'll work on that assumption first. Which means it was a car. Uh, yeah, there are some tracks here. You can see the skid marks. Now, they might be caused by a car starting fairly fast. I want those tracks photographed. The photographs were duly sent to certain experts at Scotland Yard, and a report came back to Inspector Clancy. Report from the yard, sir. Yes, Sergeant Redding? Those tracks were made by an Evans car. An Evans, eh? Get a full list of all stolen cars within a 50-mile radius. We'll see if there was an Evans amongst them. There were two. One was found. Inspector Clancy interviewed the owner of the other. Yes, it was uh, taken the night before last, Inspector. Uh, some bounder picked the lock of my garage and got away with the car. I'll get a full description from you, sir. Uh, certainly, uh, but uh, I say, I say... No, the Scotland Yard doesn't usually go chasing stolen cars, does it? Not usually, eh, Colonel Fentress? Oh, uh, there's something else behind it, is there? No, uh, excuse me a moment. Uh, uh, hello, hello, uh, Fentress speaking. Uh, oh, yes, 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 uh, just a moment. Uh, it's for you, Inspector. Thank you, sir. Hello? Yes, Redding. At Rayleigh. I see. Yes, yes, I'll come down right away. Oh, um, um, uh, something happened, Inspector? An Evans car's been found, sir, abandoned in a ditch outside Rayleigh. A new Evans. Index mark TW6120. Uh, t but, but, but that's mine, my Joe. Then you'd better come along, sir. They found the car, the police going over it for fingerprints. Curious crowd gathered around it. It was a vastly different car from the one Colonel Fentress had locked in his garage two nights earlier. Great Scott, Inspector, those vandals, they've stripped the car of everything. Even the four tires. There, there, there's nothing left. Except evidence. Hey, what do you mean, Inspector? This was the car concerned in the murder of Constable Hacker on Eastwood Road. Uh, my car? <laughs> concerned in that killing? Come with me, Colonel. I'll show you the evidence to prove it. That car is the first link in a long chain at the end of which is the murderer. And a further link is the missing four tires, one of which became the vital clue in the case. That tire can be seen today in the Black Museum. A car was found, abandoned in a ditch outside Rayleigh. You can see for yourself, Colonel Fentress, on the running board. Uh, a dark stain there. It's blood? Yes, it's blood. And see this? Uh, oh, a spent cartridge case. It was found on the floor of the car. Then uh, my car was concerned in that poor fellow's murder? We'll make confirmatory tests, of course. The blood stain will be checked against the constable's grouping, and the cartridge case will go to ballistics. These routine checks must be carried out. But Colonel Fentress knew, and Inspector Clancy knew, that the driver of the stolen car had taken part in the policeman's murder. And knowing this, the inspector was able to reconstruct the crime. We don't know why Constable Hacker pulled the car up, Sergeant. He was cycling home. Perhaps the Evans car was speeding. Well, whatever the reason, he called on it to halt. And in the process of questioning, he came to realize the car was stolen. He'd have brought out his notebook and pencil to take down some particulars, sir. And for doing that, he was killed. 
The picture of the crime was clear, but now, how to find the driver of the car? Nothing was known about it. There were no eyewitnesses. One man had seen the driver, and he was dead. Why would they begin searching? We'll begin right here at the car, Sergeant. It, it's funny about those tires, sir. Very funny. But not only the tires are missing. No, the toolkit's been taken, and the jack, and most of the spare parts. The windscreen wipe has been removed, so have the headlamps and the car radio Colonel Fentress had installed. Vandalism, sir? Well, if it was vandalism, it was well planned, Sergeant. Yes. Yeah. Now, there are lorry tracks over there. The stuff was loaded on and driven away. Car stealing, sir, for spare parts and tires. A very profitable pastime. Now, what was taken out of this car would probably be worth from two, three hundred pounds on the second-hand market. Black market, sir, for the tires. I wonder who handles second-hand parts and tires around this district. Come on. Where to, Inspector? The nearest garage. <laughs> They found a garage less than half a mile away. The proprietor, reassured that he was not under suspicion, proved to be helpful. Fair parts and tires. Quite a few places around here who handle them, Inspector. Uh, could you list them for us, sir? Certainly. Come into the office. There were six names on that list. Six visits to make. Sergeant Redding made them, posing as a driver in search of new tires. Oh, good morning. I need four new tires for an Evans car. Can you help me out? Williams and Sons were sorry. They hadn't had any tires to sell for months past. Field and Company said the same thing. So did Hammond and Barden, Kennedy and Sons. Then Sergeant Redding paid his last visit. The sixth name on the list. shop on the road out of Eastwood. A car was being overhauled by a mechanic. A lorry stood on a vacant block of land beside the workshop. A sign at the front of the building said, Randolph and Burns, motor engineers and spare parts. Yes, sir? Oh, I need four new tires for an Evans car. Can you help me out? An Evans? Do you own an Evans car? Oh, not me, chum, no. no. it's for the governor. I've been everywhere trying to get these tyres. Well, you know, I might be able to set you up. Of course, they're in short supply. We'll pay whatever you ask for them. Okay. Hey. Oh, Jack. Here a minute, will you? What is it? Fellow here wants to buy some Evans tyres. Huh? Chauffeur, aren't you, mate? Yeah, that's right. Well, you can set him up, can't we? No, we can't. But, Ted, he'll pay the right I price. tell you, we can't. We can't set him. How can we when we haven't seen an Evans tire in months? But, Ted... People just don't bring us second-hand tires anymore, mister. Sorry. Sergeant went out, went back to where Inspector Clancy was waiting for his report. Something he'd seen deep in the eyes of the man called Ted told him the search was at an end. I don't know what spoiled it, Inspector. Perhaps he recognized me. Perhaps he was just being cautious. You say the other man was ready to sell you the tires? Ready and willing, sir. I think they're the ones we want. I'm almost sure of it. All right, we'll make some further inquiries about them both. Now, uh, first of all, uh, business registration. We'll get their full names from that. The business records office holds many secrets. The directors of England's leading companies, the balance of power and mighty industrial concerns. It also lists the many thousands of small businesses, companies, partnerships, sole traders, their trade and management personnel. Uh, here we are, Sergeant. Randolph and Burns, motor engineers, Eastwood. Partners, Edward Burns. Oh, that'll be your friend, Ted. And Harold Randolph. 
Probably the other men I spoke to. Well, take a note of their names. We'll see if the method index section knows them. The method index section at Scotland Yard. That's a vast room of records. The walls are lined solidly with filing cabinets. Here are the details of all the crimes, from murder to petty theft. Here are the names and the aliases of all the criminals ever convicted in any English court. Filed and cross-filed for easy checking. Uh, those two men you asked me to check, Inspector Clancy. Find anything on them, Severs? There's no record for Harold Randolph. What about the other one? Burns, yes, we know him. Ted Burns, motor mechanic, four convictions. The first uh, from my hometown, funnily enough, Oxford City Police Court. The charge? Uh, stealing a motor car. And what were the other three charges, Severs? All connected with motor theft, sir. Uh -huh. uh, one was for removing spare parts from parked vehicles. Another time he was convicted for selling a stolen car. That's all I want. Very Thank you, Severs. Inspector Clancy and Sergeant Redding drove back to Eastwood. On the road there, about 50 yards from the motor workshop, they waited. They saw two mechanics leave at 5.30 on their way home. Then, a few minutes later... There he is, Inspector. That's Harry Randolph. And he's alone. It was a very peaceful scene. The casual passerby would have noticed a dark sedan slowing down beside a thick-set man in overalls. Mr. Randolph? Yeah? Oh, it's you. Still off of them cars, eh? In a manner of speaking, sir, this is Inspector Clancy from Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard? Get in, Mr. Randolph. No, not me, Inspector. Now, you've got nothing against me. On the contrary, we have a great deal against you. Get in. Randolph was defiant at first. But when the advantages of turning King's evidence were pointed out to him, he became almost verbose. It wasn't me who thought of the scheme. I I was talked into it by him. The scheme being to steal cars, sell their spare parts and tires, and abandon them? Yeah. Ted said we couldn't get enough parts and tires to stay in business otherwise. He talked me into helping him to pinch the Evans. Well, go on. Well, everything was sweet, and then on the way back to Eastwood, the cop signals us to stop. Tells us we were speeding. He'd have got our names and all. So you shot him dead. I, I, I didn't do it. Ted shot him. The gun's hidden in the desk, down at our works. His fingerprints will be on it. I told him not to shoot. He, he wouldn't listen. <laughs> We took the lorry down and got everything we could from the car and brought it back. And where is that stuff now? Well, some of it we sold and three of the tires went off late the day. I would have sold a lot of the copper here, but Ted was wise to him. He, he can smell copper. Three were sold. Then one tire is left on the premises? Yeah. But listen, won't you? I, I, I might have helped a pinch the car, but I'd nothing to do with the murder. Ted did that. He shot a cop man. A report on the tire we found on the premises, sir. It comes from an Evans car, all right, and matches the tracks near Constable Hacker's body. Then our case is complete, Sergeant. The gun was found, the fingerprints on the wheel rims belong to Randolph and Burns, and now the tire. <laughs> All right, Randolph, you've one more chance to help us. Where's Burns? Oh. Come on, you must have some idea. Right. But you've got to look after me. I'm not promising anything. Where's Burns? He's trying to get away overseas. I, I, I think he was heading for Liverpool. He was always talking about a pal of his who was a ship's mate. Can you remember the name of the ship? Oh, uh, I, I think it was called the Briar Rose. Uh, 
I have reason to believe your name is Ted Burns. Ted what? <laughs> you got the wrong man, Sam. I don't think so, Mr. Burns. I have here a warrant for your arrest on a charge of murder. Hey, you got nothing on me? You got no evidence? Oh, yes, we have, Mr. Burns. All the evidence we need. And today, that tire occupies a place in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. The murder of Constable Hacker on the lonely Eastwood Road was solved by the patient methods of Scotland Yard and by the talking of Harry Randolph, whose verbosity put him behind bars for many years to come and brought his unholy friend Ted Burns to the last walk the end of a rope one morning at eight o'clock. A crook's plan misfired into murder, and neither Burns nor Randolph had the talent for outwitting the men of the yard. So it was that another chapter of murder was closed, another record added to the method index section, and another exhibit, the car tire, was added to the Black Museum. And now until we meet next time in the same place and I tell you another story about the Black Museum, I remain as always obediently yours. from London. The Black Museum. A repository of death. Yes, here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide. Where everyday objects, a man's necktie, a woman's glove, a boy's school cap, all are touched by murder. Here's a champagne glass. That's a familiar object. Long stem, delicate curve, shining crystal. This fragile object belongs to New Year's Eve, to weddings and anniversaries. Funny about things like this, Sergeant? Funny, sir? I'd say that one was loaded. I meant funny in a philosophical sense, Sergeant. Funny how human beings can take an article meant for happiness and use it for tragedy. <laughs> Well, anyway, that champagne glass can be found today in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Well, here we are, the Black Museum. Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. This place echoes with violent death. Voices are hollow here, whether the hollowness is caused by the high vaulted ceilings or by the reaction of the human mind to the atmosphere of this room. The effect is the same. Everybody who comes here learns a sense of fear. It's natural because here lies death. Death, cruel, unnecessary, vengeful, or greedy. Still a kind of death brought by one man or one woman on another. This is a record to be studied not merely by criminologists, but by every student of man's inhumanity to man. Here's an iron skillet. It's heavy in your hand, the kind of kitchen utensil your grandmother used. Well-balanced, quite suitable for frying eggs or veal chops, or, or for bashing a skull, perhaps. There's little doubt as to the use which brought this particular skillet here. Yes. And here's the champagne glass. It's well designed, graceful. You could place it with a companion on a silver tray, as Colonel Harry Reed did. You could pop a cork and then fill the glasses, as Colonel Harry Reed did. And you might say, as the dapper Colonel did, to you, my dear Elizabeth, to your return and your complete recovery. I wish 
I could drink to that wholeheartedly, Harry. Really, I do. Well, why not, my dear? You've been released, you're there. That's it, exactly. I've been released. Not merely sent home from a hospital, so to speak. After all, the hospital I was in had bars on the windows. Oh, I insist, my dear, that you touch glasses with me and drink at once. That's no way to talk. But, Harry, I... Ah, then, no buts, Elizabeth. Many people have had nerve breakdowns, and the vast majority of them have recovered. Very well, Harry, dear. But not to me, to you, the most patient of husbands in the world. So they drank the champagne, and all was well. It was very pleasant, very relaxing, reassuring. But the world is always too much with us, and the colonel finally had to say, Now you rest until dinner, Elizabeth. I've a beef up on my... I won't be long. And the colonel kissed his wife. And the colonel went off to his appointment. It's six months now, Reed. One way or the other, the matter ought to be settled. I assure you, Davis, there's nothing to worry about. These things take time. There's been plenty of time. Look, Reed, if you don't want to complete the deal, return the 500 pounds. But it's not up to me. My client... Your client indicated you willingly disposed of the property. My client paid the deposit in good faith. We considered a binder on the contract. We waited six months. Your 500 pounds is quite safe, Davis. You can reassure your client. And on my side, we'll go through with the deal as soon as everything is clear. Well, I certainly hope so. My people want to take possession. And they shall. They shall indeed. And soon. Meanwhile, there's no reason for misunderstanding between us, is there? After all, we live in the same small town. We see each other constantly. You know, John, I've often wondered why we don't see more of each other. Oh, socially, that is. <laughs> Rather a changeable fellow, the colonel, isn't he? There were other changes ahead, more serious ones. They first came to somewhat public notice the night our colonel called Dr. Ashley to his home. Ah, Dr. Ashley, good of you to come so quickly. You made it sound rather urgent, colonel. Is it really serious? Yes, sir. I'm afraid, doctor, really afraid. It's my wife. Has she broken down again? No. She complains of terrible pain in her abdomen. I'd better see her at once. Yeah, this way, please. If, if you can, Doctor. Uh, yes? Uh, she seems to me to be as much frightened as she is in pain. Oh? What exactly do you mean by that? Frightened that, uh, well, that her pain is in her imagination. I see. Oh, very well. I'll bear that in mind, Colonel. Uh, ah, in here. If you wait outside, Colonel, please. Oh, must, must I, Doctor? I prefer it. Very well. Now then, Mrs. Reed. Can you hear me, Mrs. Reed? The good colonel waited outside the door. Up and down, back and forth, he paced. Almost as if he were once again on guard duty. Grim-faced, tense. He waited. At long last. You'd better come in, Colonel. Quick. Doctor. Is she? I'm uh, afraid so. I've done everything I can. A few moments later, Elizabeth Reed was at rest. At last. Tears streamed down the colonel's cheeks. But he was silent. There seemed nothing to say. The doctor led him away and told him gently. It was acute gastritis. And her heart. Uh, you want the minister, I assume, and the mortician. I'll send the certificate over. Natural causes. There was a well-attended funeral. The flowers were piled high in tribute to the colonel's position in the town as well as to the memory of his wife. And then the colonel resumed his life, somewhat more lonely but still active, bearing himself in military fashion as he went about his small real estate business in time drifted by. One month, two. And then, one day on the main street. Oh, good morning, Colonel. Ah, Davis, good to see you. I hesitated discussing this, your recent bereavement and so on, but don't you think we need to close our deal, Reed? Oh, yes, uh, yes, of course. I, um, well, that is, I'm rather by myself these days. Would you care to join me for tea or get something stronger one afternoon? You say when, Reed. I'll be glad to. Excellent. Then, uh, shall we say tomorrow? Five-ish? Why not? Your place or mine? Oh, mine, of course. Delighted to have you. 
Have a scone, old man. Really excellent. My housekeeper has quite the touch. Thank you. I will. <laughs> Almost as if we were a pair of elderly ladies. <laughs> tea and scone. Two gentlemen, somewhat past middle age, enjoying tea and scones and making ready to discuss business. In fact, they did discuss business. A 500-pound deposit and the pending deal. And John Davis went home quite satisfied. John Davis went home and a little later called Dr. Ashley. <laughs> I don't understand it, Doctor. My, my stomach's like, like cast iron. Always has been. Now, suddenly, this. Ah, uh, none of us are quite as young as we used to be. Uh, Even cast iron can wear thin with use. Eat anything out of the ordinary, John? Today? Yesterday? No, no, nothing. Had some scones for tea. The butter may have been a bit rancid, but uh. tasted perfectly fresh. Over oh, Colonel Reed's. Eh? Reed? Yes, that's why. We had a little business to discuss. He asked me over... He seems quite lonely since his wife passed on, uh, so I went, mostly to keep him company. Oh, nice of you. Well, uh, just take the prescription I'm leaving you. Rest a day or two. You'll be all right. What's wrong, Doctor? Oh, nothing. Just a quirk of memory. Oh? How so? Your symptoms and Mrs. Reed's rather the same. Nothing serious about it. Just odd that we should have two similar cases in such close juxtaposition. A town like this, a doctor gets to know most of the illness. As the doctor said, nothing serious. Just an interesting coincidence. And in a day or so, John Davis was up and about. Aside from a slight tenderness in his abdomen, he felt no after effects. All was well. All was quiet. Everyone was his courteous self, including Colonel Reed. Well, now, candy. And from the Colonel. How decent of him. Here it is, Doctor. The same wrappings it came in. Nice looking box. Don't you care for candy, John? You haven't eaten much. As a matter of fact, I don't. I did offer a piece to the charwoman at the office. You see, one's missing. The charwoman, eh? <laughs> Is that the way you treat a gift? With the hope you are sufficiently recovered to enjoy this, Harry Reed. Oh, the decent of him. That's what I thought. Until the charwoman was taken with pains and reaching an hour after she ate the candy. Are you suggesting anything, John? That would be slanderous at this stage, wouldn't it? There's nothing to it, John. There couldn't be. The colonel... Well, I inquired at the probate office. He did rather well following his wife's death and her will, you know. He never had any money of his own to speak of. Former military men rarely do. Yes, it might be interesting. I've done practically no laboratory work of my own for some time. But I have a little equipment. Shall I try my hand at a bit of chemical analysis, John? I'm curious about the contents of that box of candy... You seem to be as well as I. The doctor was methodical, to say the least. He took his time setting up his equipment, preparing reagents, making ready for his private little tests. Meanwhile, John Davis ran into his friend, the colonel, on the street. John, good to see you. Well, how are you, Harry? You're looking fit. Well, I try to keep that way. <laughs> Care to join me for another attack of indigestion, Omen? <laughs> well, today, the champagne glass we've been talking about can be seen, as you might expect, among the other exhibits in the Black Museum. The Colonel and John Davis parted quite amicably on the street. Davis watched the smart military walk the ramrod straight back as the colonel paraded into his own office under his head. Somehow it didn't seem quite plausible that this man might, just might be something quite different than what he seemed. The next afternoon, the telephone rang in John Davis's office. Yes? Oh, that you, John? This is Harry here. Harry? Oh, yes, yes, of course. How are you? Ah, very well. And you? Quite well. <laughs> no more stomach aches? No trace. Well, and how about this evening? Oh, uh, sorry, old man, I, I can't this evening. Uh, but uh, perhaps in a day or so. Oh, too bad. Oh, I'll be speaking to you. Goodbye. Bye. That evening, Davis had a previous appointment with Dr. Ashley in his makeshift laboratory. This little operation here is the Marsh test. Oh? For arsenic. Interesting.
interesting. Yes, isn't it? Particularly since I found that every piece of candy in your gift box had arsenic in it. Good Lord! Arsenic, you see, is a cumulative poison. Personally, I have a tolerance for quite a large amount of... It usually fails to pass through the human system. It accumulates, and bit by bit, the fatal dose is built up until one day the victim dies. Dr. Ashley explained all this to John Davis. Finally, John grasped the significance of the facts. Each piece of candy would never bother the ordinary stomach or the uh, cast-iron type such as you both did you have. Most people could eat a piece of two. Indeed, you had eaten most of the candy yourself. Well, uh, you follow me, I gather? Follow you? Doctor, I'm a step ahead of you. But exactly what that step is, I'm not sure. I think we need expert help. The local constabulary? I said expert help. Where from? The CID, Scotland Yard. It was a clear, cogent letter reciting the situation as Dr. Ashley and John Davis knew it. It was addressed to the Home Secretary, the gentleman of the British government responsible for the police force in general. In due course, the letter reached the desk of Inspector Charles in Scotland Yard. Following the set routine, Inspector Charles showed the communication to his immediate assistant, Detective Sergeant Hatch. Well, nothing else for it. You and I will have to take a small trip to the country. Frankly, I won't mind. I can use a touch of country air after all. They came into the quiet town unobtrusively. Two men on a walking tour, vacationists. They put up at the inn. Toward sundown, they strolled about the town. Quite casually. They turned in at the gate with its little sign announcing that Dr. Ashley had his dispensary there. Once, however, within the doctor's office. Now then, Doctor, perhaps you'd let Sergeant Hatch and I have it from the beginning. Well, my entrance into the situation came shortly after Mrs. Reed returned from the uh, sanitarium. She'd been ill? Mentally ill. Nervous breakdown? Rather more than that. She'd been certified insane. She was discharged as being quite stable once again. And you were called in? In my professional capacity. I found her past help. Acute gastritis, or so it seemed at the time. But it doesn't seem so now? You understand, Inspector, I have no facts. At least not on that side. I merely analyzed the box of candy received by John Davis shortly after he'd been taken ill. Doctor, would this Colonel Reed benefit from Mr. From Mr. Davis's death? There'd been something about a, a real estate and a deposit paid. Quite a large sum, I believe. Mr. Davis can give you the details. One final question, sir. Who had Mrs. Reed committed to the uh, institution in the first instance? Why, I believe the husband did. But the records will be available to you, of course. Of course. Oh, thank you, Doctor. If we need you... We'll... By the time they left the doctor's office, Inspector Charles and Sergeant Hatch felt they had heard an interesting, if circumstantial, story. Their next stop, naturally, was John Davis's home. You've no idea, gentlemen, what a relief it is to have police officers of your caliber on the job. Thank you. About the candy and the card in the box, do you have any definite reason to believe the colonel wants you, well, out of the way? There's the matter of 500 pounds. He either will not or cannot explain. And um, Dr. Ashley mentioned Mrs. Reed's will. Yes, curious about that. There was one will made out entirely in favor of her children by her first marriage. The will which was accepted and executed was in the colonel's handwriting, but signed by Mrs. Reed and produced subsequent to her death. You find that interesting, I take it, Sergeant? I expect you do as well, sir. Quite. Mr. Davis, do you think it might be possible to exhume Mrs. Reed's body without the matter becoming common knowledge in the whole town? The men from Scotland Yard accomplished the almost impossible. Armed with the proper papers, plus tools and dark lanterns, they supervised the removal of the body at night, with no one the wiser except the necessary officials. This feat completed, they waited quite, quite patiently. The government analyst was called in. The report was brief. Inspector Charles read it to Dr. Ashley. The examination reveals the presence of four grains of arsenic, more than a fatal dose, and the largest amount of the poison I have ever found in human remains. Well, that's it, Doctor. And I didn't recognize the symptoms... Acute gastritis, I call it. Why should you have recognized them, sir? I dare say murder of any kind is hardly a common occurrence in your practice. 
Well, Sergeant, since our warrant is all in order, it begins to appear that a search of Colonel Reed's premises may be next on the agenda. Now the pretense of the walking tour was completely discarded. It was Saturday, and the sleepy little village was just about bestirring itself. The inspector and the sergeant walked for short distance from the end to Colonel Reed's place of business, almost directly opposite Davis's office. The sergeant tried the door. Not locked, sir. A locked door in these parts would arouse more suspicion than not. Let's go in, shall we? One file cabinet, one desk, telephone, chair for visitors. <laughs> Can't do much of a business. I dare say not. Let's get to it. The search was quite thorough. The desk was emptied of its contents. These were replaced in an orderly fashion. Oh, nothing extraordinary here, sir. Oh? Well, what do you make of this, sir? Champagne glass. Rear of the file cabinet. Todd? Shall I hold it aside, sir? Yes, you may as well. Interesting, the trace of sediment. Apparently, it was never washed. Not that it was used the last time. Anything else in there, Sergeant? Oh, what's going on in here? Colonel Reed? Yes. More to the point for you to identify yourselves and your business here, if any. Inspector Charles, CID. My identity card. This is Sergeant Hatch. I see. I assume you have a warrant for this search. We do. Right here, Colonel. Oh, oh very well. Go on with your work. May I ask why you were keeping the champagne glass in the file cabinet? A memento to my poor wife. We drank from it. Oh, that is, uh, she did about a week before she uh, passed away. A nice gesture, if I may say so. And still with a trace of the sediment at the bottom. But, oh, careful, sir. It would be a pity to have the glass break after all this time. Oh, sorry. Awkward of me to brush against it like that. Yes, wasn't it? All right, Sergeant, you can open the desk drawer the Colonel just closed and see what he put in it. But you said you'd finish. Your pardon, Colonel. I've had quite enough of this. These paper packets weren't in here a few minutes ago, Inspector. How many? Oh, look here, I wouldn't have 20 of them, sir. I'll take dogs. one. Just... Thank you. White powder. Well, this wouldn't be arsenic, would it, Colonel? It not only would be, it is. Really? Well, as you can see, I'm wearing my gardening coat. Ordinarily, I do not come into the office on Saturday, but something came up. I've been planning an experiment in my garden. Hence the arsenic. A garden, an experiment? With 20 packets of arsenic? Yes. My lawn is plagued with dandelions, roughly two dozen of them. I plan to drill a small hole at the root of each weed, pour in the arsenic in each of those packets, and kill each dandelion individually, rather than take the chance of ruining the whole lawn. Sorry, Colonel, it's a good story, but rather far-fetched. Particularly since you tried to rid yourself of the packets before we searched your person. And particularly since the charge pending is... Willful murder of your wife by a cynical poisoning. But this is ridiculous. Someone is... Sergeant! Keep that champagne glass safe before Colonel Reed succeeds in smashing it. Yes, sir. Your Colonel Reed, you are under arrest. The charge is murder. I must warn you that anything you may be say... I will not stand... Oh, no, Sergeant. I'll be acquitted. You'll see, and then I'll have to leave here. A trial? You'll make quite enough, Colonel. You've made several mistakes, not the least of which was your attempt on John Davis and your preservation of this glass. A sentimental gesture, but rather silly. My bet is the sediment in it will turn out to be arsenic. You must have been very sure of yourself, Colonel, to leave this glass unwashed. Very sure of yourself indeed. Bring him along, Sergeant. I think he'll come quietly now. And today, that champagne glass can be seen in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. There was no doubt about one facet of Colonel Reed's character. He was a man of great pride. His behavior at the trial was exemplary. His bearing, military. He repeated his story of the separate packets of arsenic for separate dandelions, and he sounded as if he'd made a good case of it. At least for himself. But not as it turned out for the jury. Colonel Reed accepted his sentence as if it were an order from a superior officer. And one morning, at the traditional time of eight o'clock, Colonel Reed marched to the scaffold as if he were on parade. And as for the champagne glass, now it remains in its customary place, as I told you, in Scotland Yard. Now, until we meet next time, in the same place, and I tell you another story about the Black Museum. 
I remain, as always, obediently yours. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum. A repository of death. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames which houses Scotland Yard is a warehouse of homicide. Where everyday objects, a package of cigarettes, a length of string, a linen napkin, all are touched by murder. It's a Gladstone bag. It's a familiar object. Every railroad train carries several inevitably useful, compact, and expandable. They always hold more than they seem. A perfect vacation. Perfect also for... If you look inside, Inspector, just uh, pry the two halves apart at one end, as I did. Yes, I see. Oh, odd objects to heaven of the least. Not if one had every intention of disposing of them, Inspector. Today, that Gladstone bag can be seen in the Black Museum. <laughs> the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear the Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. <laughs> should be carved on a little abandoned hope for me you enter here. Yes, abandoned hope of peaceful, quiet, dreamless sleep. For within this room is almost every instrument which ever has been used for the commission of the foul deed called murder. Yes, here lies death. No doubt about it. You feel it in the dull, oppressive atmosphere. You see it first marked calmly on the neatly lettered cards. So-and-so died by this instrument at the hands of so-and-so dated and so forth. Your glance passes to the thing itself. You almost feel the blood. There's a camera. So, you think you know... Ordinary tourist snapshot taking camera. Yet within the blackness of this box, the film registered two faces. A third person saw a print. And from that recognition, three people died. One by a hangman's rope. There's a briar pipe, well smoked. Thoroughly discolored, a pleasure to a pipe smoker, but no pleasure to the man who inhaled hydrocyanic gas with his tobacco. Nor to the killer, trapped by the pipe itself. Ah, here we are, the Gladstone bag. Piece of luggage for a man. It looks so commonplace, so much as if it belonged to a traveling salesman, not to Jim Hudson. Of course, in a way, Jim was a traveling salesman. He certainly had a sales talk. And he was quite successful at it. Sally... I've never seen you looking lovelier. Oh, Jimmy. You always do that. Do what, sweetheart? Say things like that. Just when I want to pick a fight with you. <laughs> That's one of the reasons I love you so much. Despite your wife and everything else. Everything else? That's what I wanted to fight you with you about. We... Well, we just can't go on like this, Jimmy, darling. Why not? We're as happy as circumstances. Don't you see, Jimmy? A woman wants at least a snatch of domesticity, not just clandestine meetings with the clock ticking away her happiness in the background. It'll come, darling. It'll come. The girl was right, of course, from her point of view. Granted that the relationship between her and the man she loved was, well, outside the recognized bounds. Granted that they found each other when it seemed too late. Still, the girl was right. She wanted a certain sense of security which can come to a woman only through the small things of making coffee in the morning while a man was shaving with an earshot. And Sally James was the kind of girl who took action when she wanted something badly enough. Jim, what about the week we planned together for this spring? I probably could get away, darling, if we had a place to go. I have the place. Anyway, the ad about it. You was something, aren't you? Here, darling. I found this in the Sunday paper. 
Go on, read it. For rent, bungalow, the beaches, Pevensey Bay, Eastbourne. Reasonable by the week. You've got your heart set on this, haven't you, sweet? Can we do it? A week of April 12th. All right? All right. Oh, Jimmy, it'll be heaven down there by the sea. Heaven by the sea. Poor girl, one of those human beings who believes with all her heart that dreams can become reality. Perhaps it was just as well that Sally didn't see her Jim some two evenings later in a quiet little restaurant not more than three blocks from the place she'd given Jim a precious clipping. Rhoda, my darling, I've never seen you looking lovelier. Oh, come off it, Jimmy. That kind of romance and just isn't in my style. You're a woman, aren't you? Well, you ought to know, Jimmy boy. <laughs> and how? Thanks. Look, Rhoda, I've taken a cottage at Pevensey Bay. Oh, how inconvenient to have to travel all that distance. Not for weekends, it isn't. Inconvenient. Wow, the daring young man on the flying trapeze. <laughs> Would you like weekends by the sea, Rhoda? Why not? Keep this fun. Nice place. Called the beaches. Old garden, private bathing beach. Sounds marvelous. I thought you'd like it. Well, I can't make it this weekend. Neither can I. How about the weekend of the 16th? Well, we'd go down Friday afternoon, come back early Monday morning. There's a very early train. It's a deal, Jimmy. It really is a deal. A clever rascal, Jim Hudson, without a doubt. Knows his way with the ladies. But he cuts his margins rather close, doesn't he? Not the dates. April 12th, the week, with Sally. Friday the 16th, with Rhoda. Well, that's hardly a full week with Sally. But, of course, Sally doesn't know about this on Friday noon the 9th as she stands in the doorway of the railway carriage in Waterloo Station. You will be down by Monday, won't you, Jimmy, dear? Sooner than that, if I can. You know that, darling. I guess I feel like a little girl on her first trip home. I'm sorry it has to be this way. Oh, I don't mind, really. I'll have a chance to put the cottage in shape. Have it all clean and comfortable for my man. When I saw it, there weren't any tools there. And there's always something to fix. I'd better add tools to my shopping list. Oh, and don't forget the traveling eye I asked before, dear. And please hurry to get down and... Oh, kiss me. Quick, Jimmy, the train's leaving. Oh, Jimmy, dear. Bye, darling. See you Monday. Monday it'll be. Take care, darling. Take care. Watch him as he walks up the platform. The train is already disappearing from the track. Jim has his hands in his pockets. He's whistling merrily. A man with nothing on his mind except his love affair and the prospect of the week ahead. He leaves the station, walks up the street away, pauses before a hard wish. What was it he added to his shopping list? Oh, yes. Tools. He enters the shop. May I assist you, sir? Yes, yes, I think you can. What do you wish? Uh, you've got some fine-looking knives in the window. May I see them? Any particular blade size up? I think, um, yes, yes, the ten-inch carver will be about right. Uh, very well, sir. There we are, sir. Best Sheffield steel, hollow ground, razor sharp, and guaranteed to hold temper. It will take very little honing to keep the edge, sir. Mm, very efficient-looking. Uh, do you prefer the bone or the plastic handle? Bone, I think. Uh, very good, sir. Is there anything else? I think, um, yes, sir. A small cross-cut saw. Small, about 18 inches. Perfect. Excellent quality, as you can hear. Good. Would you wrap them, please? Again, that would be six and four, sir. I'll just make up the slip. You'll have your package in a moment. Jim Hudson took his package on the train with him on Monday morning. And tea time at the beaches, Pevensey Bay, promised to be exciting. Wonderful. Isn't this wonderful, Jimmy? I discovered the past was at the top of the cliff on Sunday. Oh, Jimmy, it's paradise. It is a nice view. And so alone, so private. This is our private view, darling. It's, it's like a honeymoon. You are a sweet little thing, Sally. Very sweet. I know. 
when you call me sweet, you think of me as a child. But I love you as a woman, Jimmy. I know. Shall we go back now? It looks like it may kick up a storm. If you want to, darling. Whatever you want. Whatever he wants, Sally. But does he know what he wants, this man with a wife in London, you at the beaches, and still a third woman waiting to join him just four days from now? It's too bad the beach isn't sand. Oh, I don't know. Shale isn't bad. Funny about this place. Funny? How, oh, darling? Do you remember the Doris Clark case? Who was she? She's the reason the beaches was available. I don't understand. She lived here. Two men she knew came down. She was beaten Buried alive in the shale. The men hung. How horrible. They made a lot of mistakes, so they mightn't have been caught. People shy away from a house with that kind of a story. I don't care. We'll change its reputation then. With our love. Let's go inside, dear. It's getting chilly with the sun gone and the storm coming up. The storm came, the rain pounded on the roof, the wind lashed at the sea, and within the cottage called the beaches, all was snug and warm. I love a fire in a fireplace. Don't you, Jimmy, darling? Yes, I suppose I do. Oh, Jim. Am I being too sticky? Sentimental? Trifle. What's wrong, Jimmy? You've been, well, far away today. Sally, let's face it. Things like this never go on for long. Jim! Jimmy, I don't believe you said that. I did say it. I mean it. Then why did you bring me down here? It was your idea. I went along with it, hoping we could work something out. Work it out? It's past the... You, got... you never loved me. Stop crying. <laughs> I can't stand crying. I ruined my life for you. Now you want to just forget about me. Stop it. Go on. You can't be infant now forever. You want your cake and to have it too. You want your wife and other women. You won't. I won't let you. Stop it, Sally. I told you to stop it. No. No, I didn't do it. I'll do whatever you want. I'll go away and never see you. Get up. Get the scene was set, save for one vital piece of evidence. A black Gladstone bag, which can be seen today in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Friday, the 16th of April, dawned fine and clear. A calm, gay Jim Hudson made his way, whistling as usual through the weekend-bound crowds of Waterloo Station. What? Wow. Here you are, my good man. <laughs> Glad you think I'm a good man. <laughs> I am. Uh, well, I think you are. <laughs> By Monday morning, I'll know. <laughs> then let's make that train, baby. Pevensey Bay on number seven. The train to Pevensey Bay was none too fast for Jim and Rhoda. It was a fine spring day, beautiful spring evening. Moonlight made the rollers on the beach gleam with a lovely phosphorescence. On the porch of the cottage, known as the beaches. Know something, Jimmy boy? I know lots of things, old girl. What, for instance? Oh, this. If I were the romantic type, this place would make me go, oh, gooey. But you're not? No, I'm not. All your misconceptions of women notwithstanding... And you want to waste all this moonlight and romance? Oh, come, darling. If you must whisper sweet nothings, come and whisper to me. Why not out here? Because I don't feel comfortable on the shale. Come on, now. Always let the woman have her way, particularly after she's cooked a beautiful dinner. Here, now. I'm the only beautiful... 
What a way you have. In here, darling. No, no, not in there. It's a, it's a spare room, not made up. I want to see it. Oh, nothing in there. Oh, are you going to deny me anything, darling? It's locked. I, uh... Oh, Jimmy. No. Say, what are you? Bluebeard or something? Maybe I am. The door stayed locked. The weekend at Pevensey Bay was quite successful. But now, the scene changes to a London street lined with somewhat shabby buildings which house somewhat shabby offices. Into one of those buildings, a woman hurries almost furtively. She climbs the stairs one flight, walks into an office, door of which announces in gold lettering, Cross Detective Agency. You are Mr. Cross? I am. What can I do for you, Mrs... Uh... Mrs... Uh... Oh, my ring. Yes, an old trick. Uh, you sit down, won't you? Thank you. My name is Lillian Hudson. Mrs. Lillian Hudson. I see. Well, how can I help you? I, uh, I want some information on my husband, James Hudson. Go on, please. I saw your advertisement. Were you formerly with Scotland Yard? I was. Advancement seems slow. I'm working for myself now. Yes. Well, I have reason to believe that my husband has been well... Seeing other women. Ah, you want me to get the evidence? I think so. A divorce action? Perhaps. It depends on the results. And you want to stay in the background? For the present. Hmm. Well, have you anything on which I can start? Uh, an address? A lead of any kind? I have this. A baggage check. Waterloo Station baggage storage. Stamp 10 a.m. Friday, April 16th. An innocent bit of pasteboard. Where did you get this, Mrs. Hudson? I took one of my husband's suits to the cleaner. This was in a pocket. The cleaner gave it to me. Oh, and why should this mean anything? Because Jim, my husband, was away the entire week of the 12th until the morning of the 19th. It came to me, if he had told the truth, how could he have checked something at Waterloo on the 16th if he were out of town all that week? Uh, an interesting observation, Mrs. Hudson. Well, suppose I go over to Waterloo Station and pick up whatever was checked there. Oh, and uh, <clears throat> sorry to mention this, but uh, it is customary to have a retainer, you know? Private Detective Cross, once of Scotland Yard, went on over to Waterloo Station and presented the baggage check. A short while later, he arrived in the office of Inspector Henley at the yard. Oh, yes, Cross, I remember you now. Ah, thank you, Inspector. You were with us once, weren't you? Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, there are times, Cross, when I wish I had the gumption to strike out on my own. Too late now, however. And there are times, Inspector, when I wish I'd stayed on here. However... Yes, to each his own, and the grass is always greener, and so on. Well, Sergeant Anderson said you wanted to show me something. Oh, yeah, this, sir. This Gladstone bag. Hmm. Looks perfectly normal. Locked, I see. Yes, if you look inside, Inspector, just uh, pry the two halves apart at one end, as I did. Yes, I see. Well, odd objects to have in a valise. Not if one had every intention of disposing of them, Inspector. Yeah, you're probably right about that. Seems like some silk or something. And badly stained. If I were a gambling man, I'd give ten to one the stains of blood, sir. And it wouldn't be much of a gamble. Any ideas on what the metal objects are? Well, I flashed my pen light in there, sir. One is a carving knife, and the other is a carpenter's saw. I see. How did you come into possession of this bag, sir? And Mrs. Hudson found the check for it in her husband's pocket. She says the cleaner found it. I doubt that. Divorce action, I assume. Correct, sir. I understand. Well, my suggestion is this. We'll give you another stub. Give it to Mrs. Hudson and have her place it in her husband's pocket. When he comes back for the bag, we'll have a man ready to pick him up. It seems to me this little matter bears further investigation. So simple, so quietly effective. Just place a check for baggage in a man's pocket. When he comes to claim his Gladstone bag. Yes, sir. Oh, here's my check. It's a brown Gladstone. Left it three days ago. Just a moment, sir. Sergeant Anderson, sir. Yes? It's the check you've been waiting for, that fellow there. Whistling. Thank you. Give him the bag. I'll speak to him. Yes, that's my bag. Oh, that'll be two and six, sir, for overtime storage. Oh, here we are. Thank you, sir. 
Glad to oblige. Uh, excuse me, sir. Are you James Hudson? That's right. Who are you? Uh, Sergeant Anderson, Scotland Yard. My credentials. If you'd be good enough to come with me. What for? Uh, Inspector Hendy would like to see you. He's waiting at the police station, just a block or two from the station here. Well, I've got my bag here. Couldn't it wait tomorrow, or...? Uh, that's all right, Mr. Hudson. I'll carry your bag. <laughs> room at the police station near Waterloo was very quiet. Inspector Henley sat behind a battered desk. On the desk rested the Gladstone bag, open now, and next to it a file, a familiar dossier from the criminal records office. We have your file, as you see, Hudson. I see. Step, burglary, five years for criminal assault. Does your wife know about these things, Hudson? No, she doesn't. I see. Hudson, how do you account for the contents of this bag? I, um... I was butchering half a steer for a friend of mine in the country. He has a deep freeze. Oh, that's rather thin, Hudson. Did you wear a silk dress size 10 to butcher the steer in? It was his wife's. I'm having it cleaned at a special place I know of. Yes, yes, of course. Better try again, Hudson. There was no answer. There were no further questions. Inspector Henley knew his man. Time ticked away. The clock was quite loud. For an hour, it ticked in silence. Finally, the perspiration beginning to bead his forehead. Jim Hudson began to talk. All right, Inspector. I'll tell you. I, I guess I lost my head when she flew at me. Oh, size 10 and she flew at you, Hudson. I told her we were through, that I was going back to my wife. She heaved the coal scuttle. Then it... It was at the beaches at Pevensey Bay on April 13th, sir. She grabbed the poker... I defended myself. We had a devil of a struggle. She fell, struck her head on the andiron. She was dead. I must have gone completely crazy. I, I went into town, but, but that knife and, and the saw, I was afraid to tell anyone. I mean, my record. And... Sergeant, I've got something here, Inspector, in this biscuit tin. Yes, you have. Neat packing job, I must say. <laughs> Not much left of the poor girl, is there? I want a check of every hardware store in the neighborhood where Hudson lives. Uh, oh, yes, near the railway station. Got that, Sergeant? I want the sales slip on those implements and the clerk who sold them, if possible. Yes, Inspector, I remember the incident perfectly. The fellow came in whistling, asked about the knives in the window. He bought one, then asked for a small saw. Here's the slip, sir. Well, this says April the 9th. Hudson claims he didn't buy these things until the 13th. It was the 9th, Inspector. I'll stake my life on that. <laughs> It's no good, Hudson. You bought that knife and that saw on Friday the 9th. You went to Pevensey Bay prepared to do exactly what you did do. If we ever had evidence of premeditation, we've got it now. You're under arrest, charged with willful murder. And I must warn you that anything you say may be used in evidence. Each clue in its place. The case was complete. Closed as tightly as that same Gladstone bag. Which can be found today in the Black Museum. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse full of souvenirs, where everyday objects, a skipping rope, a glass, an iron, a stepladder, all are touched by murder. Now you take this key. This was on the floor beside the body, sir. A door key. The kind that fits only one lock. But whose? Perhaps the murderer, sir. Today, this key can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear The Black Museum, starring 
Orson Welles. <laughs> Here we are in the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Here lies death, arranged neatly on the shelves and tables open to your view. Now here's a spoon. It's a simple household spoon. Our murderer was meticulous. With this, he measured out a careful dose of poison. That oar up there on the wall... That was used by the stroke of a famous rowing aid at Henley. Later it was used in anger, swung at a man who stood on the edge of a pier, stunning him. The man drowned in the Thames very quickly. Ah, here we are. Here's the key. An ordinary key. The kind used to open most of the front doors in London. Once this key was in the pocket of a man who was waiting for another in his room at the Kingsley Arms Hotel in Surrey. Regan? Oh, I... I'm sorry. Excuse me, sir. I'll, I'll just turn the bed down. Uh, certainly. I'm waiting for Mr. Regan. You don't happen to know what time he'll be back, do you? No, sir, but if you wait here, you're sure to catch him. Thanks, I will. I particularly want to see him. The conversation lapsed. The visitor sat down again. The maid completed her work and left, stealing a glance at the young man as she closed the door behind her. Night fell. Lights came on in the guest bedrooms. But in one room... The number on the door was 22. A man sat alone in the darkness, waiting. The night passed, and morning came. In the hotel, there were beds to be made, rooms to tidy. No answer from room 22. The maid was pleased her work could be accomplished without interruption. She was thinking of this as she opened the door. Stepped in. The bed was unused, turned down just as she'd left it. Sunlight was flooding through the two windows. And on the floor, a man lay dead. <coughs> the manager called the police. The police requested the assistance of Scotland Yard. And Inspector Sidney Russell and Detective Sergeant Hobbs were sent down to Surrey. This is the room, sir. Number 22. Has anyone been in there since the maid found the body? No one, Inspector, except myself and the local police sergeant. On his orders, I kept the room locked. Good, man. There you are. Thank you. I'll let you know when we need you, sir. The two detectives covered the room, and in their quick survey of the murder scene, they found several leads. His wallet, sir. Let's have a look at the identity card, Sergeant. There you are, sir. Hmm. Name's Thomas Regan. What else have you got there, Sergeant? Uh, roll a note, sir. The killer either missed that or the motive wasn't robbery. Oh, I don't think it was robbery, sir. His watch is still on his wrist. Going? No, sir. It stopped at 7.25. That might have been the time the murder took place, though on the other hand, the watch might have run down this morning. He was shot through the head, sir. Surely somebody must have heard that. You would think so. Well, here's a shell I found on the carpet. Hmm. Point 22. We'll keep this for ballistics. What else, Sergeant? Oh, some silver taken from his trouser pocket, a handkerchief with the initials, initials T.R. in the corner, and a cigarette lighter. With the initials T.R. Hmm. He's well labeled. And uh, this was on the floor beside the body, sir. The door key. The kind that fits only one lock. But whose? Perhaps the murderer, sir? Unless it belonged to Regan himself. Oh, it's not the kind they use in hotels. No. Was he wearing or carrying a keychain? No, sir. Then the key would have been carried in his pocket along with his money. Which hadn't been spilled onto the floor. You may be right, Sergeant. But to make absolutely sure, that key should be checked against every lock in Regan's home and his office and everywhere he might have occasion to visit. If it does not belong in any of those places, then it seems to me that when we find the door that key fits, we find the murderer. The detectives went downstairs to talk once more to the hotel manager. Inspector, this is a terrible business. Listen to those men in the bar. What about them? They're newspaper reporters. Oh, this is really dreadful. The notoriety, the reporters, the headlines. It'll ruin my business. It wasn't very nice for Mr. Regan, either. No, I, I suppose not, poor devil. 
What can you tell us about him? Only that he was a commercial traveler. He stayed here before? Oh, several times. A traveler, eh? Did he work for any firm in particular, would you happen to know? Yes, I do know, because they always paid the hotel bills. He worked for a London firm, Hardy and Sons Limited. Thank you, sir. I'll leave the room upstairs locked until we have it photographed and checked for fingerprints. Oh, Inspector, there's one other thing I'd better mention. I think it's important. Yes? A man called to see Mr. Regan last night. Did you get a good look at him? I didn't see him at all, nor did the desk clerk. The maid found him waiting in room 22 when she came in to turn the bed down. Unusual, isn't it? Knowing Regan's room number? It suggests an acquaintance. Not necessarily, Inspector. Why do you say that? We have a register here in the foyer. It's on that wall over there. A room register? Yes, just a card opposite the room number. Some people don't bother with it, but Mr. Regan always put his card up. So that made us the only one who saw this man? Yes, Inspector. Then I'd like to talk to her, sir. Oh, I'll go and get her for you. The hotel manager returned almost immediately with the maid. She was a young girl, very pale, her eyes still fearful from the sight she'd seen on the floor of room 22. Annie Mitchell, Inspector. How do you do, Annie? Uh, this is Inspector Russell from Scotland Yard. How do you do, sir? Annie, what time did you turn down the bed in room 22 last night? It was going on for six, sir. And I believe Mr. Regan was not in his room. No, sir, but there was a man there. Could you describe him to me? Well... He was tall, fairly young-looking, and dark hair. He spoke uh, educated-like. I see. What did he say? Just that he was waiting for Mr. Regan, and he particularly wanted to see him. Tell me, would you know this man if you saw him again? Yes, I think I would. The inspector was well satisfied, but Sergeant Hobbs, who had been questioning the guests, had not fared so well. Uh, now, sir, I'm sorry to trouble you, but I have to ask you a few questions. Uh, really, this is most annoying. I've been kept here all the morning, and it's extremely inconvenient. I quite understand, sir. Now, uh, can you tell me whether you heard any unusual noise or disturbance during the night? The only disturbance of which I'm aware is the disturbance created by the police this morning. You uh, didn't hear a shot, for instance? Certainly not. And you were in your room the whole evening? Yes. Can I go now? Yes, that'll be all. Uh, thank you very much. Well, it's certainly not been a pleasure. It seems nobody heard a shot last night, sir. Nobody at all. Not a single guest, even those occupying adjoining rooms. That's funny. Anyway, I'm leaving you in charge here. The police right, surgeon sir. will be arriving to carry out a post-mortem. All right, sir. Are you going back to London? Yes, I think the case winds up there. The next move is to London to check that key against every lock in Mr. Regan's home and his office just to see if it fits. I'm uh, really sorry to bother you, ma'am, but I'd like to go right over the house, if you don't mind, trying the locks, and uh, if there are any cases or cupboards, etc., that I might miss, I'd be very pleased if you'd point them out to me. I'll uh, come along to see if you can help me, sir, in connection with Mr. Regan. I want to know if there's any desk or a cupboard in his office... Uh, or the office door itself, which has a lock for which this might be the key. I believe you've uh, a lock-up garage here, formerly rented by Mr. Regan. It must, of course, have a lock, and I'd be glad if you'd allow me to compare the lock with this. No, sir. I've checked every conceivable place connected with Regan, and the answer's the same everywhere. The key does not belong. Mm. In that case, we have our answer. Somewhere, someplace, Sergeant, there is a door, and behind that door we'll find the murderer. You know, if I was a philosopher, I would say that it's rather symbolic that we have a key to which we must fit the lock. Still, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a detective, and it's our job, Sergeant to find the lock, to find the door, and to find the murderer. And that's just what we're going to do, Sergeant. We're going to find the door that this key fits. In time, they were to find the door. By patient, methodical methods, they came to the front door of a small flat. The key fitted. The same key that can be seen today in the Black Museum. 
In just a moment, we will continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Inspector Russell went back to London, certain that the crime had motive and that the motive would only be found by a search into the habits and associations of Thomas Regan. His first call was to the offices of Hardy and Sons Limited, where he was speedily ushered into the presence of the reigning Mr. Hardy. Come in, Inspector. Sit down. Thank you, sir. Shocking business. Now, who could have wanted to kill poor Regan? That's what we are trying to find out. Of course. Shocking. One of our best travelers. What do you know of his personal life, Mr. Hardy? I may be able to help you there, Inspector. I believe in taking an interest in my employees. I've uh, always encouraged them to bring their troubles to me. And Regan had troubles? Yes. He was a bachelor. Rather a gay one at times. I suspect he, uh, he was having trouble over a woman. Yes? A married woman. She kept on ringing up to speak to him. And the thing spread in the office. He was rather embarrassed and slightly worried about it all. Do you happen to know the woman's name, Mr. Hardy? I'm afraid I can't help you there, Inspector. Though, uh, wait a minute. Yes? He did mention something. That's right. I've got it now. Uh, he didn't want to tell me her name. Well, that's a pity. But in admitting she was married, he did tell me that her husband was a doctor on hospital duty. A doctor? Yes, and uh, one other thing I recollect... He mentioned her first name. It was Lindell. And I have information that the man we want to interview is young. That suggests a hospital in turn. Yes, with a wife named Lindell. Hmm. Not very much to go on, Inspector. It might be quite a help. He never told you, I suppose, whether it was a London hospital or not? He never said so, but I'm quite sure it would be. At least the wife lives in London. What makes you think that? Well, the number of telephone calls that woman made to Regan. Nobody could afford that many trunk line calls. So they began in London, St. Bartholomew's Hospital. An intern or a young doctor whose wife's name is Lindell. The registrars of the big hospitals consulted their records, made special inquiries. St. Thomas's, Westminster, Guy's. Each one of them returned to shake his head. There are several hundred hospitals in the London area. Big general hospitals, small private nursing homes, special hospitals, children's hospitals, maternity infectious orthopedic hospitals. At the first 42, they drew a blank. Then, at the London Royal Hospital at last. A young intern whose wife's name's Lindell. That's a funny one, Inspector. It's all the information we have, Doctor. It's useless to ask, I suppose, whether you might have this man on your staff. But we do have him. What? Well, at any rate, one of our interns has a wife named Lindell, Dr. Bowen. Dr. Felix Bowen. I'll send for him, shall I? No, wait, Doctor. Could you give me some idea what this Dr. Bowen looks like? Yes, I think so. He's he's young, 31, I, I think. Uh, quite tall, uh, dark hair. Would you have his address here in your records, Doctor? Certainly. I'll, I'll get it for you, Inspector. Thank you. And shall I send for Dr. Bowen? No, I don't want to see him just now. And I don't want it known that any queries have been made about him. Uh, very well, you can depend on me. Is he in some kind of trouble? Nothing to worry about just yet, sir. Now, if you'll get me that address... Patients had paid off. The 43rd Hospital. Now, to interview Lindell Bowen. Inspector Russell went to the address he'd been given a small flat in a good residential district. The lock on the door fascinated him. The urge to try out the key in his pocket was almost overwhelming. But instead, he knocked. Mrs. Byrne? Yes? I'm Inspector Russell from Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard? May I come in? Yes, of course. Thank you. She was young, an attractive woman, but her eyes were frightened. Mrs. Byrne, when did you last see Thomas Regan? Regan? Tom Thomas Regan? I think you know who I mean. But I don't, Inspector. I'm very sorry. Not at all, ma'am. Perhaps I'm mistaken. Well, of course, I've read about him in the papers. That is, if it's the same, Mr. Regan. It is the same. Mrs. Byrne, with your permission, I'd like to conduct a small experiment. Experiment? I, I don't understand, Inspector. It's quite simple. This key. Key? I'd like to try it in your front door. But... 
I... Of course, if you choose to say no, then I won't be able to try it. You won't? But I, I also ought to warn you that I can return in a very short time with a warrant. All right. Try it. Thank you, Mrs. Byrne. I'll just open the door and insert the key. <gasps> the key turned effortlessly and easily. Hope died in the woman's eyes. The inspector from the yard took out the key and closed the door again. And now, Mrs. Byrne, you and I are going to have a talk about Thomas Regan. That afternoon, several significant events took place. A gun was found beneath a pile of medical books. It was taken to Scotland Yard to the ballistics expert there. A gun check, sir. That's a murder weapon, right enough. Little wonder nobody heard the shot in the hotel. It's fitted with a silencer. A silencer. Evidence of premeditation. Late that afternoon, the record of its purchase was uncovered. The second significant event. The gun was bought at a shop in the Soho district, sir. A second-hand shop two weeks ago. By whom, Sergeant? The description covers Dr. Felix Bowen. And the proprietor says he could recognize the man if he saw him again. We'll give him that chance. Come on. Where to, sir? The hospital. To pick up Bowen. The third event was Bowen's flight across London. Somehow, in some way, the doctor learned of the net that was closing about him and made a run for it. He was gone when the detectives reached the London Royal Hospital. They drove to his home, but he wasn't there. Now across England, the vast network of police communications went into action. The teletype carried the news of the fugitive. Central to all stations. General alarm for one, Dr. Felix Byrne, age about 31. Six feet tall, dark hair. Educated voice, quietly spoken. Wanted on suspicion of murder. The search was on. In a thousand stations, vigilant eyes searched for Bowen. On the streets, on trains and buses, in restaurants and hotels. Within 24 hours, he was picked up. I, I really must insist. This is a terrible mistake. I really don't know what, what this is about. Uh, and I'm sure you've got nothing to worry about, sir. Uh, just answer a few questions, that's all. Well, of course, I'm perfectly prepared to cooperate with the law. But I must insist on an explanation at once. Yes, yes, of course, sir. You see, unfortunately, your appearance coincides with the description of a man wanted by the police. It's oh? uh, just a routine matter, sir. Uh, if you'll give me some proof of your identity, we can clear the matter up in a few minutes. But I explained to the constable. It, it's no longer compulsory to carry an identity card. Yes, I know that, sir. But before we release you, we must have proof of your identity. Yes, but how can I... Uh, you see, sir, we must be sure you're not the wanted man. But I told you already... Uh, that... Now, Mr. Bowen. Yes? Yes. Dr. Bowen. Inspector Russell. This is Sergeant Thompson, sir. I it. We've picked up a man who we believe is Dr. Felix Bowen. Hold him, Thompson. I'll be there in a matter of minutes. It was Bowen right enough. But if Inspector Russell hoped for an easy confession, he was disappointed. The doctor was defiant and tight-lipped. I know nothing, I tell you. Nothing whatever. This whole thing is an outrage. I must remind you, sir, that your wife has made certain admissions. My wife? What has she told you? That she and Regan were having a love affair. That you found out. And the day before last, you went down to Surrey to see Regan. You returned late that night. Did I? And under a pile of medical books in your bookcase, we found the gun you used. The game's up, Byrne. The game is never up, Inspector. Until it's lost. The evidence they had accumulated was impressive. But juries are cautious, and defense counsels are often very smart. There had to be no loopholes. There had to be complete corroborating evidence. I think we've got our man all right. The next thing is to prove it beyond all shadow of doubt. What's the uh, next move then, sir? Well, Sergeant, there's one person who got more than a passing glimpse of the murderer. Oh, you mean Annie, the maid at the hotel. Right. 
We'll see how Mr. Byrne fares on our identification parade. I have a feeling he won't fare too well. Now, Annie, I expect you've heard of an identification parade. Yes, sir. Like they have on the films. That's right, Annie, but this is not a film. This is the real thing. Before we go into the next room, I want to impress on you how important it is that you make no mistake. A man's life may depend on your judgment. So when you answer me, make sure, absolutely sure, beyond any shadow of doubt, the man you identify is the man you saw on the night of the murder. Yes, sir. Right, then. Now, in the next room, there are eight men. I want you to follow me into the room, take a good look at each of them, and see if you can pick out from amongst them the man you saw in room 22 waiting for Mr. Regan. Very well, sir. It's not the first gentleman. Nor the second. But this is the man, sir. That's a lie. Yes, and that's his voice. I'd know it anywhere. This is the man, Inspector. Well, Mr. Byrne, would you like to make a statement to us now? I have nothing to say, except that I doubt that the evidence of a silly maid is likely to give you a conviction, Inspector, whatever you may think. We're depending on more than that, Mr. Byrne. There are other witnesses, including a silent witness, a door key. That was careless of you, Mr. Byrne. Very careless indeed. Bourne was identified also by the owner of the second-hand shop as being the man who had bought the gun some two weeks before. With that, the case was complete. A door key had helped to find a murderer. And that self-same key can be seen today in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. Bowen killed the man who had stolen the affections of his wife. His was not a clever crime. It was premeditated, without a doubt, but clumsily conceived. For the young doctor was no student of the art of murder. Yet he might have escaped justice had not a key fallen from his pocket. A key which ultimately brought the police to his front door. And now, until we meet next time in the same place, and I tell you another story about the Black Museum... I remain, as always, obediently yours. The Black Museum, starring Austin Wells, is presented by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Radio Attraction. The program is written by Creswick Jenkinson, with music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum. A museum of death. Yes, here in the grim stone structure on the Thames which houses Scotland Yard is a warehouse of homicide where everyday objects, a fountain pen, a cufflink, a high-heeled shoe, all are touched by murder. Now here's a scarf, torn and ragged, the faded tartan, a cheap reproduction of the honorable colors of the Stuarts, red with green blue crossings and a double over check of white and yellow. This scarf belonged to Walter Hoffman Piewski, known to the police and his friends in the underworld as the Pike. There's no doubt about this scarf being his property, Superintendent. He was wearing it when he was sent to Dartmoor ten years ago. Ah, the description tallies, does it? Exactly. It's all written down in the prison property book, even to the patch on it. Hmm. So the Pike's our man. Right. Well, get him. And get him they did. And all because of a scarf, appropriately known in Cockney circles as a choker. The Pike applied his choker to a human throat. The throat of the driver of a post office van. The Pike pulled the choker too hard. It was instrumental in convicting him of murder. And that's why it's earned its place here. 
in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Well, here we are in The Black Museum. Beyond these gray walls, the mighty roar of London never stops. But in here, it's quiet. Come with me under the freeze of death masks. The masks of criminals of bygone days, suspended grimly under the ceiling. Come. To our right and left, rows of murder exhibits, each one carefully labeled. That cut glass scent spray, it's attractive even now. Might even take its place on Madame's dressing table, till we stop and read the label written under it. Perhaps it's been used to spray anesthetic over the faces of helpless women. The prelude to murder. No sickly aroma now, as we squeeze the bulb. Except for its grim associations, the fragile exhibit is insignificant, easily broken. But it was strong enough to hang the man who used it. There, has a brass candlestick. Over there, a taper to go with it. Ah, here we are. Here's what we're looking for. The faded tartan scarf. As I take it out of the showcase, I ask you to come with me back to the time when this scarf was new, 15 years ago. Walter Pevsky bought it from a stallholder in one of London's famous street markets, Petticoat Lane. Yes, sir. I'll take one of the scarves, mister. Right, sir! Fine East Worcester Wellwen! What's your clan? Campbell's, Cameron's, MacDonald or MacLeod! All genuine tartan today down from the islands! All right, all right. I've bought it already. You don't need to give me that stuff. I'll take this one. It's the Stuart! And better than that you cannot do! Not half a nicker! Not five bob! Half a crown and cheap at the price! Thank you very much. Come and get your Scotch chapters from Honest John Mackay. If your next war... While Honest war John ever. continued his honest trade, the pike went about his own particular business. It was less exhausting than John's, and it was worked from a public call box. In professional circles, they called it the hospital trick. Is that Mrs. Peterson speaking? Yes, who's that? The London Hospital here, Mrs. Peterson. Hospital? Why, what's happened? Well, there's no need for immediate alarm, but I'm sorry to say that your husband has met with a serious accident. Oh, Bill? Is he hurt? Oh, no, what's happened? He was knocked down by a bus in the Whitechapel Road about half an hour ago. A mean, crude trick. But more often than not, it worked. While the stricken woman hurried to the hospital to find the husband, who, of course, was not hurt at all, the pike would visit her house. With the coast clear, he'd help himself to whatever he could lay his hands on and get out before the bewildered woman returned. And you notice that the pike could almost camouflage that accent he had. This gift gave him a confidence which was almost his undoing. One time when he and some friends were removing the entire contents of a house while the owners were away on holiday. What about the piano pike? Do we take that? Of course we take everything. Who'd think of moving out and leaving the piano behind, eh? <laughs> <laughs> You'll get as blue people like you, Will. Okay, boys, piano next. Oh, crikey, the phone. Here, what do we do about that? Let it ring, I suppose. No. Maybe someone's seen the van outside and checking up. I'd better answer it. Yeah, yeah, go easy, Don't Park. worry, Ed. I know my job, don't I? Oh, yeah. Hello? Is that Mr. Wilson? No, I'm awfully sorry. He won't be back until about seven o'clock. I'm his brother-in-law. Can oh, I help you? if your sister's there... Oh, Julie's just gone out for half an hour. Can I take a message? Yes, I think you can. I'm her brother. Who the blazes are you? Quick, boys. Let's get out of here. Right out. So the piano was left behind after all. But Pike got away with most of the household belongings and observed... Not only were his operations becoming bolder, but he had planned his action carefully. He even knew that Mrs. Wilson's first name was Julie. But he didn't know she had a brother. That must have shaken him, because from then on he changed his tactics. The pike entered the motor racket. 
a racket which was to take him in turn from Dartmoor prison to the scaffold. But in his early days as a motor thief, there was still a trace of strange humour about his work. The padlock car was a case in point. Who's that? Okay, Eddie, you tell me me. <laughs> you wouldn't go reaching for a gun when Parky walks in on you. Oh, Would you? I'm sorry, Parky, it's me nerves. Well, relax. Now, listen to me, I've got a job for you. No, nah, no, nah, I'm laying off for a bit. Okay, well, who pays the rent? Oh, I'm only going in for the small stuff. Well, this is a small job I'm offering you. Uh. What is it, busting into the Bank of England, eh? <laughs> no, no, It's a simple matter of knocking off a nice new motor. Ah, uh, well, what's the dope? Well, it's this way. The car belongs to a fellow named Lambert who lives at 14 Graysdyke Crescent. See? He can't get it into the garage beside the house on account of it being too big. Why didn't the mug measure it before he bought it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not our concern. He locks the car up at night, and I've obtained a duplicate set of keys. Oh, nice work, nice yeah. work. Yeah, what do you want me in on the job for? You can do it yourself. Oh, there is a little complication. Oh, I thought there would be. This fellow Lambert is like a mother with a child over this car. He fixes it to a lamppost every night with two big padlocks and a double chain. Wonder he doesn't put a nappy on it. Too. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do we do? Take the lamppost as well as the car? Well, before I tell you, are you in with me? All right, Pike, I'm in. Then listen to what I tell you. In the early hours of the following morning, the pike and his assistant went along to Graysdyke Crescent, and there, sure enough, chained to the lamppost outside number 14, was a fine new motor car, its cellulose and chromium work glinting invitingly under the lamplight. Special, Eddie, eh? What did I tell you? We can clean up 450 on this, and all we've got to do is to remove the back wheel which is chained to the lamppost. <sighs> we put on the spare and we're away. Okay, pike. Let's get cracking. The offending wheel was removed from the axle and left, still chained, to the lamppost. And by the light of the helpful rays from above, the spare wheel was bolted on, the tools were replaced in the boot, and the two men climbed into the car. I hope that ignition key of yours works, Pike. Of course it works. I tried it out last night. Ah, good for you. And here we go. <laughs> I told you it was going to be easy, didn't I, Ed? <laughs> <laughs> it's money for old Roper. <laughs> ah, you're a good as you are, my dear. Uh, uh, just let me know when you need any more help. I'm your man. Walter Piewski pulled his tartan scarf snugly around his throat and agreed that he would certainly keep his assistant in mind. The car itself was taken to a garage where its numbers and appearance were carefully changed and, in due course, found its way by devious routes back to the open market. The pike, of course, had to split the profits which hurt him, so on his next job, he decided to work alone. And it was the next job which put him on the long, long walk which was to finish on the scaffold. Now, what's the number of that gouge? Ah, here it is, I've got it. Now, this works, Park, my lad. You're in the money. But it all depends on how good I can sound on the phone. Ah, I copied my father's voice, thrust his soul. Here we go. Hello? Uh, Brins? Yes, sir. Can I help you? Uh, my name is Maurice Bluet of 17 Grandford Court. Oh, yes, sir. I know. The big block of flats in uh, Collerton Drive. Uh, that's right. I am staying here with a friend, uh, Major General Lewis. Oh, yes, sir. He tells me that you have a new Rolls Coupe in your showroom. Yes, sir. Indeed we have. Yes. Well, I'm anxious to take such a car back to the continent with me, but... Time is pressing. Are and, uh, you at 17 Grandford Court now, sir? Yes, if someone could bring round the car, I, I should like to see it. All right, I'll, I'll be with you in a quarter of an hour, sir. Are you sure that is not too much trouble? Oh, no trouble at all, sir. Thank you very much for ringing. Thank you. I should be waiting for you. Fifteen minutes later, the car drove up to the block of flats. The driver salesman got out and went inside. Entering the lift, he went up to the third floor and knocked on the door of number 17. Needless to say, the occupier had never heard of either Maurice Bluett or Major General Lewis. But while the questions and explanations sorted themselves out, Walter Piewski was already driving the luxury car toward the garage where practiced hands were waiting to completely change its identity. First, what the Pike did not know 
was that he had provided the police with a vital clue that was to lead him first to prison and then, by reason of the tartan scarf, to the gallows. But the scarf was yet to earn its place, of course, among these strange exhibits here in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. We return to Walter Piewski, known as the Pike, elated at the success of his confidence car trick. He made a handsome profit on the rolls, and despite the fact that the police subsequently traced it, they never traced the theft back to the pike, not until he tried the same operation again. Certainly he changed the district, but, as is so often the case with a regular criminal, he develops regular habits, and the routine served up to the local garage was almost exactly as before. Yes, I'm staying with Sir Leslie, and he tells me you've got that straight eight in the showroom. I'm most anxious to take a car back to the continent with me, but... Time is pressing, and oh, you see... Are you to bring the car around to you right away, sir, if that's convenient? If you're sure that it's not too much trouble. No trouble at all, sir. I'll be with you in ten minutes. Oh, that is most kind. Thank you. Excellent. But you wouldn't think it was so excellent from your point of view if you knew what was happening at the garage, Pike. Hello? Give me the police. Is that Scotland Yard? Yes, information room. Listen, my name is Slater. I run a garage, uh, Carlsbrook Street, North 1. Yes, sir. A few weeks ago, the local police warned me about a car thief who worked a telephone trick, asking salesmen to take cars round to fake addresses for inspection. He just and... rung you, has he, Mr. Slater? Yeah. It might be him, or it might be genuine. But he asked me to take a car round to 21, Goldston Court, Cadimar Street. On the advice of Scotland Yard, Mr. Slater took the car to Goldston Court. To make it easier for the thief, he left the doors unlocked and went into the building. When he was safely inside... The pike left his telephone box and walked smartly over to the waiting motor. There were just two things he didn't know. First, an ignition wire had been snipped. And second, he was being watched. She'll never start until that broken wire is mended, pike. You're wasting your time. You're going to waste a lot more time, too. Seven years, to be exact. Hello, sir. You're having a bit of starting trouble. Oh, hello, officer. Uh, yes, I, I don't know what's happened here. I'm used to this sort of thing, so is the other constable here. Oh, there's two of you. There's a lot more at the end of the road. Suppose you hop out of that and let us see whether we can't get the car going for you. No, I can manage. All the same, you might let us have a go for you. Okay. That's the idea. Now, you the owner of this car. Hold him, George. He's got a knuckle there, sir. Let me go, you... You swamp! No, you don't... Oh, don't! Put the bracelets on him, quick! You all right, 71? Oh, well, how is he? Looks as if his jaw's broken, Inspector. Right, take this man to the station. What's his name? I'm talking. Very well. I'm charging you with grievous bodily harm and resisting arrest for the attempted theft of this vehicle. There may be further charges. There were further charges, including the theft of the big rolls. Walter Piewski, alias the Pike, had played the same game once too often in a search of his flat in the East End, produced more evidence of his varied career in crime. The policeman waiting for him to make his first mistake. This time he'd done it. At the Old Bailey, pleaded guilty to over a hundred crimes, and there were hundreds more with which he was never charged. He was sent to prison for seven years, and immediately on his reception, his personal belongings were entered in the property book, and he was wearing the tartan scarf which later was to hang him. Subiet, grey, seven and a half, collar, sixteen, brown, one scarf, red background, green and blue stripes, white and yellow overcheck. <laughs> a can steward. Oh, how do you know that, Pewski? The fellow I bought it from in Petticoat Lane, told ah, me. Take his word for it. Oh, there's a small tear, five inches in one corner. Been roughly patched. Yeah, better put that down. Don't worry, boys. I won't accuse you of doing it. Don't you worry. Up. I'll be retired by then. One pair leather gloves, size eight. One pair black socks, ten. Brown shoes, neat. The tartan scarf had been duly entered, and little did the retiring prison officer dream that his hastily scribbled details were to be subsequently brought up as key evidence in a murder trial. 
But Pievsky signed the list of his personal property, and for the next seven years he was a guest of His Majesty's government in the most famous prison in England, Dartmoor. But in 1946, justice had run its course. The pike was given back his personal property, which included the tartan scarf, of course, all duly signed for. And so he was released upon a battle-scarred London. Time passed. And he added to his lawful wages by meagre pickings from the black market. And more time passed, until one day the inspiration came to him like a bolt from the blue. He mulled it over in his mind. He carried out the research, and not until the plants were cut and dry did he put Ed Javison in the picture. This is going to be the clean-up, Eddie. Yeah, what is it, Pike? We're going to stick up a post office van, see? Uh, a post office van? Shh. I've been standing in for a chap selling papers right outside a big post office in the West End. Every night I watch the mailbags coming out and going into the vans around six o'clock. Huh? And the other night I hired a car and followed one. It cut through Braston Mews to Park Lane. Yeah, did you say you hired a car? Yes, what about it? Uh, uh, never mind. Uh, go on. Well, I had it out three nights and I found the vans don't change their route. It's the Mews every time. Cuts off a bit of traffic, you see. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, go on. Now, the Mews are very dark. Badly bombed and no residents that I could see. Yeah, I'll get it, yeah. All we have to do is get a fast car and wait there until the last van comes through. Yeah, how many are there? Only two. We draw our car out on the path of the second one, as if we were going to back into the garage, see? Yeah. The van stops. Yeah. We fix the two men in it, fill up our car from the back, and bring the stuff back here to sort. To sort? <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> yes, yes. Here we can bring it through the back way. When do we do it? Well, I think our most profitable haul will be tonight, Friday. Well, what about a car? Oh, you can leave that to me. And Walter Piewski ran through to four. He wanted a fast car in a hurry. He applied the methods he knew. He worked the telephone trick on a young and trusting motor salesman who duly delivered a shining, high-powered limousine to a block of flats. As he disappeared into the entrance, full of expectation, the pike drove off rapidly to Braston Mews, where his partner was waiting for him. The timing was perfect. As the car stopped, the first post office van was already approaching. Here, keep your head down, mate. Here it comes. The second one won't be more than a minute or so behind. We must turn the car broadside onto it. How did you get this batter? I'll tell you later. It's hand picked, see? <laughs> Plenty of room in the back for the luggage. There we are. Nothing can get by now. What happens if something tries to get through before the van arrives? Well, we make way for it and come back another night if necessary. Here, yeah, what's this? It's the van. We're going to be all right. Yeah, nobody about. Couldn't be better. Now, get out. Yeah? Keep your chin tucked into your scarf like me. Oh, no. Pretend to be pushing the car. All right. What's up, Comte? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Afraid so. Oh, yes. yeah. Could, could oh. you give us a push? Hey. Sorry, it mustn't leave the van. Oh. Well, look, in that case, I wonder if you'd like to earn yourselves ten bob, eh? If you could ring this number for us when you get to your own destination, it's it's my garage. I'd like him to send a breakdown for you, eh? That's the idea. Oh, don't mind doing that for you. I'll do it for nothing. Oh, thanks, Sam. You're very kind. If you got a pencil, I'll, I'll jot down my name. It's rather a difficult one. Yeah, here's a pencil. Oh! Help! Dirty <laughs> thieves! Oh! That's got the both of them. We'll start getting the bags out quick. No, you don't. I'll set you up, you snivelling idiot. I'm choking. This skull's choking me. Here, quick with the bags, Ed. Oh, no, here they come. I'm going. You'll swing for the... Start getting the stuff in the car. Okay. All right, right. Right there. Oh, I think that's about as much as we can take. Here. Oh, what's happened to the driver? Oh, don't worry about him. Get moving. Here. Here, look at his tongue. His eyes. You've killed him. Stop talking. Get on with the job. There's a car coming. They've got us in their headlights. It's the cops. Well, let's get out of here. Oh, tight on the corner. Keep going. They're after us. Oh, watch the traffic lights. They're red. Something's coming. Oh, I got through. Oh, I thought we'd had it. Oh, by the police cars hold up by the other car. But get away. I'm going to make it. What's the man? Slow up, we can't get down! Ed 
Javison died in that crash, so mutilated that his body could not be identified. By some miracle, the pike escaped and staggered away into the shadows, but his tartan scarf was still round the throat of his victim, lying in the mews. Now let Superintendent Brandruth take up the story of the hunt. Well, the hunt was soon over. In fact, as soon as the car was reported stolen, I had a call from one of my inspectors. I thought you'd like to see this. What is it, Harrison? A oh, stolen car. Hmm? Well? Well, I've checked with criminal records, sir. There was something familiar about the method, you know, calling up a garage and getting the salesman to deliver the car to a block of flats. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the list of men who practice that. Now, these two are inside at present. Yes. This one is going straight. Well, he's out of London anyway. Mm, that leaves this one, Walter Pievsky. Yes, sir. The Pike. No way to find him? And he's sharing a place with a man named Javison in the East End. Right. Bring him in. Yes, sir. But before the Pike was picked up for questioning about the car, his scarf was... Recognizes the one which we believe Piesky had stolen. In theory, the evidence against him was already piling up. If he was the car thief, he was probably the murderer as well. But I needed that extra piece of evidence. I called for everything that was known about him, including the list of his personal property which he had signed in prison. It was a shot in the dark, but it yielded results. There's no doubt about the scarf being his property, Superintendent, even to the patch on it. Within 24 hours, the pike was caught. Still dazed by the car crash, he offered no resistance. In due course, he was convicted of the murder of William Price, the driver of the post office van. And at eight o'clock, one cold morning in February, he was hanged. All because of this tartan scarf, which has earned its place today in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. Under English law, there are no degrees of murder, and the death sentence has to be pronounced on a man or woman convicted of the crime. Recommendations to mercy by the jury are always carefully considered. But in the case of Walter H. Piefsky, no such recommendation was made. The evidence against him was unshakable, and on the eve of his execution he reproached himself bitterly, not for the death of his victim, or even his unfortunate partner, but for two other reasons. The supreme crime of murder had brought him no profit, and as his last hour approached, he became increasingly angry at his own forgetfulness. Ah, oh, yes, they usually overlook something. And that's why the faded piece of tartan has earned its place here among the other exhibits in the Black Museum. Now, until we meet again in the same place, for another story about the Black Museum, I remain, as always, obediently yours. The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles, is presented by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Radio Attraction, with original music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum. The famous repository of death. Here, in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide, where everyday objects, an earthenware pot, a silver shilling, a typewriter ribbon, all are touched by murder. Four small bottles. Other familiar objects, medicine bottles, shining glass, cork stoppered, the labels in neat, clear handwriting. Such bottles are in the medicine cabinet of almost every home. But these were found... I found one, Inspector. Two ounces. The others can't be far. Yes, here are two more. One ounce capacity, these. And here's the fourth. Innocent little things, aren't they, sir? Well, today, those four small bottles have a place, a very honored place. 
in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. And here we are, Black Museum. Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Yes, here lies death. In these hundreds and hundreds of objects, large and small, is the means to death, a thousand methods of killing, all neatly labeled to indicate who and what and where and when. Here's a kitchen mop, long handle, it's gray with use, gray where the red brown stain fails to cover the grayness. Look closely at the harsh metal binds the strings of this utensil. Yes, this blade struck and struck again before the mop itself removed the traces of the crime. Ah, here we are. Here's four small bottles. Three of one ounce capacity. One holds two ounces. They mark a strange story. A story out of the Edwardian era when man was still lord of all he surveyed and women were just beginning to demand equality. To the ladies, Reverend. Although I would prefer toasting them in something slightly stronger than tea. To the ladies, my friend. And to listen to my husband, Reverend, to think he was old fashioned. And not an advanced thinker for this age. I, an advanced thinker? Why, Anne? My <laughs> but dear. you are, Oscar. You really are. But the risk of shocking you, Reverend, but then you're a young man, and not, I assume, as easily shocked as some past is unknown. I believe a man should have two wives. <laughs> really, sir? He means it, Reverend. Listen to him. I believe a man needs two wives one to cook, sew, and care for the household. The other, to be a companion when a man needs intellectual stimulation, to lend beauty to the drawing room, and grace and wit. Then you would give the latter education. Exactly. And uh, since I am not allowed two wives, I chose the latter. You're new here, Reverend. You, you don't know that I married Anne when she was very young and sent her to Brussels and then a French university for her education before installing her here as my wife. Why... Why, that's unheard of, sir. You are a pioneer in the field. Oh, yes, Mr. Oscar Stone, wholesale grocer and a man of means, was truly advanced for his age, the age of 99, and very liberal in his philosophies. In fact, he was so considerate of his wife and of the difference between her age and his own that he encouraged rather than looked askance at her companionship with the Reverend Edgar Sweet, a much, much younger man than Mr. Stone himself. Edgar... You've been a good friend to me these past months. I'm happy to hear you say so, Anne. That is why, well, I'm not hesitating to tell you something which I feel is rather unfair. Tell me what it is. Oscar has drawn his will. Oh, he's my friend, my good friend. I'd hate to see him pass on, but every man must have his house in order. Edgar, you don't understand. Making the will is all right. It, it's what he's put in it. Go on, my dear. He has left me his entire estate, provided I never marry again. That is his right, you know. It's not his right. He's afraid someone might marry me after he's gone. For the money. He's only protecting you from fortune, Hunter's Anne. Then why did he give me an education if he doesn't think enough of me to let me protect myself? A serpent in Eden? Perhaps... Perhaps not. But it is clear that the young lady had a will of her own and wanted to control her own destiny. In any case, the friendship ripened, not only between the two young people, but between Edgar and Oscar as well. Edgar, my friend, I'm not well. I, I saw a doctor today and I am not well. I can't believe it. You look fine. Fine. The debilitation of age. But you're not old. Well, 55 isn't old. When you worked as hard as I have for almost 50 of those 55 years. Well, in any case, I've decided to take a rest. Excellent, Oscar. That's what you need. An extended vacation. I've made arrangements to go to the shore. A month at the sea or to practically, well, <laughs> rejuvenate me. <laughs> I'll miss you. Our talks have been a great stimulus to my work. And I thought that... Well, even pastors have vacations occasionally. <laughs> occasionally we do. Of course. So I reserved accommodations for you, along with Anna myself. 
But I can't possibly afford... As my guest. You, you don't know how much I appreciate this, Oscar, but I couldn't accept this. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were alone, Oscar. I'm glad you came in, Andy. I was telling Edgar we're going to the shore for a month. Oh, Oscar, how nice. I'm insisting that Edgar come along as my guest. How can I accept such an invitation? Tell him you will find him as welcome as I will, Anne. Of course I'll find him welcome, Oscar. Edgar knows that. They compromised. Edgar came for weekends. The ripening of a friendship. Or the growth of a triangle. A classic triangle. Husband, wife, and the young man. <laughs> The summer ended. Oscar and Anne returned to new lodgings in Pimlico, and they took an additional room. Edgar, you like it? Bookcases, a couch, a fine desk, all this room. How could I help liking it? And in here, right next door. Edgar, my boy, welcome to your new lodgings. Now, we are not only friends, we are neighbors. Really, Oscar, I don't know why you... But there was more, and rather interesting. One afternoon, while Oscar was at his doctor's office. May I disturb you for a moment, Edgar? Oh, of course, Anne. What is it? Remember, months ago, I told you about Oscar's will. Uh, oh, yes, I remember. Why? He took out that awful clause. If I want to, I can marry anyone I please one day. And you were the executor. Everything was quite smooth. Quite, quite smooth. In fact, Oscar began to feel quite a bit better. At least he said so and insisted that Edgar and Anne accompany him to a horse show. Why do you love horses so, Oscar? Perhaps because I always wanted to ride and never learned. Oh, there's a fine animal. He must be at least 16 hands high. Edgar, why don't you take Anne to the stalls to see her favorites? I'll just sit here a while. I, I guess I'm not as strong as I thought I was. Will you, Edgar, please? You think you'll be all right here alone, Oscar? It's a picture, isn't it? The elderly husband sitting on the bench watching the two young people stroll away. What are his thoughts as he sees them disappear in the crowd? What would his thoughts have been if he'd heard their conversation? I'm dreadfully worried about Oscar. He seems much better. Seashore did him good. Seems is the word. He's not. Not really. Anne, what are you telling me? That his doctor has confided to me. Oscar may not live out the year. The next morning, there were signs that Anne's words might become the truth. She sent for the doctor, a youngish man named Richards, who lived some half a mile from the lodgings. I don't like this, Mrs. Stone, not at all. Oh, oh dear. You stop frightening my wife, young man. Well, the truth, sir, is the truth. You're not well. Your stomach's in very bad shape. Now I shall prescribe for you, and your wife will see that you take your medicine, won't you, Mrs. Stone? Oh, of course, doctor. The young doctor was very certain, but not Oscar. His pain continued. Anne was obviously very upset. She took Edgar aside. Edgar, I want you to do something for me. If I can. I cannot see Oscar suffer the way he does at times. I know a way to ease his pain, but I need your help. Of course. I want you to buy him some chloroform. Chloroform? Yes. A few drops on a handkerchief, and he will sleep easily. I learned about it in the practical nursing classes in Brussels. But... Dr. Richards will get you some. No. He'll never believe I know how to use it. Here's a pound note. Please, Edgar. Edgar went to the nearest chemist shop. What can I do for you, Reverend? I'd like a little chloroform. Whatever for, sir? I... I understand it's good for taking out grease spots. Oh, yes, I suppose it is. But be very careful with it, sir. Three more times, Edgar walked into chemist's shops and bought a small amount of chloroform. There are the three one-ounce bottles and the one two-ounce bottle. Out of consideration for Anne's convenience, no doubt, Edgar poured the contents of all the small bottles into a larger one and delivered the chloroform to Anne. Quite suddenly, Oscar became a whole lot better. Landlord, I want to speak with the landlord. 
Yes, Mrs. Stone? How can I help you? I want to prepare a surprise for my wife and the Reverend for tonight. Uh, yes, sir. A New Year's Eve party. Some roast duck, a bit of cold ham, uh, some good cheese, a bottle of champagne, and a bottle of good brandy. It's short notice, Mr. Stone. But I'll do my best. What'll you be eating? What every, everyone else eats. <laughs> and will they be surprised? Oh, I'm feeling wonderful for the first time in months. And uh, for breakfast tomorrow, see if your maid can find a haddock, a large one. Oh, I feel I shall be quite hungry in the morning. Oscar wasn't hungry New Year's morning. Oscar was dead. And today... The four small bottles which played so large a part in his death can be seen in the Black Museum. It is a sad New Year's Day for Anne Stone and a bewildering day for the Reverend Edgar Sweet. Oscar Stone, husband and friend, lay dead quite suddenly and after what seemed an indicated quick recovery. But that was only the first event of January 1st, 1910. Onto the scene strolled an old man Oscar's 75-year-old father. I met him at the door to the stone apartment. Oh, oh, father. Father. Yes, yes, of course. So cry all you want. I want to see my son. He, he's in here, father. All right. Who, who is this? Reverend Sweet, our, our good friend and pastor. Oh, yes, yes, I heard about you. Oscar wrote me. This moment comes to all of us, sir. We can only pray for courage. I've got courage. What I want is facts. I, I'll see my boy now. Uh, mm, it looks as if he died in his sleep. He did. So peacefully. I, I didn't realize it until morning. You were a good boy, Oscar. I shouldn't be outliving you. Huh? It's a funny smell around his mouth. The, the doctor said he had gastritis, Father. That's not what I smell. Are you having a post-mortem? Dr. Richards asked for permission to do one. Uh, Richards? Who's he? The family doctor, Mr. Stone, a fine young man. All right, if he wants to do it, all right. But I want my man there with him. Father, are you insinuating... I'm not that... insinuating anything. I just don't like the look of this. For his own protection, this Richards ought to have another man present. That's all. My boys know right. The second doctor arrived, and forthwith, behind locked doors, the autopsy was performed. In the landlord's parlor, Anne waited with Edgar to give her support and courage. Presently, the door opened. Mrs. Stone. Yes, Dr. Richards. We are ready with our report. Did... did you find out anything? We are not certain as yet. Dr. Fletcher, your father-in-law's man, suggests Mr. Stone swallowed chloroform. Chloroform? Yes. Will you come upstairs and hear the report, please? Anne? Yes? Did you... Uh, the chloroform I bought for you, that is... A... It's still in its bottle, Edgar. Don't worry, you don't even have to mention it. Shall we go upstairs now? The two young people went upstairs, but not hand in hand. There was a sudden reserve between them. In the room where the doctors nor Mr. Stone awaited them. This is Dr. Fletcher, my daughter-in-law. Pastor Sweet. How, how do you do? Was Dr. Richards was in charge of the case? Perhaps he's the one to give you our official report. Oh, please do, Dr. Richards. It's a simple report. We are unable to find any natural cause of death. The contents of the stomach are suspicious. We're holding them for the coroner. <gasps> oh. Have you any particular suspicions, gentlemen? None which we care to state officially. You realize the room where death occurred must be sealed and its contents must not be touched. Oh, my, my purse is in there. It'll have to stay there. Oh, surely I may have my coat and, and, and a hat. I assume so. If Dr. Fletcher's present when you remove them. Anne went to stay with a cousin, a brief train journey away. The coroner's inquest was held and adjourned, pending a full report from a government analyst. That was all. But Edgar dispatched a note to Anne, and she met him as he requested in a quiet tea room in Pimlico. Edgar, what's the matter with you? You haven't looked me straight in the eye since we met today. I can't seem to help myself. Anne, Dr. Richards did tell you that Oscar might not live out the year. Of course he did. It came so suddenly. They won't behave so strangely. And I'm afraid I'm finished. If this...
develops into anything, I shall lose my pulpit. If you don't do anything foolish, I certainly won't. Uh, everything's going wrong. I, I feel as if... Anne, I bought that chloroform. If there is chloroform in the autopsy report... Anne, don't you see? Oh, forget the chloroform. Forget all about it. I can't. Where is it? What did you do with it? I took it with me when I left the apartment. Right in my coat pocket, under the nose of my dear father-in-law. I poured it out of the train window. Then I threw the bottle away. Oh, that makes it worse. If they prove that Oscar was... But don't you see? Don't trace the chloroform to me. In other words, Edgar, you're implying that I gave it to Oscar. I'm not implying anything of the kind. What else are you saying? Edgar... You helped me over a bad time. Now I think it will be best if we do not see each other anymore. Goodbye, Edgar. The lady was annoyed, perhaps rightly so. The young man was frightened, very rightly so. In their separate ways, each awaited the report of the government analyst. At long last, Dr. Richards came to the young widow. The news could be a lot worse, Mrs. Stone. They could have found arsenic or one of the slower, more common poisons. What have they found, Doctor? Poisoning by chloroform. <gasps> oh, Doctor, that is the worst. How so? Don't tell me you had some in your possession. I did. I had my reasons. Doctor, my married life was not happy. I, I am young. He was old. Practically my father. He kept putting me in Edgar's company. I began to... When two people are together constantly, I... <laughs> Please go on, Mrs. Stone. I... I obtained the chloroform. I kept it in a drawer. But I'd never had a secret from Oscar. Never. On any score. So uh, on New Year's Eve after our party, uh, I told him I had it and where it was. He spoke to me sadly, but, but kindly. Grieved that I'd been feeling about him as I did. Then he went to sleep. Or I thought he did. The next I knew, he was dead. Did you look at the bottle? Yes. I, I couldn't tell how much was gone. I took the bottle and I, I poured what was in it from the train as I went. The autopsy report came to Edgar as well. He wrestled with himself and finally took the only course which seemed open. Inspector Seward? Yes, come in, sir. Sit down. Thank you. I understand you have some information in the matter of the death of Oscar Stone. I do. You see, I bought the chloroform. They should be in here somewhere, Sergeant. If the little parson is telling the truth. Oh, I'm sure he is. He let himself in for something with that woman, didn't he? <laughs> it looks that way. Leave it to a woman every time. Grease spots, eh? <laughs> Not bad for an amateur. I suppose this is the gorse patch where you said he threw those small bottles. Yes, this is the place. Oh, I found one, Inspector. Two ounce size. The others can't be far. Yes, here are two more. One ounce capacity, these. And here's the fourth. Innocent little things, aren't they, sir? Anne Stone. I have a warrant for your arrest on the charge of willful murder of your husband. Edgar Sweet, I have a warrant for your arrest. You stand charged as an accessory before the fact in the murder of Oscar Stone. The trial took place at the next assizes. Gentlemen of the jury, the Attorney General who has this case in hand, with full knowledge of the facts, will present no evidence against the Reverend Mr. Sweet. You are therefore directed to find him not guilty, and I shall order his release at once. Edgar Sweet left the courtroom, a much wiser young man. The trial of Anne Stone proceeded and rested entirely on the medical evidence. Dr. Fletcher, you have described yourself as an expert in criminal toxicology. We have accepted you as such. Is that correct? It is, sir. Very well. Now, I call the particular attention of the jury to the answers you will give to these questions, as they will have great bearing on the evidence against my client. First, sir, have you ever known of a recorded case of murder by liquid chloroform? No. 
Is there any record, to your knowledge, of the possible administration of this liquid, of anyone pouring it down a victim's throat? There is not. If the victim were sleeping, for instance... The burning would waken him. It would probably go down his windpipe, not his gullet. And there would be burns, clearly visible after death. There would be. Then, in your expert opinion, Dr. Fletcher, is it impossible to commit murder by liquid chloroform? Nothing's impossible, but it's highly improbable. Thank you, Doctor. That is all. The chief witness of the Crown, Dr. Fletcher, had given his testimony. All that remained in the opinion of the defending counsel was to create a, a reasonable doubt in the minds of the jury. He called no witnesses, but spoke for six hours, summing up. In essence, he said... Oscar Stone was a loving, if elderly, husband. He felt his life was over. Remember, he was an eccentric who believed in having two wives. Can we say that this man, who had given so much to his sweet young wife, was not prepared to give her the greatest gift of all, her freedom? Once he knew that Cloniform was in the house, could he not have taken it himself? and passed quickly into the coma which ended in death. And if he gave this lovely girl freedom, are you who sit in judgment to do any less? The judge was clear and somewhat caustic in his charge to the jury. There have been sweet faces which hid guilty consciences before. When a young wife and a young man are thrust into daily contact by a doting husband, Strange events have a way of taking place. All this is true, but one salient remains. You may find this woman guilty as charged only if no reasonable doubt exists in your minds that she did commit the crime of which she stands. The jury deliberated for over two hours. They were twelve solemn men when they filed back into the jury box. Anne Stone rose to face them. The clerk asked for the verdict. The foreman rose and spoke clearly. We have considered the grave suspicions in this case, but find no evidence that would indicate who administered the poison to the victim. We find the accused, therefore, not guilty. But despite that perhaps surprising verdict of not guilty, the four famous small bottles can be seen today in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. No double jeopardy. That's an ancient English law, no double jeopardy. One cannot be tried twice for the same offense. It was felt, therefore, that since Anne Stone had been acquitted, if she had committed this crime, she ought to tell the world how it had been done. But no. All that was heard thereafter from Anne Stone was a letter addressed to a defending counsel. It read as follows. Dear Sir Edward, I feel I owe my life to your earnest efforts. I have not been a good woman, and my temptations have been terrible. But though I have not kept my vows, you will judge me mercifully. And there the case rests. Now until we meet next time... In the same place, I tell you another story about the Black Museum. I remain, as always, obediently yours. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. Museum. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames which houses Scotland Yard is a warehouse of homicide where everyday objects, a paperweight, a woolen muffler, an old-fashioned hat pin, a drinking glass, all are touched by murder. Here's a bit of frosted glass familiar object you've seen such glass before in the upper panels of the doors of older houses and perhaps the one in which you live 
Let's in more light, the owner used to say. One man climbing to his old-fashioned apartment said to his son, Hello, what's this? Glass on the landing? From the door, Dad. It looks like a frosty tunnel fell out. Yes, and pretty jaggedly. Be careful, son. Those shards are sharp. Well, today, the glass shards can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. And here we are, The Black Museum. Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Yes, here lies death. And here's a pacifier. Nippled end, ivory ring. This in The Black Museum, yes... Because it seems there was a will. And where there's a will, there's a way. Even to infanticide. Here's a pair of andirons. Brass, graceful in pattern, clean in execution. Execution. Observe the shining brass of this one, the ugly blotch on the other. A woman is pushed violently. Her head strikes with malice of forethought. This was murder. Nice, here we are, the glass shards. They're sharp, pointed. Dangerous to life and limb, even in themselves. Here they are, glistening, gleaming in their whitely frosted danger. Once they were part of a hole. The glass panel, as I told you, of an apartment door. But we'll come to that. Let's begin this tale with the ringing of a doorbell. Maybe no one is home. Well, we'll try again. Sorry to have kept you waiting. Oh. Oh, uh, sorry to have disturbed you, ma'am. I've been sent looking for a chauffeur. A chap named a Simmons. There's no one here by that name. And I can tell you, sir, there's no one by that name being in this neighbourhood. Well, not in my memory, and I've lived here about now and twenty years. Oh, well, thank you, ma'am. The arch really works. The beacon, it's called. Well, they'll have to find another errand boy if they can't give me better steers than this. Good day, ma'am. Good day. Hmm. That's a bit strange. There's no beacon garage in this neighborhood. Of course, this was not a neighborhood for garages and items of that sort. This was strictly residential. Mostly semi-detached houses with a bit of garden and an occasional block of apartments or flats, as they're still called in London. Into one of those apartment houses came Charles Fly and his son, Charles Jr., Home after their respective days' work at business and college. When will they put lights in these stairs, Dad? Not for someone breaks a leg in the dark. I just hope it isn't your mother. Uh, so do I. I just, well, watch the landing, Dad. Turns to the head. I know. Hello, what's this? Glass on the landing? Uh, from the door, Dad. Looks like a frosted panel fell out. Yes, and pretty jaggedly. Be careful, son. Those shards are sharp. I said, do you, do you suppose Mother let the door slam so hard the glass broke? Well, I'll ask her when we get inside. Your key handy. Um, right, here, right here, Dad. Thanks. Funny, I've never known your mother to use the chain on the door in her life. Oh, with the glass broken like that? What good's the chain? I can reach in and flip off the chain from me with the broken glass. Dad, there's someone in there. Oh, your mother, probably. No. It's not. It's a man. A little fellow. Junior, yes. go on down to Riverdale Road. There's a police box there. Call him. Quickly. Well, what, what about you, Dad? Go on now. I'll stay here and watch him. Hurry. Uh, yes. All right. If you say so. Chain's off now. Why not? He's only a little fellow. Here now. What are you putting in my suitcase? You shouldn't have come in, Governor. It won't do you a bit of good. I'm leaving with your suitcase and what I've packed in it. Oh, get back. I can handle you. Oh. Oh. So foolhardy. Mr. Fly should have stayed outside. He might have stayed alive. 
As it was when the police did arrive with Charles Fry Jr., Senior was very dead. The call to Scotland Yard was automatic after that. Inspector Howard proceeded with the preliminary questioning as his technical experts combed the apartment. I know you had quite a shock, my boy, but we need your help, and right now. I'll try my best, Inspector. We've checked the apartment. The intruder, whoever he was, had packed a suitcase and was about ready to leave. Dad's own. It was his suitcase. All right. Now, is there anything else you know of that's missing? Um, Mother said something before she collapsed about about her bracelet. I, I looked. It's missing. Can you describe it in detail? On items like that, we publish it in the Yard's Daily Gazette. It's circularized to every station, jeweler, and pawn shop in England. Well, it, it was gold about an inch wide, engraved with a kind of floral design, and there were 25 diamonds, small ones, in the pattern. Dad gave it to Mother on that 25th anniversary. I see. Very good. Now, you've been an excellent help, and you're certain he was a short man. Well, I, I, I saw him through the broken pane. Just about five feet tall. Quite a little fellow. I guess that's why Dad went in after him. Dad didn't know he had a gun. Housebreakers try to stay away from guns in England. The penalties are too severe. Yes, sir? No M.O., sir. Just the broken pane of glass. Thank you. Anything beyond that first shell? Not a thing. One shot was fired, that's all. No M.O., sir? Means of operation. Anything that's recognizable. Most of these people have a kind of trademark. Completely subconscious, but it helps us to find them. Too bad there's nothing, then. Eh? We'll do our best. All right, Sergeant. I want the neighborhood canvassed. Did anyone notice a small man sounding the drum? Did anyone see a small man leaving the premises? And check every carnival, fair, and circus for a small fellow who's a sharpshooter. One cartridge, one shot, and bullseye. Got that, Sergeant? Aye, sir. We can make a start anyway, and here's hoping... We... Police routine. Sounding the drum. It's a new term. What does it mean? Listen to the sergeant as he canvasses the neighborhood. Tell me, ma'am, in the past day or so, has anyone rung your bell and asked for someone who doesn't live here and left in a hurry? Do you follow the term now? It's what Americans would call casing the joint. Find out if anyone's home by ringing the bell. If there is, make an excuse and get away fast. If there isn't, find a way to break in and steal whatever may be lying about within easy reach. It's simple, effective, very professional. But the police are professionals, too. Excuse me, sir. I'm from the CID. Sergeant Gordon, and my credentials. Oh, what's up? I'm making inquiries to see if anyone's called at your house in the past few days. What? Oh, no, no. We've all been away the past two weeks. We only got back today. Oh, well, thank you, then. Uh, sorry to trouble you. Yes? Forgive me for troubling you, ma'am. I'm Sergeant Gordon, CID. My credentials. Well, what, what, what's happened? We aren't in any trouble, are we? Now, now, calm yourself, ma'am. No trouble for you, at any rate. It's just that I wanted to ask you a question or two. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, could you tell me if anyone has called at your house during the past few days and asked for someone who doesn't live here and that if they were in? <laughs> what a silly question. No, ma'am, it's a very serious question. So will you put your mind to it? Well, no. I'm absolutely sure. Nobody. Yes? Sergeant Gordon, CID. My credentials. Yes? Has anyone rung your bell in the past few days and asked for someone who doesn't live here? No. Thank you. Sorry to disturb you, ma'am. I'm Sergeant Gordon, CID. Uh, my credentials. Oh, oh, please. Yes? Did you... Uh, that is, has anyone rung your bell in the past few days and asked for someone who doesn't live here? Oh, that'd be a foolish thing. Why, yes. There was. Just yesterday afternoon. He asked for a chauffeur or something. Said the fellow worked at the Beacon Garage. And you remembered this? Oh, I certainly did. Why, ma'am? Well, because there's no such place hereabouts as the Beacon Garage. And I ought to know. I've lived here 20 years. I see. <laughs> Rather a foolish error. 
Now that you mention it, I'm not sure that it was an error. He seemed rather a nasty little man. Oh, is that so? Why? Uh, too dapper, too quick. Much too little for a man. He's shorter than I am, and I'm only five feet two. Uh, could you describe him in more detail, perhaps? Well, he had dark hair, grew very low on his head, and his eyes were sort of shifty. Blue, but shifty. Uh -huh. The kind of thing you see in the cinema. You know, in those pictures about bookmaking and that. Uh, anything else, ma'am? Well, not that I remember, not offhand at any rate. Now, two people still living have seen this little man, the dead man's son and the woman at whose door he sounded the drum. A description is in hand, two descriptions, which tally in every point. And then Sergeant Gordon came into Inspector Howard's office with another fact. A very solid fact. Now what's this, Sergeant? The weapon, sir. Found it behind the hedge of number 21. Three houses up from the flats where the flyer was killed. How'd you get onto it? Ah, uh, we found a young fellow who'd been walking his girl past the flats on her way from the bus. Uh, this little man ran out of the flats, almost knocked the girl over, but he kept going. Our young fellow turned around to protest, saw him throw something over the hedge. We looked. There it is. Ah, nasty little gun. Well, shell jammed in the chamber. Oh, no wonder he fired only one shot. But he pulled the trigger twice. Well, we can drop our search in the circuses, Sergeant. I doubt if this fellow is the sharpshooter we thought he was. I think now we'll concentrate on classification by size. Shall we get to it, Sergeant? We seem to have our work cut out for us again. Surely the picture takes shape. Dim at first as if seen through frosted glass, like the glass shards to be seen today in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with the Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Again, it's compounded of hard work, good police training, and a little luck. They start with nothing, this time with a wrong theory that their man is a sharpshooter. They have to abandon this, and they start fresh with the dullest and therefore the hardest kind of police routine, checking the files. He's a little man. Everyone's agreed on that. Ask criminal records to send us the dossiers on every man we have on file under five feet two inches in height. Carefully, the inspector in charge and his sergeant comb through these dossiers, and finally, by reason of cross-checking, this one in jail at the moment of the crime, that one in some other part of the country, others with perfect alibis, the list of little fellows is reduced to four. You take these two, Sergeant, I'll work over the others. Anything that rings a bell, the smallest detail. Yes, sir. For over an hour, the two men are silent, reading, thinking, trying to relate something in the files to the facts that they already have. And then they exchange dossiers and start again. By this time, the lamps are lighted. The Thames flows like black glass outside the window of the inspector's office. All at once. I may have something, sir. Which file? Larry Mason. His nearest relatives, an uncle and an aunt, are recorded here as living in Beacon Road. Does that mean anything to you, Sergeant? It doesn't to me. Hey, you'll see it in my report in passing, Inspector. Uh -huh. When I talked with a woman who'd seen the fellow sounding the drum, he told her the chauffeur he was looking for walked at the Beacon Garage. Oh, and she made quite a fuss over the fact that there is no such garage in the neighborhood. She was quite emphatic about it. Ah, uh -huh, interesting. Let me see the description. I uh, see. Five feet, one and a half inch. The smallest of the lot. Beacon garage, eh? And relatives on Beacon Road. Not important, perhaps. And yet, all important, as the inspector thought it through. We'll say a man needs a false name at a sudden moment. He says the first thing that comes into his mind. It seems rather natural that the place his nearest relatives live should be lurking somewhere just below his consciousness. Well, it's mighty slim, but it's worth a try. And having decided it was worth a try, Inspector Howard and Sergeant Gordon set out to trace their prime, if tiny, suspect. Mason? Yes, he lived here. Oh, lived? 
You mean he's left? He didn't leave. What then, ma'am? Did he die? He could have, for all I care. I threw him out. Didn't pay his rent for three weeks. I can't afford deadheads, I can't. Have you any idea where he's gone? No. What's more, I don't care. Next point of inquiry was the Beacon Road address. Larry Mason's uncle. About your nephew, Mr. Mason. What about him? Have you any idea of his whereabouts? Who wants to know? My name is Howard, Inspector, Scotland Yard. Uh, he in trouble, is he again? We are not certain yet. He may be. We'd like to talk to him. Well, if you find him, I'd like to talk to him too. Long enough to tell him not to come round for me for help. Sergeant Gordon visited the pubs and hangouts where Larry Mason had been known to spend his time. In one of them, he found a friend of Mason's. Larry? I ain't seen him in a long time. Not since he was sent away for breaking and entering. He hasn't been round at all. And I can't say I'm sorry. No? Why not, friend? He worked for me when I had my license and was making a book legitimate. He was my clerk, see? Then one day he walks off, just like that, with ten quid. <laughs> I don't expect to see him again. He knows that little job cost me my license. And he knows what will happen to him if he shows his face in here again. <laughs> Not much to go on, or to find a man, except the brush strokes that fill the picture of the little fellow's character. Unreliable, a thief, where his friends are concerned. Now, think back a minute. Remember the Daily Gazette, the yard publishes with descriptions of stolen goods, missing persons, and so on. Teletype from the Lancashire Police, Inspector, huh? They've got the bracelet in the fly case. A pawnbroker turned it up. Good. It was offered to him by a tall, heavy-set fellow with a peculiar circular scar on his right cheek. That sounds like Dick Lowry. Let's have Mr. Lowry in here, shall we? Mr. Lowry was quite glad to oblige. He wasn't in hiding or anything like that, not Dick Lowry. Where'd you get it, Lowry? The inspector wants to know. Where'd I get what? The bracelet you pawned in Bolton. I found it. You found it, did That's you? what I said. Anything wrong in that? If you found it, no. We think you bought it. Oh, now, what would I buy a bracelet with sparklers in it for? <laughs> My ghost don't go for that sort of thing. You sold it, didn't you? Oh, good. Why not? A fellow can do with a spot of cash. Larry. Uh, yes, Inspector? You may want to know. That bracelet is involved in a killing. A, a killing, is it? Why, that dirty little... Oh... Go on, Lowry. Start talking, Lowry. Accessory after the fact in a murder can be very nasty, you know. All right. I, I bought it. I paid a good price, too. From whom? Lowry, from whom? Larry Mason. Well, at last. Where'd you see him, Lowry? Oh, the usual place. Dog track. With him, it's horses or dogs when the nags aren't running. <laughs> Finally, the patience was bringing results, as it almost always does. Canvas a whole neighborhood, comb through hundreds of files, slowly, slowly, narrow the possibilities, and finally, a direct relation is established between the crime and some person who may have committed it. After that, find the person. In this case, it was the dog tracks. South End. He's not here, Sergeant. The White City Raceway. Not a sign, Inspector. Wembley. They know him here, but he hasn't been around in weeks. And back to South End. No luck again, sir. No luck is right. Tell me, Sergeant, do you suppose a pint of ale will help our patients any? This one seems rather decent, Inspector. Yes, let's get on with it. Uh, oh, excuse me. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't mean to come against you. That's all right. No harm done. Hold it, young fellow. I think I know you. Do you? Where from? You're Larry Mason. Uh, not me. My name's Leonard Martin, sir. Sorry, you'll have to prove your identity. We're from Scotland Yard. At 
twist of luck, a turn of chance. Two weary policemen in search of a relaxing moment run across the killer they've been hunting for weeks. At the yard, Larry Mason was not having a particularly relaxing time of it. Do you insist on denying you're Larry Mason? I do. Look, Mason, you've been away for a while. Now you know about these things. Your fingerprints are the prints on Mason's record. Dick Lowry swears he bought the bracelet from you. Your landlady and your former bookmaking associate have identified you. Now let's have no more nonsense. I ain't giving you a thing. Just because I'm small don't mean you can push me around. Ah, you'd better tell us the whole story, Mason, and stop this nonsensical denial. You'll go to trial anyway, you know. And the more you lie now, the harder it'll be on you later. Now speak up, Mason. You know, they get stubborn streaks sometimes. They read somewhere somehow that the best defense is to admit nothing, not even their own identity. So they firmly shut their mouths and refuse to talk about anything except the weather. And Sergeant knew they had a case, a good case. Inspector Howard came in to help. I look at it this way, Mason. You can't do yourself any harm. We've got the evidence. We've got the gun. We're in the process of tracing it to you right now. The woman you spoke to will identify you in court. You had the bracelet. You've no alibi worth mentioning. You'll hang on what we've got, Mason, unless you've something which makes it manslaughter in place of murder. All right. It was an accident. I never used a gun before. Never even had one. The first time is always one too many when it comes to guns. Now, keep talking. How was it an accident? I, I broke the glass, see? After nobody answered the bell. I stuck my hand in. It, it was a cinch to open the door. I worked fast, but this fellow come home early or something. I tried to make the back door. No luck. It, it was locked with a key. So you had to come to the front. He was a lot bigger than me. I pulled the gun because I wanted to scare him, that's all. He jumped me, hit me with something... I blacked out. That's it. I blacked out. Didn't even hear the gun go off. And when you came to, Mason? He was dead on the floor. I got out of there as fast as I could get. It was an accident. I swear it was an accident. What's your opinion, Sergeant? It's a good story, but it won't wash. Why not? Is that what happened? Why not? It's very simple, Mason. You blacked out as you pulled the trigger. Therefore, you fired only once. Yes, sir. Only once. Sorry, Mason. You pulled that trigger twice. There was a shell jammed in the firing chamber. You pulled the trigger at least twice. That's no accident, Mason. That's murder. Yes, the case was complete. Each part in its correct place. And those glass shards I told you about, those two are in their correct place. In the Black Museum... Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. The jury quite agreed with Inspector Howard. That was no accident. And so in due course, little Larry Mason, the bookie's clerk who made the fatal error of carrying a pistol, went the way of most murderers at 8 o'clock one summer morning. Larry Mason's luck had run out, or had it. It was reported, you see, that as he walked to the scaffold with its 13 steps and waiting rope, Mason murmured to his guards. They had to do this now on June 6th. Derby Day. And me with a few shillings riding on Armstrong in the big race. Curiously, although Mason wasn't available to collect on his bet, Armstrong was the winning horse. At 53 to 1. And now until we meet next time. We meet in the same place and I tell you another story about the Black Museum. I remain as always... Obediently yours. The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles, is presented by arrangement with Metro Goldwyn Mayer Radio Attractions. The program is written by Ara Marion, with original music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch, produced by Harry Allen Powers. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London.
Black Museum. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames which houses Scotland Yard is a warehouse of homicide where everyday objects, a picture frame, a coat hanger, a file folder, a baby buggy, all are touched by murder. Now here's a hammerhead made of cast steel, well-shaped, extremely familiar, the front end blunt, solid, designed for driving nails, the clawed prongs at the rear for pulling nails, very practical, very, very, very familiar, and so very, very, very lethal. Odd one, this, wasn't it, Inspector? Just a little extra patience, a little extra routine work, Cross. That's one way to look at it, sir. I prefer to remember it as the case which began with almost two dozen disappearances and wound up with one killer who used a hammer with purpose. Well, today that hammerhead can be seen here in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear the Black Museum Starring Orson Welles. Now, the Black Museum starring Orson Welles. Well, here we are in the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Beyond these walls, the Thames seethes with a commerce which is life to London. Within these walls, where some of the river's dampness exudes from vaulted stone, there is quiet, very sinister quiet, a kind of silence which inevitably surrounds objects touched by horror and fear. Yes, here lies death. Behind glass doors, peaceful, inanimate objects on deal tables... The authorities have provided suitable identification in labels and neatly lettered cards. The motives, actions, and the reasons why these objects rest here now were all provided by murderers. Here's a calendar. The usual 12-page printed piece with a picture of a pretty girl to decorate it. The holidays are marked, as usual, in red. One other day is marked as well. The day and date of a murder. Strangely, that red circle led to capture and conviction, of course, to execution. Ah, here we are. Here's, here's the hammerhead I told you about. It's an efficient tool. It's hammerhead. Type used by generations of carpenters, by millions everywhere for work around the house. Hardly a home is without one. And one would expect that a story involving such a tool would begin in somebody's home. On the contrary, this tale begins in the direct antithesis to a home. It begins in a London railroad station. Let me have my bag, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, your check, please. Right you are. Thank you, sir. Here it is, sir. Hey, that's not my bag. Mine's a Gladstone. Oh, sorry, sir. Uh, just let me see the checks. Oh. What's wrong? Are you sick? No, no sir. It's just my hand. You cut yourself? That's blood. Yes, I, I know. But it's not a cut, sir. It's from the bag. Well, open it, man. Don't stand there. Yes, sir. Doesn't seem like much of a lock on it, sir. Oh. What, is, what does one do now, sir? When you find part of a body in a police, you call the police, of course. What else? Yes. Uh, please wait here. Yes, I'll call. Yes, call the police. Start the wheels moving. The wheels of police routine, which grind slowly but inevitably toward discovery. In this particular situation, the call led eventually to the office of Inspector Church at Here the yard. Information cross. The contents of that valise at Charing Cross belong to a torso found in Brighton. Another one in Brighton, sir? Number 23. 23 girls missing. Just unreported. Photos available, sir? In most cases, here's the assembled composite of the latest. Hmm. Pretty little thing. To wind up so widely separated as London and Brighton. Here's the setup for now. I'm assigning a man individually to each case. Identify any found bodies, trace the known missing. I'm taking Daisy Baker myself. 
You'll take over here, and all the information will channel through you. Very well, sir. You're why the Baker girl for yourself, sir? Oh, she is, or was, the common-law wife of Jamie Marsden. That one! Remember him? Oh, picked him up on his first conviction myself. Rather a long record, hasn't he, sir? All petty crimes, short sentences. In any case, the Baker woman's been reported missing by her sister. It might be worth a trip to see the sister. Her name is Crandall, Ruth Crandall. Before I drop in in Marsden, I think I'll visit the lady. A routine call to inquire the reasons for a woman's worry about her missing sister. Inspector Church found Ruth Crandall at home. So, when I planned to go down to stay with Daisy, well, to see her anyway, and the wire came, well, you see how it is, Inspector. May I see the wire, Mrs. Crandall? <laughs> yes, I have it just here, in the desk. Yes, here it is. I see. Going abroad. Good job. Sail Sunday. We'll write. Oh, it doesn't tell us very much, does it? Well, I tried to call. Her husband, well, he wasn't very cooperative. He said she'd upped and packed her things and told him she was bound for Paris for a dancing job. Oh, Miss Baker is a dancer? That's how it was. She was living in Brighton. She was in some show down there. And you feel something is wrong? Definitely. I don't know exactly why, but... Well, you see, the wire doesn't even say love. And that makes it seem strange too, doesn't it, Inspector? Perhaps, Mrs. Crandall. And you've no other information, nothing you can put your finger on? No. Except, of course, that I haven't heard from Daisy since the wire came. The Inspector was puzzled. None of it felt right, none of it conformed at all to the usual pattern. Ruth Crandall had nothing factual to go on, and a woman's instinct is never evidence on which to base an arrest or a conviction. Still, the inspector took the train to Brighton and called on Jamie Marsden at 35 Park Row. Yes? Remember me, Marsden? Uh, copper, ain't you? Yes, Chief Inspector Church, CID. Well, come in, Inspector. I don't suppose this is a social visit? No, I'm a bit busy for that sort of thing. Oh, well... Sit down anyway, Inspector. Just a few questions. Well, go ahead. I hear you married since we last met. Yes, I did. Nice girl. She home? Well, um, no, as a matter of fact, she's, uh, she's gone off to Paris. Her job as a dancer over there. So her sister told me. Yeah, well, she wired her sister. Nothing much my sister-in-law would want to see me about, so, uh, well, there wasn't much sense in her coming all the way down to Brighton when Daisy wasn't here. I assume you have your wife's address. Uh, well, uh, no, Inspector. Oh? We had a bit of a dust-up before Daisy left. She uh, flounced out of here all kind of mad, as you might say. Mrs. Crandall know this? No. Mrs. Crandall don't take to the likes of me, so I saw no reason to tell anything she didn't have to know. If Daisy wants to reach her, she knows where. Well, that's it, I suppose. You'll be here if I want to see you again, Marsden? I'm moving. Uh, three rooms is a bit large for me, seeing as I was on my own these days. The uh, new place is at uh, Maitland Street, uh, uh, number 26. It's a good bit cheaper. More suited to my means. A check of the uh, habitual haunts and acquaintances of Daisy Baker drew another blank. Some had heard she'd gone off to Paris. No one knew where. Meanwhile, the reports on other missing girls were equally discouraging. That's the lot, eh, Cross? That's the lot, sir. But when uh, another missing one reported, makes an even two dozen, sir. Have they tried the picture of the girl we found in Charing Cross on this new report? Uh, not the same girl, sir. Uh, too bad. No luck with Marston, I presume. No luck at all. Edgy sort of fellow, that one. Yes, he ought to be. He's much too familiar with us, and he knows it. Well, there's no help for it. It'll have to be a house-to-house search. The usual district, Inspector? All of Brighton. Rather a large order, Inspector. Finding 14 missing girls and identifying six of ten bodies is quite an order cross. There's no help for it. It'll have to be done. Chances are we'll have to lend Brighton... The hard, dull slogging of police routine. Divide a city into sections... Assign groups of detectives in pairs to each section, then walk from house to house, from cellar to attic, pausing for the questions, questions, questions. Try to locate someone who has seen something, who may know one of the missing persons by sight. Try. Keep trying. Well, <clears throat> there was nothing there. Jobs like this, Inspector, that make me wonder why I wanted to be a policeman. It's jobs like this, show that make good policemen out of ambitious young men. Well, next address. 26 Maitland. <laughs> I expect Jamie Marsden won't be looking for me this quickly. Marsden? Who's that? Oh, petty criminal. His wife was reported missing by a sister. Turned out she'd gone off to a job in Paris and a half. Knock on the door, Shaw, will you? Yes, sir. 
Sordid kind of story. Even a touch of the dope rack in it. Yes? My credentials. CID. Also a search warrant. Well, you, you meant it suddenly didn't waste any time. Uh, please come in. Waste any time? Yeah, I, I called the police about five minutes ago. They said they'd send someone over. Are you the landlord? I am, Inspector. Well, we're here on the matter of our own. However, what's the trouble? Notice anything, sir? I do. How about you, Shaw? Yes, sir, I do. It's from this room. The tenant is out just now. Left his door locked. Name of Marsden. Well, is that so? Just as well we have the search warrant. Try your shoulder in that door, Shaw. Yes, sir. Shaw. Sure. We've never had anything like this before, sir. Well, there's nothing much here unless it's on the walls. There's a trunk in the closet, sir. Drag it out. <coughs> Cut those cords. Yes, sir. Lord. Uh, may I stay outside, Inspector? Yes, of course. I wonder Marsden isn't home. Well, Daisy Baker didn't go to Paris after all. Took quite a beating, didn't she? Looks like a blunt instrument did the job. Call headquarters, Shaw. Pick up order for Jamie Marsden. Well, today, that hammerhead can be seen here in the Black Museum. <laughs> In just a moment, we will continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. And now, we continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. The wires were alive with the search for Jamie Marsden, somewhere in England. The little petty thief was hiding. And sometime he would be found, according to Chief Inspector Church. The man almost undoubtedly killed Daisy Baker. And there's no question that he had her body in that trunk moving it with him. An inquiry into the whereabouts of missing girls had blossomed into a full hunt for a murderer. The premises at 26 Maitland Street, Brighton, were given a thorough going over. Detective Shaw reported... Nothing, sir. Not a trace of anything except that trunk and the body which Inspector Church replied. Very well. Now give the same treatment to 35 Park Row. There, the young detective reported. In the backyard, sir, in a pile of junk, we found a hammerhead. It's been given to pathology, Inspector. There are stains on it. They might be blood, sir. And, as Inspector Church said to his deputy, Inspector Cross, some 48 hours later... Pathology report, Cross. That hammerhead did the job. The stains of blood and the type conform. Good enough, sir. Not quite. Good enough. The handle is gone. There's no proof who used the hammer. And pathology also reports that the autopsy shows enough morphine in the Baker woman's body to establish unconsciousness before death, if not death itself. Any record of dope handling in Marston dossier, sir? Nope. We haven't been able to tie him into that yet. Well, we'll see after we find the gentleman in question. Meanwhile, have them get me Brighton on the wire. I have a routine job for Detective Shaw. Too many loose ends in this one. The call was made altogether. to Detective Shaw in Brighton. Armed with a postcard, a file number, and a hand-lettered menu, Detective Shaw invaded a certain telegraph office in Brighton. Yes, sir. Always glad to cooperate with the police, sir. Can you find me the original of this wire? I think so, sir. Just a moment, please. <sighs> Uh, this is it, I assume, sir. It has the same file number. Mm, yeah, yes, that's it. Going abroad, good job. Thank you very much. Now, if you'll just let me compare the writing on the blank with these samples I have with Detective me. Detective Shaw noted his comparisons and went to the telephone. A few moments later, he put a call through to Inspector Church at the yard. Go ahead, Shaw. What have you got? They had the original, sir. I compared it with the postcard with the Baker woman's writing on it. I'm no expert, sir, but it's obvious the two writings are absolutely different. That's that, then. I had a specimen of Marsden's writing, too, sir. Where did you get that? From a restaurant, where the man worked for a while as a waiter. The menus there are handwritten. It was part of his job to write them out. Good man. There's no question about it, sir. Marsden wrote that wire and signed the baker woman's name to it. Another link in the chain rapidly forging itself around Jamie Marsden. But still, no Jamie Marsden. 
Every policeman in England's carrying the man's picture and description, sir. How long is it going to take to bring the picture and the man together? Not too long, Inspector. In fact, within 24 hours. Here, you. Just a minute. You want me, Constable? Stand over there, in the street light. There you are. No weapons. Now, why should I be carrying a weapon, Constable? I'm just an ordinary citizen. Let's have a close look at you. Yes, I'm sure of it. You'll have to come along to the station house. You're being taken in charge. What for? You're Jamie Marsden, unless I miss my guess by a mile. Don't you know there's an all-stations broadcast out for you? You're the most wanted man in England this minute. That was in Manchester. Very shortly thereafter, Jamie Marsden faced Inspector Church and Deputy Inspector Cross in their office at the yard. All right, Marsden, let's hear it. All of it. I didn't kill her, Inspector. I didn't kill her. But you knew she was dead. Well, if you mean, did I put her in the trunk? I did. But you didn't kill her. No, sir. You've got to believe that. Now, apparently, you seem to understand that it's somewhat difficult to believe. Well, that was the whole thing from the beginning. All right. Let's go back to the beginning. Well... Me and Daisy got together down in Brighton about a year ago. How? Oh. oh, she was dancing in a coot show and I was barking a booth a little way up the sidewalk. Well, sort of got into the habit of meeting her after closing time. Then, well, we reckoned that two can live as cheaply as one, so, well, we put in together and started housekeeping. Were you pushing any of the stuff her way? I didn't know she was on the stuff. No, not, 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 not for months. Inspector, you've got to believe it. Yes, it seems that a lot of things we've got to believe. You heard, Cross Marsden. <clears throat> I'm, shall I say, sceptical, too. Keep talking. I'm honest with you, sir, I am. Now keep talking. Well, Daisy's sister came to visit. We didn't get along. If I'd have killed anyone, it'd have been that sister. What she came for except to be nasty and snoop, I don't know. Back to the story, Marsden. Here, 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 here all right, sir. Well, like I was saying, we, we got together and everything was fine. <laughs> Oh, we had a couple of fights, but, uh, oh, nothing much. Then Daisy said as our sister was coming down again. I got real mad. I slammed the door. You didn't slam, Daisy. I may have cuffed her a bit, sir. Nothing, nothing serious. Anyways, I went out, and I stayed out for a couple of hours. I come back, and uh, the place was awful quiet, and I thought, well, maybe Daisy had gone out or taken a shot or two or something. I walked into the bedroom... That was at 35, where we had the three rooms. You walked into the bedroom and let her have it, right, Marsden? No, sir, wrong. She had it. Oh, it was awful, Inspector. She was real bashed up, she was. Why didn't you call the police? Me? With my record? Uh, who'd have believed I didn't do it? You don't believe me now. I never killed nobody, just been put away for small things, but I got a record. Nobody had listen, I reckon, so... I got real scared. I, I, I did the first thing that entered my head. Which was, Marsden? I, I got an old trunk and... And I stuffed her in it, and then I, I took the sheets and all down to the cellar, and I stuffed them in the furnace. Well, the rest you know, Inspector, and that's the truth, so help me. What did you do with the hammer, Marsden? Hammer? Oh, what hammer, Inspector? The one you bashed her with, Marsden, the hammer that killed her. I don't know about no hammer. I didn't kill her, nor nobody. I didn't kill her, Inspector, and that's the truth. They worked on Jamie Marsden for three days. They tried every trick, every question they could think of, but no one could shake his denial. Jamie Marsden insisted he had not killed Daisy Baker, and that was that. Weary and exhausted, Chief Inspector Church faced his deputy. You know, Cross, I am almost beginning to believe Marsden myself. If he did kill her, it's completely out of the pattern. His kind of criminal almost never kills. I know, but somebody killed her. Even granting Marsden's story, somebody killed her. Well, then, where do we go from here, sir? Where would you doubt there were? There had been other men in this woman's life. Have you any doubt about it, sir? Do you suppose the sister would have any ideas? Well, it's a place to start in any case. Check. Then let's get on with it, Cross, and ask the Brighton police to work in that angle. The sister, Ruth Crandall, place to start on a new angle at any rate. The two CID men paid their second visit to Mrs. Crandall. I suppose, Inspector, you've come to ask me to testify at Marsden's trial. Nasty little man. As a matter of fact, we haven't. We don't have enough evidence yet to send Marsden to trial. We're booked on suspicion, that's all. Not enough evidence? Oh, hardly seems possible. The papers were full of it. The newspapers aren't the police, ma'am. Of course not, Mr. Cross. But after all, he did keep my sister's body with him. He did run away. I know, Mrs. Crandall, but there's been no weapon that relates to Marsden. No weapon? 
The hammer's head? Well, after all, that's a weapon. Did you say a Mrs. hammer man? Kendall, we came here to ask you about another man in your sister's life. Have you any ideas? I know this much, Inspector. But my sister was no better than a reputation. Heaven knows I tried. All my life I tried. When my husband died, I offered her a home even. Though she persisted in the disgraceful kind of life she was leading. She even boasted to me once that she liked it. As for knowing the kind of men she went around with. Really, Inspector, you've seen how I live. How would I know anything about things like that? I see. Well, Mrs. Crandall, if you think of anything which may be of help, we'll appreciate your letting us know. Two men with a purpose left the neat suburban residence of Daisy Baker's sister. Shortly after their return to Scotland Yard, the teletypes, the telephones were all busy. Reports were swift in coming in. Here's word from the hardware store, sir. A hammer was bought. The janitor at 35 Park Road did see someone that day. They found a taxi driver in Brighton who remembers. One of the neighbors places the date exactly. So she remembers the house was empty because a little boy was ill and she wanted to borrow something. Here's the final touch. Local bus driver remembers the trip from out there to the railroad station. The final touch. And once again, two men from the CID went visiting. We've traced your movements all that day, Mrs. Crandall. Your neighbor remembers your house was shut up. The bus driver remembers how you asked if you'd reached the station on time. A taxi driver in Brighton remembers taking you to 35 Park Row. The janitor saw you there. And the hardware dealer right round the corner from here has a record of his sale of a hammer to you. You shouldn't have mentioned that hammer, Mrs. Crandall. We never told the newspapers about finding it in the backyard at Brighton. I was right. She wasn't fit to live. Everyone pitied me on account of my sister. They looked down on me. I never felt better in my life than when I hit her and hit her and then broke the handle off the hammer and burned it in that furnace at that awful house. If only I'd been a little more careful, then you'd have to have tried that Marsden fellow. You'd have to have hung him. Perhaps. <laughs> now then, Mrs. Crandall, are you ready to come quietly? <laughs> and today, that hammerhead can be seen here in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. In due course, Henrietta Crandall paid the usual penalty for premeditated homicide. The purchase of the hammer was sufficient evidence of the intent to kill. As for Jamie Marsden, product of the London slums of bad company and evil ways, Jamie went free. But not for long. Six months had barely passed before Marsden was picked up for possession of a deadly weapon and sentenced to serve 90 days for simple theft. And as for the hammerhead, well, here it is, in its usual place, in the Black Museum. So until next time, till another story about this same place, I remain, as always, obediently yours. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum. Here, in a grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, there's a warehouse of homicide, where everyday objects, a simple glass, a, a piece of rope, a woman's handkerchief, all, all are touched by murder. You take this, this iron bar. It's a familiar object. The handle of a jack. If you own a car, you have a jack handle. Maybe you've used it, but never, never I trust like this. Gracie, quick, give me the jack handle. Here, let me go. What do you want? I Today, you will find that jack handle in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death. 
the Black Museum. Well, here we are, the Black Museum. A few yards from here, the Thames laps at the riverside of Scotland Yard. But you never know it in here. Not in this long, dim, stone-arched room. It's a kind of mecca, a goal to be reached by students of crime and criminology the whole world over. Yes, here in this room, eyes death and the mementos and souvenirs of death on these shelves, in these cabinets, under this well-dusted glass. The weapons, the key clues of every homicide in which Scotland Yard has taken part for almost a hundred years. Now here, in this case, the small white box it's from Edinburgh. This death was in this box. Death by poison. The death of a too importunate lover. Now this tiny pistol. It's oiled. It's in working order. A Derringer, it's called. The killer wore it up his sleeve. One morning at 8 o'clock in the British tradition, the trap was sprung. The killer walked on thin air. The executioner received the customary 10 pounds. Ah, now, here's something more familiar. A jack handle. It's intriguing. Once, according to the case book, yes, <laughs> that's the story, a tale which begins innocently enough when London lived in the blackout. And many American men found their after dark amusement in tiny hole in the wall cafes. Of me always, though we're far apart. Keep a tender memory within. Well, look around, small tables crowded together, not much light. Pretty stuffy, and the blackout curtains, the double blackout door don't help the ventilation much. The girl singing is pretty, you know tawdry sort of way, provocative in the manner of a cheap pin-up, but the two young men in the American uniforms don't seem to mind. How's about it, Tom? Not bad for a dive? Not too bad. Five will get you ten, it's out of bounds. Yeah, not yet, son. Just open. The MPs haven't cased the joint yet. Oh, well, good deal. Well, nothing to worry about, kid. Well, who's worried? What can they do? Six months in the stockade, maybe? <laughs> That's okay with me. Apparently, at least one of these gentlemen is over the hill. Now, their interest has shifted, and quite naturally, of course. You think she has to sing for a living? It can't be much of a living. She's not too bad. Maybe she dates. Ah, uh, you wouldn't know what to do about it if she does. Says who? That says me. What were you stateside, anyway? A parson's son or a school teacher? I worked in a back. So what? I got along. I did all right. Uh, hiding in the army? Hiding in the... Oh, maybe... Could be. I get it. Still water runs deep and all that stuff. Now, look, Teddy. What you don't know won't hurt you, see? Does that apply to Gracie? Gracie? You mean the babe? Well, who else? Grace Harwell, the London thrush, who don't sing half as good as she looks. You know her? Well, I met her a couple of times. You want a knockdown? Well, why not? Now? Well, sure. Gracie. Let's see your speed, son. You got a ringside seat. Well, pity. The Yank who thought he'd take Soho single-handed. Sit down, Gracie. What'll you have? My regular. Who's your friend? Oh, meet Private Tom Bennett, Gracie Howard. Hi. Hello, soldier. Let me get your drink, Gracie. Faster that way. Hey, what about your ringside seat? I'll be back in time. That fast you can't work. Uh, Grace? Yes? How would you like to help me win a bet? <laughs> well, this is a new approach. Good. Now, look, all I need to win is a date with you, see, for tomorrow night. Well, how about it? After the show? Do you want furlough? Maybe. Maybe not. I'll be in town tomorrow night. Got a car with petrol? No, but I will have. You say that like you meant it. I will have a car and gas. When and where? Well, I'm not saying for sure, but be outside at one o'clock in the morning. You may win your bets. So, they met. That was the beginning. Next evening, next morning, rather, Tom was at the appointed place, complete with jeep and fuel. Hi, Gracie. Hello, soldier. Come on, climb aboard. Where'd you get it? 
Let's say I borrowed it. Shall we go? Why not? A boy, a girl, a jeep. In the London blackout without benefit of jerry planes and bombs. A time to relax, to make an impression on the girl. The former bank clerk made his play to the girl who sang club dates on the seamy side of London. It's too bad. No moon tonight. The moon means bombers. At this point, that's not too bad. Oh, that's silly. Oh, look, bombers mean there's a war on. No war, I wouldn't be here. Well, what's good about that, being here? I could itemize. One, I met you. But let's leave it at that. You start early. That's the stage. Don't waste time. You didn't waste time borrowing the Jeep. What's one Jeep, more or less? I worked in the carpool. I know my way around. You must. You went back to get the car. What are you getting, sister? The car. It's out without a pass. So are you. Smart girl. I know my way around. Want to sell the Jeep? I know a fellow will give you a good price. No, I need it. What for? Business. What kind of... Look out! That bike! Gee, thanks. Oh. That's no place for a bike this time of night. <laughs> nor the girl on it. What kind of business? I, uh, I have a small problem. Being out without a pass, I don't get paid. Oh. Money's necessary even in wartime. I had my ways back in L.A. Mm -hmm. Los Angeles to you. But I need a car. You get it, Gracie? Now, if you'd like a small demonstration, we can... Begin. You know, a man boasts to a girl and decides to make good the boast. This very modern variation on that theme consisted of stopping the jeep at the side of the road, cutting the engine, waiting. Half amused, half interested, the girl sat quietly as the soldier climbed out of the car and stationed himself in the shadows. Along the road came the bicycle, the girl on it pedaling swiftly, her thoughts a thousand miles away. She drew alongside the parked, half-hidden jeep. Okay, sister, I'll take that bike. Hey, what's the idea? I've got to get home. I want that bike, you hear? Oh, I won't get it. Shut up. You want one across the mouth? Oh, no. You leave me alone. You leave me alone. You leave me alone. How was that, Gracie? And she left her bag. There ought to be a lot left in it for a couple of beers. So that's the way you do it in L.A.? Yeah. You're all right, Tommy. Only next time, let's crack it for more than the price of a couple of beers. Next time was the next evening, but early, before the bars closed. Gracie, the pin-up said... I won't go to work tomorrow night, and I know a spot off by itself. With a jeep, we can get away fast, like you did it in L.A. And they drove up to the spot, a small pub on a side road, and Gracie said... Let's get to it, Tommy. They've got customers. That means money in the till. But Tommy hesitated, and he said... Too many. Scared? Oh, why take chances? There might even be a cop in there. Maybe later. You promised. You said I'd be the lookout while you went in and collected. Maybe later. Not now. Well, let's do something, Tom. We'll find something. You want a thrill? We'll find something. They drove away. A well-lighted, well-populated pub was not to Tom's liking. He preferred the dark roads, the byways, the lone victims. But Gracie wanted her thrill. Tom found it for her. Pop in, miss. Oh, is it really awfully nice of you? But, Tom... Oh, you wanted a thrill, baby. Well, you'll get it. But where are you headed, miss? Well, out to Kingston, if it's on your way. Yeah, it's on our way. You all set? Let's go. Two girls and a boy racing along the unlighted road toward Kingston. Not much conversation. There never is with a hitchhiker in the car. Tom drove. Gracie waited. River flowed close to the highway. Black glass. Silent in the starlight. What's wrong? I think I have a flat. Oh, I didn't hear it. I said I think I have a flat. Oh. Oh, yes. It, it does feel off a bit. The jeep, I mean. Felt like the left rear. Can I help? But if you'd get out, miss. You can leave your suitcase. The tools are under your seat. Oh, of course. What can I do? I'll need the jack. The handle is on the floor, Gracie. Yeah, I've got it. You, miss. I want your handbag. What? Oh, oh no. No, no, you keep away from me. Give me that bag. Oh, help, somebody. Help. Oh, no, get away from me. Get away. Pick up my dress. Come on, Tubby. Grab her. Drop her up. No, I won't. I won't. I... Gracie, I... quick, give me the jack handle. Here. Let me go. What do you want? Back, 
will you? Hit her again, Tommy. Hit her. What for? She's done. We got her stuff. I think she's breathing. So what? Give me a hand. What do we do with her? Into the river. What do you suppose I picked this place for? Get her feet. Stop, then. Now, into the drink she goes. Oh, Tom. Tom. Well, did you get a thrill out of that, baby? That's the way we do it in L.A. Knock them over and dump them someplace where they won't be found. Okay, let's get going, Gracie. We got places to go and things to do tonight. Nice, clean fun. The end of that night's work was a jackhandle. No, jackhandle. It lies today in the Black Museum. Just a moment, we will continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. It used to be some time before the jack handle came to rest in the Black Museum. A trail of blood and misadventure was yet to be blazed through wartime London. Tom and Grace were amateurs at crime like this. But they knew enough to cover their tracks. They ditched the jeep, parking it in a rubbed street. They took cover during daylight. But night and the blackout were their cloak as they prowled for further victims. I'm sick of walking. Does my lady want her limousine? I want a ride. Do you hear, Tommy boy? I hear. Come on, we'll duck into this vestibule. Something will be along. Give me a kiss. Oh, you never have enough. Haven't kissed a babe in a doorway since L.A. Hmm, good. What's that in your pocket? This? You like it? Shell in the chamber, full clip. Where'd you get it? Army stores, Natch. Pretty? Throw it away. Are you kidding? Do you know what they give you for carrying a pistol in this country? Well, what's the difference? We killed that dame, didn't we? They take us, it's the chair anyway. Well, over here, it's the rope. At 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm cold, Tommy. I'm cold. You cold? Maybe you're the warmest thing in London. What's that, a car? Must be. Come on. Throw the pistol away. You want to ride, don't you? Hey, driver, give us a lift. He's stopping for us. Obliging fellow, isn't he? Where to, Yank? Your way, towards Shepherd's Bush. My girl's got kind of tired of walking. This is awfully nice of you. Well, a taxi, you know. Private car with hat prices. I'll have to charge you for the ride. Well, we don't mind, do we, honey? We got plenty of money. Hop in. In the back. Private car with hack license. Driver James Carter. Direction east. Through the blackouts. The blue shaded headlights barely glowing in the gloom. After a little distance. Driver, we changed our minds. How much would it cost me to go a little way further? Out as far as Shepherd's Bush. Driver Carter obliged. It was his job. Pick up passengers, deliver them through the blackout, wherever they wanted to go for a price. A living of sorts. Driver Carter thought of it as a living. It's plenty deserted out here. The Jerry's did a thorough job out this way. It's near the docks, isn't it? I suppose so. Well, it's a good place. Perfect. You think he's got any money? All right, driver, stop here. Yes, sir. Nothing here but the rubble. You heard me stop. You know what this is? Service pistol. You hold it, Gracie. Got it. Now don't move, driver. She's got an itchy finger. It, you can have my wallet. Keep him covered, Gracie, while I open the front door. Give me back the gun. Hurry, Tom. All right, you, driver, get out. On this side. Either you can have a car, too. Just leave me alone. Gracie, did you ever see the hole a forty-five makes in a man? No, Tommy. Never. No, God! <sighs> Big enough to put your fist through the back where it came out. Let's toss him in the rubble. That'll do it. Now we can ride anywhere you want to go. It doesn't take much to kill a man. You pull the trigger... The firing pin strikes the cartridge, the powder explodes. And a bit of lead tears into the man, that's all. Nothing left but a few chemicals, which once were living flesh. A few rags of clothing. 
toss it into the rubble. Dust to dust. Dawn. Dawn comes to the warring city. The sun touches the rubble. The sun moves warmly over the cold rubble over the dead. The night watchers start home. The fire wardens, weary but relieved after a quiet night, take a shortcut toward their breakfasts and a few hours sleep. Marty. Hey, what's that? Body, seems like. This area was cleared out months ago. He's fresh, that one. Yeah, let's have a look, shall we? They had their look. It wasn't pleasant. Shot through the chest. Stay here. I'll find a call box. The fire warden placed his call. He rang straight through to Scotland Yard. A short while later, a man picked up the telephone on his desk inside the Greystone building on the Thames. Inspector Mason here. Sergeant Davis, sir. Go ahead, Sergeant. The body found in the East End, sir, shot to death. Large caliber from the size of the wound. Probably a service pistol. Uh -huh. Identified as yet? The identity papers are still on him, sir. James Carter, taxi driver, private car registration, tag number RD7445. Uh -huh. The car? No sign of it, sir. Tire marks in the road. It's a thoroughly bombed area, sir. Very little traffic. Uh, another one. Very well. Send out the usual teletype. Description of the car. You know, check for relations, friends of the deceased. Well, that's all we can do for now. Routine. The teletype to all police stations. The constables memorize the details while they go on patrol. Lauders is a big, sprawling city. The blackout isn't any help. That's all for now. The wheels had begun to turn. Routine, inexorable, never ending. And so, another telephone call. Constable Gray, Inspector. Yes? Ladbrook Station. I believe I have the car that was posted this morning. Uh huh. RD 7445. Black sedan. It's parked in Bush Mules. Yeah. That's a dead end, sir. It's facing out. Oh, very good, Gray. Stand by. We'll be along shortly. A sharp-eyed constable on the blackout, the park car. Uh, routine. Inexorable. Inevitable. Cut your engine, Sergeant. This will do it. Yes, sir. Usual routine. If there's an attempt to drive out, turn on your headlights. The driver will be blinded. Very good, sir. Gray. Constable Gray. Yes, sir. Inspector Mason, CID. Anything yet? Uh, no, sir, not yet. There's a pinhole in the blackout curtain second story window of the house behind the car. There was a light up there. Mm -hmm. yeah, nothing now. It went out a moment ago, sir. I take press behind the car, Gray. Accost anyone who approaches it. The area's covered. There'll be no escape. Yes, sir. The constable's footsteps fade and stop. Silence. Darkness. The trap is set. They wait. No movement, no sound. Not even the glow of a cigarette. Just Darker shadows in the darkness. In the depths of the little muse, a door opens and closes. Footsteps briefly, two pairs of footsteps. A car door opens. And Constable Gray calls out. Don't start the engine there. You're under arrest. Sergeant, your lights. Tommy, the coppers. They got us boxed. Gray, you won't take me. Hold him, Gray. Got him, sir. You got nothing on me. Never mind that. It's my duty to inform you that you're under arrest. You'll be charged with murder. And I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. You can't prove anything. Run the rule on it, Constable. Yes, sir. Uh, this, sir, service pistol. Oh, good enough. Take them along. All right, you two. Don't touch me. I'll go along. He made me go with him. He threatened me with a pistol. He made me go along. <laughs> That was the trial, all through the trial which followed swiftly. That was the plea of the tawdry little pin-up from the seamy side of London. He made me do it. He hit me, showed me his pistol. He made me do it. Front of the robberies, the cheap, shilling-sized robberies. 
Yes, I took that girl's purse. I went through the driver's wallet before before we left his body, but he made me do it. You've got to believe me. He made me do it. <laughs> there were other far less hysterical witnesses, men who spoke with a calm certainty of truth. I was the ballistics expert. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt. The bullet which killed James Carter, the driver of that hired car, uh, was found in the flooring of the car. We have compared it with test bullets fired from the pistol found on the accused. The rifling marks are identical. The death bullet was fired from that pistol. Tom Bennett, accused of murder, wanted for desertion by the United States Army, former bank clerk. He played his role defiantly. I tell you, she's framing me. This whole deal was her idea. You should have seen the bang she got when she watched what was going on. Now she's trying to pass the buck to me. And with customary thoroughness, Scotland Yard turned up a surprise witness. Yes, those are the two. She gave him the jack handle and he hit me with it. They threw me in the river. The lorry driver found me. I know them anywhere. He made me go along. He made me. I'll prove it. I'll show you where we left the jeep. The jack handle's still in it. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, my lord. Let the prisoners face the jury. What is your verdict? We find both defendants guilty of murder and had a recommendation of mercy for the female prisoner. <laughs> Oh, yes, juries behave somewhat strangely at times. This one was impressed with a plea of compulsion, but not quite enough, it seems, to acquit Grace Harwell. Thus, it came about in due course that the judge pronounced the sentence. Thomas Bennett, you have been found guilty of murder. The sentence of the court is that you be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And then may the Lord have mercy on your soul. On Grace Harwell, the judge pronounced the same terrible sentence. But the jury's recommendation for mercy led the Home Secretary to commute this to penal servitude for life. A lifetime for Grace Harwell to remember. He made me go along. He made me go along. No, Jack Handel. It lies today in the Black Museum. So much for the story of Grace and Tom. Tom's life ended on the scaffold. The life of Grace Harwell continues in the drab monotony of Holloway Prison. The service pistol, of course, and the Jack Handel remain in their places, their special places of honor, on a shelf in that curious room which is known in Scotland Yard as the Black Museum. And now, until next time, till we meet again in the same place, and I tell you another story of the Black Museum, I remain as always obediently yours. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum, a repository of death. Yes, here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide, where everyday objects, a teapot, a sewing needle, a folding camera, all are touched by murder.
Here's a handkerchief. A khaki handkerchief. Soldier's handkerchief. It's a common enough sort of thing during the war. A handkerchief, Stark. Fairly clean, if a bit moldy. That would be from exposure, Thompson. Looks like army issue. It is, but no hero used it. You can bet on that. Well, that handkerchief can be seen today in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Here we are at the Black Museum in Scotland Yard. Just come into this silent room. Outside, the Thames is busy with London's river traffic, and just upstairs, police communications tap from the teletypes, ring from the telephones. But here, as I say, is silence. Now, here's a length of garden hose. Once it was connected to an exhaust of a car. From there up through the floorboards. The time was winter. The driver rode with all the windows closed and the car crashed. The man died. It wasn't exactly an accident. No, it was murder. Here's a German Mauser. War trophy, heavy gun. Strange, a tiny woman held it with two hands. Smudged her own fingerprints. She was found out. Her hands gave her away. The paraffin test, you know, for gunpowder smoke. Ah, there we are. Here it is, the khaki handkerchief. Originally, it was intended for camouflage. Fairly shouted for recognition at the right time in the wrong place. Yet the trouble first appeared is the commonplace ringing of a telephone. Hello? Mrs. Lyons? Yes. This is Liz Hart. How are you? Fine. And you? All right. I'm a little worried, though. Kathy's is so late getting home. Is she with Doris? Well, they're not here. I thought Doris was with Kathy at your house. Oh, dear. Now, where have they got to? Oh, probably stop at one of their friends' houses. Now, don't you worry. Kathy will come home with my Doris, and both of them will be full of... So joy. ordinary, so commonplace. One mother worries, the other doesn't. And later... Around six, the warrior, Mrs. Hard, Kathy's mother, speaks to her husband. You'll have to speak to Kathy when she gets home. Isn't she home? It's practically dinner time. And I thought she was in her room. She's off somewhere. Oh, John, I'm so worried. You call the places where she might be? Hours ago. No one's seen her. Well, we'll have to wait until 6.30. Then I suppose we'll have to start looking for her. Oh, when will Kathy learn to let us know? 6.30. No Kathy, no word from Kathy. This time the telephone rings in the Hart household. Mrs. Lyons is calling Mrs. Hart. Yes. I assumed you'd call me if Doris turned up with Kathy at your house. Oh, dear, I wonder where they can have gotten to. A frantic Mrs. Hart cradled the telephone, looks to her husband. Together they leave the house, go out into the darkening street to ring doorbells. I'm sorry to disturb you, but I'm trying to find my girl. But the Carters haven't seen Kathy. It's you, us, old man, but our Kathy seems to be among the unaccounted for. No, the Bradleys haven't seen Kathy. Sorry to bother you. Have you seen anything of our girl? No, the Corbetts haven't seen Kathy. Oh, please, I'm almost frantic. Where's my girl? No one, no one has seen Kathy. No one's seen Doris. Word is getting around now. The rumors spread. The time goes later. All of Penn, rustic Penn in Buckinghamshire, is buzzing now. At the inn, the tap room is crowded. Closing time draws near. Still, no word. Uh, Penn in, landlord speaking. Oh, this is John Hart. Look, Lyons and I are together at my place. Do you think some of the men would help us start a search? Oh, I'll ask them, Mr. Hart. I'm sure they will. Now, you stay right where you are. We'll be along very soon. Can I have your attention, men? Your attention, men. Hart and Lyons need help. 
They want to start a search. Now, how many of you fellas will help? After all, neighbors and neighbors. And if we can't So help... it begins. The long, hard search continues. It's six hours now they've been missing. It's dark, very, very little more. The lanterns of the searchers move around the village of Penn through the fields and the clumps of trees in ever-widening circles. The men beat the fields. At the heart home, two mothers wait and wait and wait. Yes? Nothing yet, dear. Try not to worry. Oh, nothing yet. The sun rides high above the fields and woods of Buckinghamshire. Sun passes its course, descending behind the hills to the west. Already the searchers, hundreds of them now, have moved outward from Penn, some four miles outward. The night is coming on. The doorbell rings. Yes? Uh, just on my way to the inn, ma'am, for more lanterns. Just to tell you, we'll keep at it all night, if need be. Then there's nothing yet. Night again. Now the police are in the search, and within a group of soldiers from a nearby camp, steadily, monotonously, the men work their voices subdued, the lanterns bobbing and weaving over the countryside, outward, always outward from ten, five miles now, six miles. As the radius lengthens, there's more ground to cover. False dawn grazes the sky to the east, and the morning star low in the west begins to pale. This way! Hello! You found something, matey? I found something. Yeah? Covered with believes they were. Just, just behind me here. Yeah. Found. The weary men brought the terribly tragic news back to Penn. In the little wood with its running stream where the bodies were found, two of Scotland Yard's inspectors, Thompson and Stark, took over together. Now was the time for professionals at manhunting. Got stock. Not much. Barely anything to go on. Gas mask container. Wooden. Out near the road. I don't think they were killed here, do you? No, chances are against that. One of the men brought me this. A handkerchief, Stark. Fairly clean, if a bit mouldy. That would be from exposure, Thompson. Looks like army issue. It is, but no hero used it. You can bet on that. There are tire marks and an oil patch over to the right. Truck tires. Double rear wheels. Army truck, it looks like. Plaster casts. The men are making them now. Army truck, army handkerchief. Anything else? Not yet. All right, let's get out of here. We've got a killer to find. They know the routine, these two. But grimly, they set about the work. Stark takes the gas mask container, the plaster casts, the handkerchief to the experts at the yard. Thompson stays on in pen. He visits a different kind of yard. Doris and Kathy were once my pupils, Inspector. I have a very personal reason for wanting to help you. But just how can I? It doesn't need me to tell you, Miss, how observant children can be. Now, it occurred to me that some of the kiddies in your school who live near the Hart's home might have noticed something unusual on their way back from school. Of course, it's only a shot in the dark, but a child might remember something that a grown-up would forget. I see what you mean, Inspector. Right then. Now, who in your class lives near the Hearts? Let me see now. Linda Carter. Oh, yes, and Kenneth Bradley. They're playing just over there. Come with me. Now then, what's your name, young lady? Linda. Linda Carter. And yours, my lad? Kenneth Bradley, sir. I understand you two both live in the same street as the Hearts. Yes, sir. I live next door. Kenneth's a couple of houses down. Right, Kenneth? Yes, sir. Now, I know you'd like to help me if you could. I think your teacher told you I'm from Scotland Yard. She sure did. You 
You don't look like a detective. Detectives usually don't look like detectives. Now, let me tell you something. We're looking for a truck, a large, heavy truck. An army truck, maybe? Maybe. Why, did you see one, say, day before yesterday? Yes, sir, at the crossroads, just standing there. Oh, I saw it, too. It, it was a big one. Oh, anyone in it? Just the driver. He had an awful red face, and he had glasses on with silver rims. He was sitting there smoking. Can you tell me anything about the truck? Yeah, no, I, I just remember the man in it. It looked like a wireless truck, but it didn't have any aerial. There were those big double wheels on the back, and a number 44 on the door, and a red and blue square on one side, and the tailboard had some letters. J.B., I think. And on the front bumper, there was Bat C.P.M. Battery C. Prime Mover. Uh, anything else, Kenneth? Not that I can think of, sir. No, sir. How old do you think the driver was, Linda? Oh, 26. You seem very sure. Did you ask him? No, sir. But he looked about my father's age, and Daddy's 26. I heard him say so. Thank you, Linda. You too, Ken. You've been very helpful. When you come to London, I'll see to it that you're shown through the yard. You'll like that, I'm sure, eh? Inspector Thompson sought out his colleague Stark at Scotland Yards. I've got good descriptions. The truck and the driver. How about you, Ahmed? Laundry mark and the handkerchief. Print on gas mask container, that's all. Anybody seen them in the truck? A man and a woman, about a mile apart, along the line from the school towards where... where they were found. Any numbers in the truck? Battery, regiment and division insignia. That laundry mark's going through the mill. H2503 is being checked in every laundry in the county of Buckingham. Good. I'll get on to Army Intelligence. We'll find that truck, the outfit that uses it, and the man who drives it. A leaky axle drips oil, does it? We'll see about that. Well, that handkerchief can be seen today in the Black Museum. Now it was routine, except for the unforgettable sight of leaf-shrouded bodies in the wood. The mechanics of tracing a laundry marker, routine. The preservation of plaster casts of tire marks, that's routine, grim routine. With an inevitability about it, pursuing the routine, Inspector Thompson called on the intelligence and spoke with a colonel whose main function was liaison with the civilian police. Those are the details, Colonel. Well, uh, I have it all down. Large number, 4-4, red and blue square, JB on the tailboard. Yes. Battery C, PM on the front bumper. That's it. Sounds like one of those Fords and 6x6s we've been getting for our field artillery. I'll call you back, Inspector. Thank you. Like war, crime detection is largely a matter of waiting, waiting for information, waiting for results when the wanted alarms are sent out, waiting for a suspect to appear at a certain place. And now Thompson and Stark waited for answers to the inquiries in a matter of hours. The answers began to come in. There's a report on the laundry mark, Thompson. Ties in with a series given an army outfit stationed about five miles outside of Penn Village. It begins to fit. It begins to fit. Patiently, grimly, the two men went on waiting. Once again, the telephone. Inspector Thompson here. Colonel Gardner, Inspector. I have your information. Here he comes, Stark. Good. Go ahead, Colonel. But that truck apparently belongs to the... 44th Battalion, Devonshire Blues. A battery C prime mover. Where is that outfit, sir? They've been in camp five miles outside Penn Village. They've just been moved to Yoxford on the south coast for the field training. Thank you, Colonel. Shall I advise the CO down there to expect you? If you would, it should take us about, about two hours. You move fast, don't you? I'll tell him. And good hunting. Hope you get your man. Thank you again, sir. If he's still with that outfit, we'll get him. If he's still alive, we'll get him. Yoxford, Stark. Get a car and a driver. We're going to the country. Traffic was light in gasoline rationed England. Some two hours later, Thompson and Stark conferred with a major commanding the battalion. Yes, we do have a prime mover with a leaky axle, gentlemen. As a matter of fact, it's in the shed just outside. May we see it, Major? Yes, of course. This way. Uh, 
I have the tire cast stock. Good. And our accommodations are still a bit primitive. No proper garage facilities. We just moved into this setup day before yesterday. We understand, Major. You've been having much trouble with that truck? Oh, yes, yes. A few days ago, just before we broke camp near Penn, and that's over in Buckinghamshire. Yes, we know the place. Uh, we released the truck to the maintenance depot. Apparently, there isn't much they can do with it. The main differential is a problem. Ah, well, there we are. JB on the tailboard. Have a look at the inside, will you? I'll take the tires and the markings. Check. 44 on the door, yes. Big enough. The lad could hardly miss it. Red and blue square. Uh, our battery shoulder patch, Inspector. Yes, I thought so. Markings all checked. Let me see now. The tires. Now, oh, fall in here, Thompson. Yes, tires check with the cast stock. Well, we expected that. Here's something on the top wallet. What do you make of these stains? Want a guess, old man? Oh, your guess is as good as mine. And it'll be confirmed by pathology. Blood. I think we're through here, Major. Maybe go back to your office, please. Blood on the tarpaulin. Crumpled up and tossed into a corner of the truck. I don't think they were killed here, do you? No. Chances are against that. No blood around here. But blood on the tarpaulin in the truck. The two detectives and the Major went back to the orderly room. Oh, I think we'd better see the driver of that truck, Major. Oh, yes, of course. Um, Sergeant Carroll. Yes? Do you know who drives the prime mover for Battery C? Oh, uh, that'll be uh, Driscoll, sir. Oh, where is he now? Oh, I expect he's in the battery day room, sir. Oh, bring him over, will you? Uh, with his gear, duffel bag, the whole outfit. Yes, sir. The sergeant turned and left. The Major with Thompson and Stark waited silently, each busy with his own thoughts. An army is a cross-section of the population, they say. If this Driscoll did this thing, part of that cross-section, I suppose. For that blood stain. I hope there's enough for pathology to type it. Lawn remarks. His shirts and underwear ought to have the same mark as the handkerchief. If he's the man. In the day room of Battery C, the situation was normal. The sergeant walked in without attracting too much attention. Oh, here you are, Driscoll. Well, what's up, Sarge? You are. Major wants you. Well, what's wrong now? He didn't tell me. Let's get over to quarters first. Well, what for? Major wants to see your gear. All of it. Oh. Let's go. Was the waiting over? Out of the seeming anonymity of the army, had they found their man, and so quickly... In my office, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Oh! Can I just go, Major? Thank you, Sergeant. Dismiss. At ease, Driscoll. Thank you, sir. This is Inspector Thompson and Inspector Stark, Scotland Yard. They have some questions, Driscoll. Answer them. I'll try, sir. Oh, well, he's all yours, gentlemen. May I examine your duffel bag, Driscoll? Of course, sir. The blouse is rather wet, isn't it? Caught in the rain, sir. Must have been quite a rain to go through the pockets like this. It was, sir. You're sure you didn't wash it yourself and pack it before it was dried? No, sir. It was the rain, sir. How do you explain the shirt, the cuffs cut off like this? Came back from the laundry with the cuffs all frayed. I cut them off. I only used a shirt around the tractor. I see. Driscoll, does this handkerchief look familiar to you? Like any other handkerchief, Inspector. Thompson. The laundry marks. Here, collar of the shirt. I see it. We'll try again, Driscoll. Look at the laundry marks on the shirt and on the handkerchief. Seems to be yours, doesn't it? I wouldn't know about laundry marks. They're identical, aren't they? Have you had a handkerchief like this recently? All the army issue is the same, sir. We get a lot of trouble getting things back from the laundry. Someone else could have had this handkerchief. Oh, rather a careless laundry, Driscoll. Sorry, sir. Yes, sir. Have a look at this tarpaulin, Driscoll. Yes, sir. What's your guess about those stains? Grease, sir. That shape? That color? Might be blood, sir. This tarpaulin comes from your truck, Driscoll. I never saw the stain, sir. Might be someone swapped this one for mine. Driscoll, where were you on the 19th, three days ago? Maintenance depot. Repairs. Leaky axle. Did they repair it? Well, they couldn't. Not in the time we had before we moved down here. I see. Anything else, Stark? Not at the moment. Major, we'd appreciate it if you'd hold this man under escort. There are still a few inquiries to be made. Yes, of course, Inspector. Oh, Sergeant, in here, please. 
There were still the loose ends on identification on the laundry problem. Driscoll wore horn-rimmed glasses. Inspector Thompson asked some more questions. I see, Corporal. He wore army issue and suddenly he bought himself the horn frame. You joked with him about it and he didn't like it. Grew angry, did he? Inspector Stark visited the regimental laundry depot. No complaints from Gunner Driscoll about losing things for him. Never tore or frayed his shirts. I see. Thank you. Stark stayed with the shirt. A battery made of Driscoll's had noticed the missing cuffs. The night you rolled in here, you noticed the cuffs missing. That was the night of the 20th. Very good. Inspector Thompson turned up an interesting item. Say that again, Sergeant. The night we came in here, we heard about those two in the woods. We were shooting the breeze about it in the day room. All at once, sir, Driscoll looks around and says, uh, ten to one, there's a murderer in here. That's what. And once again, a telephone. Yes? Oh, it's for you, Inspector. Thank you, Major. Inspector Thompson speaking. He did? I see. It's been checked at criminal records. Good. Very good. Yes, of course I wanted the word at once. Thank you very much. They found something? The crew we left at Payne turned up the second gas mask container. Metal, this one, had a print on it. They checked in criminal records. The fingerprint belongs to an Oscar Driscoll. Served a term eight years ago for molesting and impairing the morals of a minor. Oscar Driscoll, you're under arrest. The charge is willful murder of Kathy Hart and Doris Lyons on the afternoon of October the 19th. Well, that handkerchief can be seen today in the Black Museum. The defense, of course, was insanity. The defense tried to prove that Driscoll suffered from schizophrenia, split personality, that he had no recollection of what he'd done and therefore no legal responsibility. The jury brought in its verdict and finally, this man died at the hands of the public executioner. There was apparently no doubt in the minds of the jury that this man had known and planned exactly what he'd done. At any rate, the khaki handkerchief remains in its usual place in Scotland Yard in the Black Museum. And now, until next time, till we meet again in the same place, and I tell you another story of the Black Museum, I remain as always obedient for yours. Speaking from London. The Black Museum. A repository of death. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames which houses Scotland Yard is a warehouse of homicide. Where everyday objects, a crumpled newspaper, a tin can of lighter fluid, a small radio, all are touched by murder. A mandolin string. Familiar object. I'm told, Inspector, that mandolins are mighty popular with the young folk these days. Popular? Yes, they are. However, I'm rather happy to say their popularity is confined to music, not to murder. <laughs> Today, this mandolin string can be found in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear the Black Museum starring... Orson Welles. Well, here we are in the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Here lies death, 
arranged neatly on the shelves and tables open to your view. Now, here's a spoon. It's a simple household spoon. Our murderer was meticulous. With this, he measured out a careful dose of poison. That oar up there on the wall, that was used by the stroke of a famous rowing aid at Henley. Later, it was used in anger, swung at a man who stood on the edge of a pier, stunning him. The man drowned in the Thames very quickly. Ah, here are the mandolin string. Just a coil of rust-spotted wire now. String from a mandolin. A relic of another era. An era of polished carriages, well-groomed horses, simple, sedate living, Edwardian England, and Louise Evans. Louise, my dear. Stuart, darling, I'm playing for you. In more ways than one, she's playing for you, Stuart. Louise, you've got to listen. Go ahead, son. She'll listen. Just say the right words. Louise, I love you. you. You're adorable. You're getting closer, Stuart. You're doing better now. Louise, my darling, will you marry me? At last. That's the way, Stuart. You see? I told you she was playing for you. The church organ, not Louise's mandolin, played them up the aisle at June. They were quite happy, quite domestic particularly on the quiet winter evenings. You're looking very well tonight, Louise. Thank you, dear. Anything of interest in the newspaper, Stuart? No. Nothing you'd want to know about. Oh, Stuart, darling, mm -hmm. I wonder if you'd mind... Something you want, sweet? Well, Maisie's gone to her room. I hate to disturb her. Let me get it for you, whatever it is. Oh, thank you, dear. It's just that... Uh... Yes? Well, you may think it's a little odd, but... Come well, now. I, uh, I have this funny little desire for a, a glass of wine. <laughs> Don't apologize, darling. There's nothing wrong in a glass of wine. Is there any in the pantry? Well, no, dear, that's just it. A trip down to the cellar. Not another word. My pleasure is to serve you, my dear. The husband gets up. He puts his newspaper aside and leaves the room where his pretty young wife sits by the fireside. Walks down the hallway to the cellar entrance pausing on the way to pick up a candle from the table by the stairs. Lights the candle, opens the little doorway. The candle flickers, casting a fitful yellow light, darkening the shadows where its beams fail to penetrate. Stuart Mason starts down the stairs. Stuart! Stuart! Oh! Stuart, answer me! Maybe... Maisie, help me! Help! Oh, what is it, madam? What is it? Oh, quickly! Run for Dr. Lipton. Oh. Mr. Mason's fallen down the cellar stairs. He's, he's hurt. I'm afraid, I'm afraid he's badly hurt. Oh, it must be a terrible shock, Mrs. Mason. I know. If you take a sleeping powder. Oh, no, doctor. Oh, it was my fault. My silly wish for a glass of wine. If I hadn't asked him. Oh, Doctor, the least I can do is to face my grief. That's the least I can do for poor Stuart. If you wish, Mrs. Mason, I understand. <laughs> Death is a terrible thing. When it comes so suddenly to one so young, it is most terrible of all. Yes, it is terrible. A broken neck falling down the cellar stairs by flickering candlelight on a simple and hardly necessary errand. My dear, as a close friend of both your late husband and yourself, I feel justified in asking you to contain your grief. After all, you're young, and if I may say so, pretty. Nelson, you are sweet. I simply do not know how I would have lived through these long, long months without poor dear Stuart's friends, particularly you. This brings me to a point, my dear. I I've meant to discuss it with you... I begin to feel something slightly more than respect for you, Louise. If I may take the liberty... Nelson, watch your words. Look out, Nelson. Pretty blonde widow with wide blue eyes. So delicate and fragile. Watch your step. Oh, my loneliness in this house. At night, the 
floors creak. They seem to try to speak with me. Maisie does her best, but it's still so... so... Well, you know, you're lonely too, aren't you? I must confess, Louise, that I am. Now see here, young lady, we're going to start a new life for you. Oh, Nelson. Uh, some cream for Mrs. Church, Maisie. Yes, madam. Oh, thank you. You know, Louise, this is the nicest idea. Having coffee with our men folk, I mean. I always hated the idea of the ladies withdrawing while the men had their port alone after dinner. Well, I, I can't say I mind when our hostess is as lovely a bride as Louise. Hey, Nelson, do you agree, old man? Of course I agree. After all, I married her. <laughs> How you men do go on. Don't they, Alice? <gasps> Let them, dear. It's one of their few pleasures. I have another pleasure I want to share with you, Alice. Friend? Yes, Nelson? Louise's absolute talent with the mandolin. Oh, Nelson, please. The mandolin, yes, I seem to remember you played very well, Louise. Oh, do, Louise, please. Oh, well, uh, really, I... Well, my, my talent is so small. Oh. No, we won't take no for an answer, darling. Here it is. Now, what shall your first selection be? <gasps> Oh, dear. One of the strings is missing. Oh, missing? Well, uh, I, I was uh, uh, tuning it yesterday. Oh, one of the strings broke. And I didn't get downtown to buy a new one. Oh, I am sorry. Truly, I am. Uh, perhaps next time you're here. Too bad. Really too bad. It have been so nice. Recently married young lady with a gaily beribboned mandolin in her lap in a lamplit room. It would have been so nice. In fact, as they prepared for sleep... Nelson Carter said just that. Bad about your mandolin string, dear. It would have been so nice to hear you play tonight. Ooh. What is it, dear? Oh, the sheets are icy. It must be really cold outside. Well, Fred Church said it was. And you are so susceptible to colds. Darling, we've got to have a hot water bottle. Well, ring for Maisie, why don't you? Well, she was exhausted, poor dear. She worked so hard cooking and serving dinner. It seems unfair to disturb her. All right, I'll get it. Do you know where it is? Mm, in the kitchen cabinet, dear. Uh, right in front. All right. I'd better take a candle. Uh, and use the back stairs, darling. It's shorter that way. Once again, a young man lights his way through a dark house toward a steep stairway by the flickering flame of a candle. Once again, a young man makes his way along a carpeted hallway, starts a hurried descent of wooden stairs. <laughs> mistress will rest now. I gave her a sedative. Oh, oh, poor woman. Oh, poor, poor child. Poor. This will be the second fortune she inherits. Hardly poor. <gasps> Two accidents like that. Oh, doctor, it's like the poor girl was a curse. Aye, it is. Well, things like this happen. As you say, two accidents and so much alike. I shall probably recommend that your mistress builds herself a new house with no cellar and all on one floor. Whatever for, sir? No stairs, my girl. No stairs for anyone to fall down and break his neck. Well, I'm on my way. No visitors allowed. No until visitors. Tomorrow, maybe. And no stairs in a new house. Well, perhaps. Certainly for another year at least the mandolin will be silent. I think that that may be counted upon. That and the widow's weeds and the tearful glances from wide blue eyes. Of course, there was one item that no one counted on. You uh, sent for me, Inspector. I did, Peck. What do you think of this? Uh, hmm. Anonymous, sir. Yes. Read it, will you? Uh, Inspector Higley, don't file this letter in the waste paper basket. Hmm. I am not writing it without due thought and consideration. I cannot let you have my name as yet. But think of this. Two young men of wealth and standing in the community have died via falls downstairs with broken necks as the consequences. Don't you think at least a perfunctory investigation is called for? 
Don't you think so? And it's signed, An Anxious Friend. Yes. Well, Sergeant? Well, someone with an education, really. Someone who hints he or she will come forward if we find anything. I cannot let you have my name yet. Yes, uh, I noticed that, sir. Oh, Sergeant, wear your best suit tomorrow. You and I are going calling on a young widow in Oxford Street. I understand she plays the mandolin. Rather well, in fact. Rather well. Yes, she played rather well. And a string of that mandolin on which she played can be seen today in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with the Black Museum starring Orson Welles. Two young men dead with broken necks. Both cases certified. Accidental death. And then an anonymous letter. Inspector Higley and Sergeant Peck paid their call. In fact, they paid two calls. The first on Dr. Lipton. I'm rather glad you dropped in, Inspector. I know there's been whispering. Two unfortunate accidents like this. It would lead to rumors. Rumors? I see. Such as... Mm, the usual thing that Stuart Evans and Nelson Carter may have been uh, uh, helped to fall down the stairs. You mean pushed? Mm, something of the sort. And your opinion, Doctor? My opinion is certified on the death certificate, sir. Accidental deaths, both of them. I see. Well, thank you, Doctor. I'm glad you're so certain. Yes, the good doctor appears quite certain. Nonetheless, Inspector Higley and Sergeant Peck made their second visit. Oh, I'm so glad you came to see me, Inspector. Thank you. It's not too often that the police are welcome. Oh, I... I suppose not. But... Well, I... I can't help hearing about the things that people are saying. Maisie brings home so many odd tales. I was wondering, Mrs... <gasps> Sergeant, interested in music? Uh, quite a good-looking instrument, ma'am. Hmm. I shall never play it again. Oh? Why not? Both Nelson and Stuart loved the music. I... I cannot get over the fact that I took a mean excuse and refused to play the night that... that Nelson died. Oh? An excuse? Yes. You see... The churches, Alice and Fred, were here. I see. Nelson was pressing me to play. I, I refused. Mm -hmm. I, I used a missing string as an excuse. When I had a stock of strings on hand and could have replaced the missing one. I refused Nelson that last pleasure. Tell me, do you always keep a stock of mandolin strings on hand, ma'am? Yes, in the cold weather I do. I see. When the temperature drops, the strings seem to get... Brittle. Quiet. Uh, they break quite easily. And uh, where do you buy your mandolin strings, Mrs. Carter? At Murchison's music shop on the high street. Oh, Inspector. Yes? Sergeant, I appeal to you as men of the world. Can't you help me scotch these dreadful things that people are saying? Can you? Would you? Please? The inspector and the sergeant said they'd try, and they did. Their business was facts. One fact turned up immediately upon a contact with Mr. Murchison at the music shop on High Street. He showed me the bill of sale, Inspector. Uh-huh. She bought the strings, sent the maid for him with a written order three days after this Carter fellow was buried. Hmm. Interesting. Now, why would a woman who says she had a stock of strings on hand the night her husband died and says further that she'll never play again buy mandolin strings shortly after the funeral? An interesting contradiction in dates and actions. A further interesting contradiction came to light some three months later. Another of those anonymous letters, Sergeant. Just, she's playing that mandolin again. I seem to remember, Sergeant, that Mrs. Carter told us she'd never touched the instrument again. Such contradictory behavior seemed to indicate another call. The inspector dropped in on Louise Evans Carter to her mandolin. <laughs> Inspector Higley, how nice. All right, Maisie. Yes, madam. Uh, Inspector, uh, my friend Clifford West. How do you do, sir? Inspector, I'm afraid you've caught me in a fib. Is that very bad? A fib? Well, it couldn't be bad. Not from you, Louise. I don't quite follow, Mrs. Carter. <laughs> I told you some time ago I'd never play my mandolin again. And you've heard me playing. Yes, so you did. 
And so I have. But there must be a good reason, I assume. Oh, but there is. You tell him, Clifford, dear. As it happens, sir, we are both very, very happy, and music seemed extremely apropos. You see, sir, Mrs. Carter, Louise, has just done me the honor to consent to be my wife. Number three. The inspector sensed the tension in Midhaven. He waited. All of Midhaven seemed to be waiting with him. The first action came from an unexpected quarter. Inspector Higley, I demand you trace this letter for me at once. May I see your letter, sir? Here. I see. Mr. West, two men have died with broken necks. Are you the third? Are you entering the den of the tigress? Tracing a letter like this is not the easiest. There was no question in the inspector's mind that the author of Clifford West's letter was the same party who'd written the two notes addressed to the inspector himself. A brief comparison of the handwriting removed what little doubt the inspector had. And Sergeant Peck dropped in on the small Midhaven post office. This your postmark? That's right, sir. Of course it is. Ever see this envelope before? Well, maybe. Maybe not. I've seen hundreds like it. You can buy that cheap kind in any stationery shop in Midhaven. Blank, Inspector. Nothing. I uh, expected as much. Do you think that West fellow will be scared off, sir? I doubt it. Sergeant, take this copy over to the Midhaven Gazette, will you? I want it run in every edition for a week. Uh, think you'll get an answer, sir? Well, remember the first letter. I cannot let you have my name as yet. Uh-huh. Uh, perhaps the party concerned will feel now is the time to reveal himself or herself, as the case may be. That promise of absolute privacy may do the trick. I saw your advertisement, Inspector. I came. I hope you can protect me if I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I sincerely do hope so. Your confidence will be respected, Mrs. Church. Thank you, sir. I, I trust you don't feel there's any jealousy involved. Of any kind. My job is facts, ma'am. Do you have any? I don't know. You see, Stuart and Nelson, both were young men of whom my husband and I were very fond. Uh-huh. And I... Well, I remember so distinctly how disturbed Louise seemed when we asked her to play that night. She seemed upset over our discovery of the missing string on that mandolin. I... Uh, I guess that's all, Inspector. It's not very much, is it? No. No, it's not. But it seems so peculiar. And the mandolin, always that mandolin. Inspector, how could a mandolin be used to kill anyone? I don't know yet, even if anyone was killed. However, I'd like to find out. Mrs. Church, have you any idea of Mrs. Carter's social engagements? I mean, when, for instance, is she probably out of her house for a length of time? You can advise us as to any such matter. It seems Mrs. Carter attended the ladies' auxiliary the local church each Wednesday afternoon, an activity a respectable young widow would be expected to enjoy. And it was Wednesday afternoon when the inspector and the sergeant called. The mistress isn't in, sir. I doubt if she'll be too long. May we wait? If you wish to, sir. The inspector went into the sitting room. The sergeant drifted toward the kitchen. Maisie, safely occupied by the good sergeant, Inspector Higley, swiftly found the cellar stairs, carefully moved down, examining each step, each lift, and tread, each section of the baseboard. Halfway down. Well, interesting to say the least. Upstairs now to the back stairway. Again, the careful examination. Again, about halfway down. They'll do it every time. Every single time. Then quietly into the kitchen. Sergeant? Uh, yes, sir? I don't think we'll wait any longer. I'm sorry, sir. The mistress went along to the vestry and she ought to be Oh, there that's and... all right. Just tell her we called, will you? Come along, Sergeant. We'll drop back another. Time. And the two policemen left the house to return to the inspector's office. It's something, Sergeant. Not much, but something. It convinces me, sir. And me. But how about a jury? I don't know, sir. Of course, if we had a bit more... The... The nails themselves, sir. And then, yes. And then there's the business of buying that stock of mandolin strings. Sergeant, uh, we'll drop in on Mrs. Carter this evening. Do you by any chance play the mandolin? It was nice of you to come back so soon, Inspector. I, I do hope you've been able to help me 
With all that mean whispering I told you about. I wish we could, ma'am. I wish we could. Did I tell you that Sergeant Peck is interested in the mandolin? Why, no, you didn't. Uh, may I, ma'am? Well, certainly. Yes, a lovely tone, ma'am. Yes, it has. Quite a romantic instrument, I believe. It goes back to the troubadours in France centuries ago. Yes, I've heard. It certainly had its place in your life, Mrs. Carter. Yes, I I dare say it has. I've been wondering about something, Mrs. Carter. I hope you can help me. Well, if I can, I will, of course. We uh, checked with Mr. Murchison at his music shop. Oh? Yes, he tells us you purchased a stock of strings shortly after Mr. Carter's death, not just before, as you told us. Well, then, then I, I, I'd, I'd forgotten the exact well, date. It seems rather peculiar that you should forget that after you made such a point of it to us. Well, I, I was under a terrible strain. I'm sure... If you'll stop plucking that A-string, Sergeant, my nerves are... Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, ma'am. I, I didn't mean to break it. I'll get you a new one. Uh, that, that won't be necessary, Sergeant. I, I have extras right here in this drawer. Uh, that was the A-string, wasn't it? I'm rather surprised, Mrs. Carter. A woman of your obvious means keeping nails and bent ones at that in a drawer of a desk in her sitting room. I forgot to throw them away. Yes, I dare say you did. May I have them, please? But... You'll leave them alone. I dare say also that they'll fit exactly into certain holes in the baseboards of your cellar and back stairs, just above the steps where someone unsuspecting would trip over tightly stretched mandolin strings stretched between two nails, like these, Mrs. Carter. You're taken in charge, madam. The charge is willful murder of your two husbands. I must warn you that anything you may say may be taken down in... And so, once and for all, the mandolin string was silenced can be seen today in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. Louise Evans Mason Carter was tried for murder. The police stated facts and produced evidence. But Louise wept and lifted those blue eyes of hers to heaven, and the jury disagreed, and she was not convicted. Not in court. She was convicted by her neighbors and by her friends. They knew. And so, Louise Evans Mason Carter moved away, far north, to Scotland, alone. And there she died some 20 years later, still alone. And now, until next time, till we meet in this same place and I tell you another story of the Black Museum, I remain, as always, obediently yours. Black Museum, starring Orson Welles, is presented by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Radio Attractions. The program is written by Ara Marion, with original music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum. Here, in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide. A warehouse where everyday objects, a tallow candle, for example, a mounted cat, an andiron, all, all are touched by murder. A bed sheet. It's a familiar object. You see them every night, except on rare occasions when you're roughing it. Linen is the usual material. Sometimes they're made of silk. This one is linen. It bears the imprint of the steamship Bengal Tower. May I make up your bed, Miss Parsons? I certainly still do this. Um, we're on our way, aren't we? Yes, miss. That's the last we'll see of Cape Town. I'll just change your sheets, miss. Thank you. Fresh ones for the first night out. Today, that bed sheet can be seen in the Black Museum.
From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Well, here we are, the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's very special, very particular museum of murder. If you're a student of criminology, a student with some imagination, I don't think you'll be alone here in the Black Museum. Each small card meant solely to identify crime and criminal will bring to life for you a sinister ghost. You walk here, attended simultaneously by killer and killed. Here's a long-necked chemist's flask. It was meant to hold life-giving medicine, but somebody intervened. There was acid in this flask. A few pellets dropped in, dissolved. The flask was smoky with lethal vapor. The sleeping man died. Here's a bicycle, made for fun, but... Notice the wheels, the crumpled spokes, crushed tires. A girl rode this bike downhill, and a wire was stretched across the roadway. Ah, here we are, the sheet. A common, everyday bed sheet, stamped in one corner, S.S. Bengal Tower. That's a luxury liner on the route between Cape Town and Southampton. It's a nice ship, and a voyage to enjoy, particularly when you're young and homeward bound. Natalie Parsons was young and homeward bound, and very lovely. The first night out, there were two gentlemen friends to dance attendance. Thank you, Miss Parsons. Now you make even a lieutenant's life a pleasure. <laughs> Why, lieutenant? I thought the Navy was the life for a young man with adventure oh. in his soul. <laughs> well, that's just the legend, but all legends come to an end. Just like the dancing tonight. Mr. Morrow, holding the four-star table all alone. Let's be nice to him, lieutenant. Hmm? I hear he knows the captain of our ship. The dancing was over in the main salon. The orchestra retired for the night. High above the brilliantly illuminated decks on the dim, binnacle-lighted bridge, Captain Booth had his own thoughts as he paced away his watch. Ought to be all right. Full passenger list. Decent crew. Engines in good shape. Ship all squared away, topside and below. <laughs> you never know. That's the worry and the fascination of it. You never know. No, Captain. You never know, do you? You never know. Ah, but such thoughts are ridiculous. Look at the three people at that table near the bar in the first-class lounge this minute. The Parsons girl. Actress, the passenger list says. A naval lieutenant. What was his name? Jeff Hennessy, that's it. And Noel Morrow. Past middle age, but quite distinguished. Heavy stockholder in the line which owns your Bengal Tower. Nice people having a fine time. And this gentleman concludes our performance for this evening. Oh, but, it, but it's early yet, Miss Parsons. Well, I'm not used to the sea air, Lieutenant. I'm tired, so I'm going to bed. And thank you both for a lovely first night at sea. May I, may I see you to your cabin? Hold on, I claim that privilege. You dance with her all evening, son. Now it's my turn. Oh, time. don't fight, gentlemen. Well, not the first night out, anyway. <laughs> I think we'll exceed to Nurse's wish tonight, Jeff. Good. He has some basis to his claim, you know. There you are, young <laughs> girl. Well, I, I surrender. There's plenty of time to Southampton and lots of moonlight. <laughs> <laughs> yes, plenty of time for fun and enjoyment and even playing at love as the great ship knifes through the tropic seas northward, homeward bound. So Noel Morrow walks Natalie Parsons to her cabin and returns to the bar for a nightcap with Lieutenant Jeff Hennessy. To Natalie, a nice girl. Uh, I'll drink to that. A fine talent, I hear. Yes, I saw in a play in Johannesburg, Three-Cornered Moon. Huh? Very amusing. That's so. Well, I, I never heard of it. Still, I'm glad I heard of Natalie Parsons. Nice girl. Good-looking, too. Yes, all of that and more. Well, here's to a pleasant voyage. Two gentlemen converse over whiskey and soda, and then repair to their respective quarters and fall asleep. 2 a.m. Four bells. On the bridge, the watch is changing. First officer reporting the leading, sir. Thank you, Mr. Besides. We're making 15 knots. Course 348. All quite below. Thank you, sir. I took the liberty of checking before I came topside. Watchmen are ringing their station, sir. Stewards and stewardesses turn in, sir. Very well, mister. Take over. 
Carry on. North, northeast, roughly is the course. The ship moves on. The captain goes to his cabin. First officer Forsyth and the quartermaster stand to on the bridge. All quiet. Below on B deck, the watchman makes his rounds. <laughs> That's a funny one. B-24 ringing for steward and stewardess both. We'll have a look. What is it, man? Is something wrong, sir? Nothing's wrong. Why? Both your buzzers are ringing, sir. For your steward and stewardess both. There must be a mistake. Everything here is fine. The watchman is puzzled. He goes back. The buzzers have stopped. He checks the cabin list. B-24. Miss Natalie Parsons. He hesitates back to the cabin or up to the bridge. Was it a mistake? He chose the bridge. What is it, Peter? B-24, the ladies' cabin. A signal occupied, Mr. Forsyth. Is it now? Buzzers was ringing. I answered. A man came to the door. All I did see of him was his trouser leg and shoe. Black, both of them. Well, strange things can happen on shipboard on a cruise like this, you know. You just go on with your rounds and fill out your report when you go off watch. Yes, sir. Very well, sir. In a few moments, I'll go below and check. I want to make sure meet me at B-24 at five bells. Aye, aye, sir. Thank you, sir. Strange things do happen on shipboard, even without tropic seas and a voyage home. Quite strange things. Five bells. Half past two. First officer Forsyth, with watchman Petrie at his elbow, knocked discreetly on the door to B-24. Unlocked, is it? Careless. So it seems, sir. Swing your torch in here, Petrie. Aye, sir. Nobody here. Cabin's empty. All right, Petrie. Make your report. I'll enter this on the log. We'll let it go at that. Girls will be girls, Petrie. Trust you haven't forgotten that. Discreet fellow, that first officer. But then he'd had plenty of cruise experience. He noted the matter in the log. After all, he had left the bridge for a few moments. And that was all. Now, it happens that one of the duties of the first officer is to call the roll at boat drill. You know how that goes. The bells clang all over the ship. The passengers joke as they reach for life bells dusty with disuse and scramble to the boat deck at the stations noted on their cabin doors. And after a bit, the first officer comes around and checks the roll. Yes, I know. I quite agree. Yeah. Answer to your names, please, ladies and gentlemen. This is a boat station for cabins B-18 to B-45. All passengers and crew assigned here will answer. Mr. Ainswell? Uh, here. Alan Birch? Here, sir. Miss Lawrence? Here. Mr. Leary? Present. Nancy Meadows? Yes, sir. Major Morton? Here. Miss Parsons? Miss Parsons? Miss Parsons! The first officer reported to Captain Booth. Captain Booth thought it might be courteous if Miss Parsons were under the weather to pay her a courtesy call. Captain knocked. Empty. Strange. Stewardess? Stewardess! Yes, sir? You wanted me, Captain? I do. You see Miss Parsons this morning? No, sir, I haven't. Uh, it's a little queer, rather. Mm, how so? Well, she wasn't a boat drill either, sir, and her, her night things are missing. You laid them out last night, did you? Yes, sir. Pretty things, too. Just right for her. But not a sign of them this morning, and... Stains all over the sheet. How's that? Where? Here, sir. Sort of red and a few black ones, sir. Streaks like. I see. Just a moment. There are times when I'm glad first class cabins have telephones. Uh, this is the captain speaking. I want Dr. Stout in B24 at once. Thank you. You don't think something's happened, do you, sir? She's such a nice girl. That's what everyone says. Funny goings on in here last night. Watchman's report, a log. Uh, notice anything else peculiar here this morning, stewardess? Well, well, yes, sir. When I first I came in to straighten up, first off I noticed the porthole, sir. Swing and open it was all by itself. I fastened it before anything, sir. Yes, that's right. You call for me, Captain? Yes, Doctor. Take a look at the stains on that sheet, will you? Right. All right, stewardess, you can go, but uh, stay on call. Yes, sir, I'll be right outside. And uh, send in the watchman. Yes, sir. Well, Doctor? Hmm. 
These are probably lipstick. The other red spots, they look like blood, I'm afraid. I'll tell better after I've run a test. The black marks beat me. Not a very pleasant prospect. Blood on the sheet and an open porthole. Watch for Petrie, Captain. Ah, yes, don't go, Doctor. Um, now, see here, Petrie. This man you reported speaking to last night, did you see his face? Sorry, sir, I didn't. Only his trouser and one shoe, like I told Mr. Forsyth. I see. It's too bad. Uh, what about his voice? It was muffled, sir, by the door. But he did have, um, well, a kind of accent, sir. What kind? American? Welsh? Scots? Uh, Irish? If anything, it was Scotch, sir. All right. Dismissed. Thank you, sir. Well, Doctor, I don't like the looks of it. I'd seal this cabin and notify owners if I were you. I'll do that and more. This is the captain. Hey, give me the bridge. Watch, officer, please. Hello, Mr. Matson. Captain Booth here. I want a complete search of the ship at once for a passenger. Natalie Parsons. Crow's nest a block hole. And uh, put the ship about, mister. We're going back on a sea search as well. Calculate our position at four bells this morning. Mm. I'll be topside directly. We're not going to find her alive, you know, Doctor. But we've got to have a look. I know. If this girl went through that porthole alive, the sharks have got her by now. She went through dead, we have a murderer aboard. As I said before, not a very pleasant prospect, Doctor. It all didn't look so pleasant. An empty cabin. An open porthole. And blood on the sheet. And I'd remind you that that sheet today can be seen in the Black Museum. gentlemen have anything to add? Have you, gentlemen? Neither of them did. But in Southampton, the criminal investigation department did have a few items to add. All right, Hobson. What's the report on this Parsons girl? Well, exactly what she said she was, Inspector. Actress. Mm -hmm. Apparently quite well accepted in Joburg. Plenty of men at the stage door, so to speak. Uh Age 25. Never a touch of scandal. Two points. Yeah. She was in the army intelligence during the war, had languages, good actress. Quite a help. Oh, possibly in secret service nowadays. No, I called the special branch on that. Positively, no. She's back in civil life completely. Oh, well, that's a possible theory down the drain. Yes, sir. Well, you had two points, Sergeant. Yes, sir. The other is, she said she left Joburg for a theatre job here. Well, there's no sign of it, sir. No manager in England has signed her though uh, some of them knew the name. Ah, oh, we'll keep after that. Oh, how about the passenger and crew list? Anyone familiar? No, not a criminal record in the lot. And we've checked all 368 of them. All right, Sergeant. Well, keep after that theatre job angle. Meanwhile, alert the technicians and the harbour police. We'll be going aboard that ship before the pilot takes her over. A ship with a sealed cabin drew nearer to home. Somehow the festive quality of a voyage home was missing. Tension settled over the Bengal Tower from the bridge to the boiler room. At long, long last, the anchor dropped into Southampton water. The passengers gathered to watch for the pilot boat. That's no pilot boat, is it, Halsey? Ah, police launch. I expected as much. Funny. Dance with a girl, you know her for eight, ten hours out of your life. She stays with you. It happened, son. She was a lovely thing. Don't fall in love with a ghost. Wind up rather lonely, you know. Thanks. I remember that. Ah, quite a few of them coming aboard. Yes, we're in for a going over, apparently. The captain spoke to the passengers and crew of the public address system. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, representatives of the Southampton police have come aboard to proceed with the necessary inquiry into the tragic disappearance of one of our fellow passengers. Until this inquiry has run its course, it will be necessary to lie off and not to proceed ashore. Your cooperation will be greatly appreciated, and I'm sure you realize that all which can be done is being done to place you ashore as soon as possible. Thank you. I wish them luck. How I wish them luck. On B-deck, Inspector Rice took over from a greatly relieved Captain Booth. No time is wasted. 
Set up a lab in the ship's pharmacy. Get at those stains. Compare them with the girl's lipstick and get the blood type. And find out what's in those black markings. Yes, sir. I'll strip the bed and go through her things top to bottom. Now, I want to talk to the watchman, the stewardess. And from what you say, Captain, the man in here that night had a Scots accent. That's correct. Well, how many Scotsmen aboard? Have you checked that? We have. Twenty-six, Inspector. Eighteen passengers, eight in the crew. Oh, very good, sir. You have been thorough. Now, you, I take it, are the watchmen. They work quickly, but they work thoroughly. The watchman and the stewardesses reasserted their statements to the captain with one addition. Oh, yes, sir. I cleaned the cabin thoroughly. Wiped everything. That was too bad. No chance now for fingerprints. In the improvised laboratory in the ship's pharmacy, they did better. Uh, the lipstick stains match the lipstick in her luggage exactly, sir. The blood type on that spotted sheet? Type O, sir. The girl's army record gives the same type. Meanwhile, information arrived from ashore. She had a job waiting for her, Inspector, at the Abbey Theatre in Dublin, sir. And then the police chemist came up with a long-awaited answer. The black streaks on the sheet, sir. Lamp black wax and petroleum oil. That's shoe polish. But there's a trace of silver polish mixed in, sir. Ah, now we've got something, Hobson. Yes, sir, but what? Well, who gets silver polish on his boots aboard ship, Sergeant? Well, it's a weird combination, sir. A ship steward, Hobson. A steward with a Scots accent. Now, let's see the captain, shall we? I'll cooperate in any way I can, Inspector. But even if it is one of my men, there's not a thing to tie any of them to the incident. Well, sir, I have an idea. We can let the passengers ashore now, but hold the crew. Then you invite the police detail and the ship's officers to luncheon. Set up four tables well apart, waited on by the four stewards you say are Scots born. At the end of the meal... Thank you, steward. I will have some more coffee. Now, as I was saying, gentlemen, it's practically over. That one fingerprint on the glass of the porthole will hang the man. No question about it. They always forget something, make at least one silly mistake. There'll be a ship's mechanic from our harbor police aboard. In All right, young fella. You can stop polishing that porto cover now. What's the meaning of this? I'm doing the job. There's no fingerprint on the glass. You fell for the inspector's plan. I'll have to take you in charge. Willful murder on suspicion. And I must warn you, anything you say may be taken down in writing. They smoked him out all right, but he refused to give in without a struggle. It was interesting to watch his mind work as they questioned him. You're Alan Burt. I am. Your first trip aboard the Bengal Tower? A round trip. Went out in here. This is the return. Ah. Like the ladies, do you? They seem to like me. Ever had any trouble with one before? No, never. What do you mean, before? Your forearms, Burt, and your neck, all scratched. No dame ever scratched me. Well, where did you get them, then? Uh, ship's cat. Uh... I, I tried to pet her. She let me have it. Uh, it won't wash, Birch. No cat's claws ever scratch like that. Ship's doctor will certify to that. And those scratches aren't old enough to have happened ashore. All right, then. It was a woman. Huh? A, a stewardess. Which one? I'm not saying. She'd lose her job. Nonsense. Who are you protecting, Birch? Nobody. Stop it, Birch. You're only making it harder for yourself. You were on duty for that cabin, among others. She rang. From the watchman's story, the buzzer was stuck. But you didn't realize it until he knocked on the door and spoke to you. You went to B-24, forced your way in, attacked the girl, and when she resisted, you killed her and pushed her through that porthole. Wasn't that the way it was, Bert? I'll never attack nobody. We say you did. There's blood on the sheet. Her blood. We'll find it on your clothes, too. I never attacked her. We had a date. After she ditched the two jokers she was dancing and drinking with. Be careful what you say, Bert. It's all being taken down and may be used in evidence. I'm telling the truth. I didn't kill her. I was waiting in the cabin like she said. When she came in, she changed her mind or something. She tried to push me out. I don't take that from no woman. I grabbed her. She fell against me. She was foaming at the mouth in a, in a sort of fit. She collapsed. I put her on the bed, tried to give her artificial respiration... That's how the black got on the sheet, maybe. Yeah, probably. Go on, Bert. When that fool Petrie came to the door, I, I lost my head. She looked dead. I, 
I didn't know what. I, I locked the door. I couldn't find no heartbeat. Nothing. I, I figured Petrie would report to the bridge. I picked her up and pushed her out of the porthole. Why did you decide to tell this tale, Birch? Because you'd pin it on me anyway. I know coppers. So better than have you cook it up, you got it my way. I didn't I kill nobody here. I didn't I kill nobody. Stanley Birch had told his story. Not a very good story. For there, in contradiction, was the testimony and evidence, including that blood-stained bed sheet, which you can see today in the Black Museum. Stuart Birch was a ladies' man. There was no doubt about that after the evidence was in. The jury had little doubt either. They convicted Mr. Birch of first-degree murder, despite his protestations, and despite the fact that for the first time in 200 years, a jury had been given a homicide case without a corpus delicti. This was a major aspect of the case, a very interesting one, I think. And further, just after the conviction, the House of Commons suspended the death penalty in England. As for Stuart Birch, you'll find him spending the rest of his natural life in Dartmoor Prison. And as for the spotted bed sheet, it remains in its customary place. In Scotland Yard, in the Black Museum. And now, until we meet next time, the same place, I tell you another story about the Black Museum. I remain, as always, obediently yours. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. From the Black Museum, a museum of death. Yes, here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide. A warehouse where everyday objects, a paperweight, a broken wine bottle, a shaded lamp, all are touched by murder. You take this jacket, woolen hand-knitted, a baby's garment, dusty with age, and only half completed. Sleeves are missing, Inspector, and it still has to be stitched up. Yes. Looks rather pathetic, doesn't it, Sergeant? It does, sir. Yes. Better put it back in the attache case. Probably be needing it before long. Today, that jacket, sleeveless and unstitched, can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Well, here we are in the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Here lies death, dressed in its Sunday best. Here, for example, is a nail file. It was once used by a manicurist to trim the dainty fingernails of a beautiful woman, later used by an insane killer. Here's a length of cord, weighted with lead at either end, harmless enough to look at, but lethal in its effect as a weapon of murder. Ah, here we are, here's the jacket, mottled and dusty, somewhat inconspicuous in its place on the shelf, a tragic relic of passion and violence. I'm going to take you back quite a few years to a warm Sunday morning in June of the year 1921, we're outside a small chapel in the London suburb of Kensal Rise. The service is not long ended, and the congregation files slowly from within out into the brilliant sunshine. A young girl emerges, waves to a few friends gathered near the entrance, and turns along the dusty yellow road in the direction of the township. She's gone but half a block when she hears an unfamiliar voice calling after her. Miss! Miss! She turns and finds herself face to face with a man she has never seen before, 
a stocky, broad-shouldered young man with a round face and black, penetrating eyes. I beg your pardon, miss, but uh, I think you dropped this. Oh. oh, oh, my hymn book. It is yours, then. Oh, yes. I wasn't quite sure. Thank you ever so much. Oh, that's all right. I don't know what I'd have done if I'd lost it. M- Mother never forgiven me. She gave it to me for my 12th birthday. I- I've had it ever since. Well, in that case, it's a good thing I happen to be looking your way. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is, yes. Well, I, I must be off. Thank you again. I- I- You're going I- towards the village? Yes. I-, I live on the other side of the rise. I'm going that way myself. Perhaps you wouldn't mind my walking with you. Not at all. It's funny, I... I thought I knew most of the folks about these parts, but I, I don't ever remember seeing you before. Oh, that's not surprising. I'm a newcomer to Kensal Rise. I've only been here a few days. Oh, fact. that explains it. Yes, I've been transferred to the bank here. Oh. Do you expect to be staying long? No longer than I can help. I'm trying to save enough money to buy a chicken farm. A chicken farm? <laughs> well, it probably strikes you as being a queer ambition for a fellow to have, oh. but I've always wanted one ever since I was a youngster. I've even got a small piece of land picked out. Half an acre at Crowborough in Sussex. Crowborough? I have a friend who lives there. On the land? Yes, it's a wonderful spot. I stayed there for a week once. I loved every minute of it. Oh, then you probably know more about the place than I do. I've only just passed through it. That's when I saw the land for sale. How long ago was that? Oh, about six or seven months. What if it's been sold in the meantime? No, 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 that's hardly likely. You see, I spoke to the agent. He told me it had already been up for sale two years and looked like staying that way for the next ten. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I see. I only hope he knew what he was talking about. (laughs) The two walked on in silence for several moments. Then suddenly the young man laughed. (laughs) I I say, I've been walking along telling you my inmost secrets and I haven't even introduced myself. I was just about to say the same thing. Well, the name's Moon. Trevor Moon. And mine's Evelyn Rose. But everyone calls me Evie. And that's how it all began. A romance destined to flower with all the beauty of young love, only to wither and die a tragic death. But let us not anticipate. Let us follow the course of that romance, or rather, let us pick out the more pertinent of its developments. After their first meeting, Trevor Moon and Evie Rose spent most of their time in each other's company. For twelve months, they were rarely seen apart. And then, one evening... While strolling in the moonlight, Moon asked Evie to marry him. I haven't much to offer you, darling, and, well, apart from what I've put aside from the farm, I've no money, but if there is such a thing as love, I've really fallen victim to it. Oh, oh, Trevor. Darling. You're, you're sure it's what you want? My dearest Evie, if it wasn't, I... I wouldn't have asked you. (laughs) No, no. I don't suppose you would. It's just that... Just that what? Well, I I wasn't expecting it. You you, you took me unawares. Well, to be quite truthful, darling, I took myself unawares too. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you haven't given me your answer yet. Now, to be or not to be, that is the question. (laughs) Oh, silly. Of course I'll marry you. (laughs) Just as soon as you want me to. But Moon was in no hurry. On the contrary, he was the type who could not be hustled. And a further twelve months passed, during which time he remained as devoted as ever, but appeared singularly reluctant to take the proverbial plunge. Evie, on the other hand, became more impatient as the days went by, and when informed by her suitor that he had at last saved enough money to leave the bank and purchase his precious chicken farm in Sussex, her emotions gave vent to words. Oh, Trevor, but I'm so tired of all this waiting. How much longer must we go on like this? Just a few months, darling, till I get the farm straightened out and ready for business. But why can't we be married right away? Then I could help you straighten things out. You can help me most, darling, by being just a little more patient. Uh, The moment I get things in order down at Crowborough, I'll send for you. That's a promise. So Evie had to consent to go on waiting. Two weeks later, matters having been settled... Moon bid his sweetheart a fond farewell and left for Sussex. A month passed, and no word from him. Evie had done her best to be patient, as he had asked, but this was too much. Packing a bag, she took a train for Crowborough, and upon reaching her destination, checked in at the local inn, where she made inquiries as to the location of the Moon property. Within the hour, she was knocking at the door of a small shack on the outskirts of the village. 
Evie. Trevor, darling, please don't be angry with me, but I had to see you. I... How did you get here? By train. I had to come, darling. If I'd waited another day, I'd have, I'd have gone out of my mind. It's been... You can't stay here. You realize that. Well, I, I thought I'd stay at the hotel. No. Trevor, please. You're I... catching the next train back home. But, darling... I... I'll walk with you to the station. I... No, Trevor. No, I'm not going. You're not going? I'm staying in Crowborough till we're married. I see. And if I happen to decide against going through with it... I'm afraid you haven't... Haven't any alternative, Trevor. Why? You see, I'm going to have a child. Your child. Ah. Uh, well, you'd better stay. The scene changes. It is three months later. We're in the office of the Crowborough Police Station. Constables Harris and Vernon are playing checkers. Oh, didn't see that one coming. <laughs> Been playing for that all along. Mm, puts me in a bit of a spot. Hey, does that all right, right enough. <laughs> <coughs> oh, I'll get it. Mm. No fancy moves while my back's turned, neither. As if I were. Well, it wouldn't be the first time. Clover, police station. Constable Harris speaking. What's that? Yes. Yes. Hold it a tick while I get me notebook and take down a few particulars. <coughs> now, uh, what name was it again? Rose. Mrs. Lena Rose. Yeah. And the missing girl? Daughter. Evelyn. Known as Evie. Address? 14 Marsden Parade, Kensal Rise. Yes. And how long has your daughter been gone, Mrs. Rose? Oh. Uh huh. Since Saturday morning, I see. Mm, yes. Well, let you do for the present, Mrs. Rose. You'll be hearing from us. Yeah, that's right, yes. Good night, ma'am. Trouble? Oh, nothing. It won't keep. Another missing girl, that's all. But Constable Harris was in error. It was not simply a case of another missing girl who disappeared for a few days. It was a case of a missing girl who disappeared for good. Today, evidence of that fact can be seen here in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with the Black Museum starring Orson Welles. Just another missing girl. Yes, that's how the reported disappearance of Evie Rose was first described. Nothing particularly unusual about such a report. Almost every day of the week, someone or other vanishes without any apparent reason or cause to show up again in due course with a perfectly simple explanation for their supposedly mysterious absence. But, of course, there's always the exception, which is why the police waste as little time as possible in checking up on such matters. So it was that the following day, Mrs. Lena Rose received a visit from Sergeant Cross of the Crowborough Police Station. Now then, Mrs. Rose, let's get the facts straight, shall we? According to this report, your daughter left home early on Saturday morning. That's right, Sergeant, two days ago. She told me she was going down to Crowborough for the day. Crowborough? Yes, to visit her fiancé. Has a chicken farm there. Not a very big one, I understand. He only bought it a few months ago, but he's doing very well. You've been in touch with him, I take it? Oh, yes. He said he was expecting Evie for lunch on Saturday, but she didn't arrive. Hmm. Was she in the habit of visiting him often? No. Several weeks ago, she went down to see how he was getting along, and that was the only time. She returned the same day? Just in time for tea. When I come to think of it, it's just about that time that she changed so. Changed? Yes. She used to be such a happy sort of girl, you know, always laughing and joking, and then suddenly she became moody, sullen, as though as though something was worrying her, something she couldn't speak of, even to me. You've no idea what it could have been, I suppose? Well, 
Well, perhaps I shouldn't tell you this, but I had a feeling it was something to do with Trevor. Trevor? Trevor Moon, her fiancé. Oh. What kind of something, Mrs. Rose? Well, that's what had me puzzled. I, I just can't imagine. Trevor was such a nice boy and so fond of Evie. I'm quite sure he wouldn't have done or said anything to hurt her. Well, not intentionally, that is. Hmm. How long have they been keeping company? Oh, about two and a half years. As long as that, eh? And when were they to be married? Well, I, I'm not sure, Sergeant. As far as I know, they, they haven't actually set a date. I see. Well, I think I might pop down to Crowborough and have a chat with Mr. Moon. He may be able to tell me something. Thanks for your help, Mrs. Rose. And don't worry. We'll find your daughter. You'll probably be hearing from me again in a day or two. With an encouraging smile, Sergeant Cross took his leave of the anxious mother and set out for the railway station, a thoughtful expression clouding his wrinkled brow. That same expression was still present when he stepped from the train onto the platform at Crowborough and headed along the lonely lane that led to the Moon Chicken Farm. The gate was open, and seeing no one about, he made his way up to the front door of the shack and knocked. Yes? Mr. Moon? That's right. I'm Sergeant Cross. I wonder if you could spare a few moments of your time. By all means, Sergeant. Come right in. The uh, place is in a bit of a mess, I'm afraid. No, that's all right. Well, um, sit down, won't you? Thanks. I suppose you know why I'm here. Well, I have a fair idea. It's about Evie Rose, isn't it? Yes. Still no sign of her? I'm afraid not. Ah. There are just a few questions I'd like to ask you, Mr. Moon. Routine, you understand, nothing more. Oh, of course. I've just come from Kensal Rise. I've been talking to Mrs. Rose, who gave me fuller details. I suppose she's almost out of her mind with worry. Well, under the circumstances, I think she's taken it very well. I understand that you and the missing girl are engaged to be married. That's so. And that she was on her way down here to visit you when she disappeared. Yes, I was at the station to meet her, but she wasn't on the train. Well, what train was that? The 11 o'clock. I waited an hour for the next one, but she wasn't on that either, so I came back home. Were you worried at all? No, not unduly. I just assumed she'd changed her mind about coming. You didn't think it odd that you hadn't heard from her? No, I can't say I did. How long is it since you last saw her? Oh, roughly speaking, about, um, about two months. That was when she last visited you? Yes. She only came here once. I see. How did she seem, then? How did you mean? Well, did she seem depressed or worried about anything? Oh, not that I can recall. No. Mm hmm? Why? Oh, no particular reason. Not for one second during the interrogation did Sergeant Cross shift his gaze from Moon's face. He had never trusted black eyes, and he wasn't quite sure he liked the look of this young fellow. But, despite this, the inscrutable Mr. Moon gave no indication that he knew any more about the missing Evie Rose than he was ready to admit, and certainly did not appear to have anything to hide. The contrary, in fact. Back at the Crowbury police station later that same day, Cross admitted as much to his superior, Divisional Inspector Broughton. So you think he's told all he knows, eh, Sergeant? Well, sir, let's just say that he gave me that impression. It was those black eyes of his that set me thinking. Sure. They've got a shifty look about them. You can hardly hold the color of a man's eyes against him, Sergeant. Well, perhaps not, sir, but even so, I... I think the best thing we can do at this stage is to give the newspapers a photograph of the missing girl and a description of the clothes she was wearing on the day of her disappearance. Just as you say, sir. I'll attend to it right away. Thus it was that a photograph of Evie Rose, together with her description, found its way onto the front page of three London newspapers. Well, sir, that should do the trick. Yes. Let's hope so, Sergeant. Two weeks passed, during which time no information regarding the missing girl was forthcoming. Yet a third week went by, and still there was no trace of Evie Rose. Well, Sergeant, looks as if we'd drawn a blank. It does rather, sir. What's to do now? That's the question. Yeah, I think I might pay your friend Mr. Moon a visit. I doubt if you'll get much more from him than I got. No, possibly not. No harm in trying. To this day, Inspector Broughton could not say exactly why he so suddenly decided to pay Moon a call. Perhaps it was the prompting of fate, or perhaps he acted simply on a blind impulse. Whatever it was, he wasted no time about it. And that same afternoon, he made his way out to the Moon farm, found Moon seated on the narrow veranda, 
thoughtfully puffing at a much smoked pipe. Hello there. If you're another of those damn fool reporters, you can go to it. No, 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 no. I'm not a reporter. Well, that's a relief anyway. They've been showing up here in a steady stream for the past three weeks. Oh, is that a fact? Yes. You know, I'm convinced they really believe I murdered that girl, that Evie Rose. Oh? Ah, prying fools that they are. The way they ask questions, you'd think I was on trial. <laughs> well, perhaps you are. What? I mean, uh, perhaps they think you know more than you're telling. Now, why should they think that? Well, I, she was supposed to be on her way to visit you when she disappeared. Well, it doesn't mean I murdered her. No. I mean, anyone could have done oh. it. Done what? Murdered her. Who said she was murdered? Why, uh, uh, no, no one. Uh, not in so many words, but that's what they're inferring. Who? Those wretched reporters. You sure you're not imagining it? Of course I'm not imagining it. Why should I imagine it? Well, why should you indeed? You're sure you're not a reporter? Hmm. Quite sure. Who are you then? Well, matter of fact, I'm a detective. Detective? Inspector Broughton's the name. Oh. Well, I'm... <laughs> I'm glad you stopped by, Inspector. Huh. Uh, uh, what brought you here? Oh, I just wanted to have a look about the place. Why? Curiosity. I suppose you wanted to question me, too. Well, frankly, I did want to, but I don't want to anymore. I think you've given me all the answers I need. With a nod, the Inspector turned and walked back down the path. He didn't look back, but he could feel Moon's eyes staring after him. The eyes that had told him so much, so convincingly. It was just like that. Almost like the sort of stuff one reads in a cheap detective fiction magazine. Well, this was cheap. But it wasn't fiction. It was life. Life in its birthday suit. That was quick, Inspector. How'd you make out? He's a killer, Sergeant. Moon? Yes, I'm as sure of that as I am of the fact that we'll see the end of the Evie Rose case tonight. You, you think he killed her? Well, if he didn't, I'm going to be out of a job in the very near future. But uh, because I'm banking everything on the hunch that he did, my reputation included. And don't ask me why. If I told you, you'd say I was mad. We're wasting valuable time. Come on, get a squad together. We've got work to do. Work? We're off back to Moon's place, and we're going to search every inch of it. If we don't find anything inside the house, we start in the grounds. And even if we dig all night, Sergeant, we're going to keep on digging till we strike oil. So, less than an hour later, Inspector Broughton was back at the chicken farm, and with him were Sergeant Cross and four constables. The shack was searched from top to bottom, and, finding nothing on the inside, they started on the outside, with picks and shovels and everything they could lay their hands on. Broughton was risking his career on an intangible impulse, and he knew it. But somehow he didn't think it was much of a risk. There's nothing so far, Inspector. Hey, we've got a lot of ground to cover yet, old chap. I hope you're not making a mistake, sir. So do I. But if I am, you won't suffer for it. I can promise you that. I oh, wasn't thinking of oh, myself. Don't worry about me. My shoulders are broad enough. The digging continued. But it was too dark to see lanterns were lit. Four hours slipped by, and even Broughton was ready to throw in the towel when shortly after 1 p.m. Inspector. Hmm? What is it, Sergeant? Just look what Hanson has dug up. A cash gave. Well, get an eyeful of the initials on it. Yeah. E R. Seems as if your hunch might have been right after all. Yeah, come on, open it up. Maybe something in it. Right. Well, it doesn't feel like it. Hello? What's this? Looks like a jacket of some sort. A baby's jacket. That's what it is, all right. Only half completed. See? Sleeves are missing. And it still has to be stitched up. Yes. Looks rather pathetic, doesn't it, Sergeant? It does, sir, yes. Yes. Better put it back in the attaché case. Probably be needing it before long. With the discovery of the attaché case, the search was renewed with an added vigor, and stray articles of clothing were brought to light, one by one. Clothes identical to those worn by the missing girl on the day of her disappearance. A green scarf, a yellow jumper, a brown skirt... And leather shoes, the brown beret. Doesn't leave much to the imagination, Inspector. No, not much. But we still have to find a body. Yes, they still had to find a body. But they felt it couldn't be far away. And they were right. Except that it wasn't a body, but rather a scattering of bits and pieces that once had been a body.
Confronted with the evidence, Trevor Moon made no attempt to deny the charge of murder that was subsequently leveled at him. He seemed, in fact, somewhat relieved to relate his gruesome story of how he had sent for E.B. Rose and knowing that she was soon to bear his child, strangled her, later dismembering her body and burying it, together with her clothing and the attaché case, the contents of which today occupies its place in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. Moon's defense, if it could be called a defense, was a great letdown to the hundreds who kicked and shoved their way into the old bailey to witness his trial. For well, Mr. Moon pleaded guilty. There wasn't much more to it than that. Oh, yes, he had an excuse. Plenty of excuses. There are no excuses for murder. The jury's verdict was never in doubt. Trevor Moon was found guilty of murder in the first degree, and two months later to the day, he was hanged. So there you have it. And now until we meet next time in the same place, and I tell you another story about the Black Museum, I remain, as always, obediently yours. Black Museum, starring Orson Welles, is presented by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Radio Attractions, with original music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch, produced by Harry Allen Towers. Mm -hmm.